This is Devil's Love, an MC romance, Black Angels MC Book 4, written by R.A. Black, narrated by Dwight Kuhlman for Hot Ghost Productions. Chapter 1 Luca Knocking back my glass of whiskey, I grinned sloppily at the round of applause and cheers that rose up around me. Glancing over at Amaya, I arched a brow as she eyed her own glass dubiously, and anticipation hung heavy in the air. She looked about ready to pass out, her cheeks rosy and her eyes watering, and I propped my elbow on the bar to hold my chin on my fist. Your turn. It was just us now, and she pursed her thick lips before taking up her glass. Everyone else had tapped out, but my days in the Navy taught me one thing, and one thing only, how to drink. My verbal nudge made her face scrunch up, and I admired her ability to drink everyone around me under the table. But Amaya was sloshed, and I had just about won this tournament. I can't do it. The people gathered around us, nearly rioted, and I slapped the bar top as I grabbed Amaya's shot glass and necked the contents. Hissing as pride bubbled in my chest, I laughed a little before grabbing the money being held safely by Johnny. Ugh, I should get a second place prize at least. Yeah, a massive hangover girl. That's your prize. No one can drink me out. Shooting her a saucy grin, I reached to nudge her shoulder, and Amaya frowned darkly at me with a knowing glint in her eye. Leaning back on my stool, I fanned my hot face with my stack of twenties, and a satisfied huff escaped my lips. We should do this again sometime. We're celebrating, okay? By the way... Congratulations on winning that case. Smiling proudly, I nodded at Anthony, and he clapped me on the back to squeeze my shoulder firmly. His eyes blazed with drunkenness, but he knew his limits and not to challenge me, so he could still stand up straight. I'm real proud of you, man. Luca, you're the best. Thanks. That thing dragged on for two years, I literally thought I was going to die from the stress, but the guy's going to the chair, so it was worth it. I couldn't wipe the smile off my face, and Anthony's hand dragged down my back before I spoke up again. I got the job. Here, by the way, I've had more than enough of Las Vegas. After that case, my guy, I don't blame you at all. I'm glad to have you back. Sammy shouldered his way over to me, and my grin widened as he clapped my shoulder happily. Finally got back to where you belong, Luca. Yeah. My eyes flickered from person to person, and I sighed hotly as I set my head on the cool bar top. Carson was the only sober one among us, but he never participated in these drinking bouts. Sammy shuffled a few feet from me to rub Amaya's back as she cried from her failure, but she was on the verge of blacking out. And Anthony, well, he was barely past tipsy because anything more would probably kill him. He didn't handle his alcohol well, my friend. Spot? 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 Hey! grabbing her arm gingerly when her flash of fire engine red hair fluttered in my swimming gaze. I smiled when Spot glanced at me in disgust. All the ruckus around me drowned out, and she tugged her arm from my grasp before shooting me an expectant look. I just want you to know, I'm really proud of you too, girly. Alarm flashed in her big green eyes, that I was fairly certain weren't supposed to be green, and her lips twisted. 
The closed holes for her snake bites created dimples, and I scanned her face closely. After a few months, she'd put one of her brow cuffs back on, and her nose ring glinted. Her plugs and crests, covered in earrings, were gone for good, it looked like. She'd kept her fire-red hair, too, but it looked good on her. You're drunk, Luca. Pushing my head down gently, Spot frowned when I couldn't resist, and she patted my face hard. Drink some water. I'm serious, okay? If you ever need a lawyer, I got you, okay? She blinked, and I saw her contacts slide over ever so slightly before she shook her head. In these past two years, Spot had gotten back to normal, or as normal as anyone could expect. Supposedly, she slept through the night now, and Carson had built her a new bike that she loved more than her old one, which we never found, which was odd, because Tyler got his back. I'm done getting into trouble, but I appreciate the offer, Luca. There was a thick lilt of truth, of soberness in her tone, and Spot sort of slapped my cheek before walking away. Watching her go, I frowned under her furrowed brows as she walked out the side door to smoke. In my drunken state, I wasn't surprised when Elizabeth wandered out after her. But they'd gotten really close. Living in the same house, experiencing the things they had, it was no wonder, really. But I always felt bad for not being here when I was really needed. Ever since Elizabeth showed up and the whole issue with the FBI, I'd been debating coming back. Being in Las Vegas, practicing at the best law firm in the city, had been a means to an end. It's time to slow down, though. My frown deepened at my own mumble and I gazed at all these people that I loved so much. No one knew that I'd already started at a firm here. I'd already packed up and moved back, and I'd maintained this new position for my 90-day probation period. I needed to make sure I'd actually get put on full-time before I told anyone, but there wasn't really much doubt. After all, Las Vegas wasn't exactly a slow city to work in. There were always new cases, new murders, new troublemakers by the day. I'd gotten more experience in six years there than I'd probably accumulate the rest of my life, my new firm. So did you guys get a letter about the reunion too? Tearing me from my thoughts, Anthony groaned loudly and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I got a letter in the mail about it, our 15-year high school reunion. I'm not going to go. I have to work that night. What's the point of going? So you're forced to listen to people brag about their achievements or whatever? No thanks. I'll skip out. My drunken mind only registered Sammy's utter disgust and I snorted a laugh before he shot me a glare. That's exactly what'll happen, and you know it, dude. I've got better things to do than listen to idiots I don't care about tell me shit I care even less about. Luca wasn't even here for graduation. He was pushed through because he signed up for the Navy. He shouldn't be allowed to go. A round of drunken laughter directed at me filled the air, and I sat up to inhale a deep, hard breath in preparation. Anthony clapped a hand on my back, and he shot me a slick smirk before opening his mouth again. I love you, man, but that's the truth. You should have failed. I don't regret going into the Navy, Aunt. My gramps was right. It was a good decision at the time. I needed it. Defending myself with the same old words, I clenched my jaw absently as my tongue tingled wildly. Plus, none of you can say you went to France or Germany or the Philippines, so... Yeah, 
I guess you got a point. Nodding firmly, I sniffed hard, and I slid off my stool to run my hand over my head. My short hair prickled against my palm, numbing up my arm, and I took that as a sign to retire. Walking off from my friends, I glanced around the bar absently at all the people, included, but still excluded. There was a glass wall between us and them, and everyone was aware of it, even if they ignored it. Especially after what happened with Tyler, our member count had dropped sharply. <sighs> Carefully taking the stairs, I leaned heavily on the wall and ran my hand down my face. I'm so done with the drama. It's a good thing Tyler is done with the drugs, or there'd be issues. We'd discussed getting back in the game because Anthony's practice relied on the money we brought in, but no one really wanted that drama anymore. Taking the stairs with heavy legs, I rolled my bottom lip between my teeth under deeply knit brows. Frankly, knowing that it was our supplier that kidnapped Tyler and Spot had really been the deciding factor. Tyler didn't trust anyone, and he decided to just grow his own shit from now on. I preferred it this way, since I knew things no one else did about his operation. He still had Pops doing his cocaine groove, and supposedly Sophie was fine with it as long as she knew nothing about it. But Tyler had to tell someone, so he told me, because I knew the laws about that stuff. Carson and Sam were none the wiser, and just enjoyed their lives at this point. I'm too drunk to be thinking so damn deep. Grumbling to myself, I winced when my own voice banged against my forehead. Maybe I'll get to the point of enjoying my life, too. Chapter 2 Clarissa! Wakening with a start, I sucked in a sharp breath as my heart beat wildly in my chest. My hangover was mild enough that I could sit up with no problem, and I pulled my knee up to prop my heavy arm. Blinking blearily, I hid my yawn behind my weak fist, and my slow brain slowly processed what it was that jolted me into consciousness. Her. My heart throbbed at the memory of Clarissa and I reached to rub the spot hard. Blowing out a hot breath that burned my throat, I shook my head, but her image clung to the backs of my eyes. Shit, not again. This was going to be one of those days. Those days when I couldn't get Clarissa out of my head. A day when I relived every second from my first look at her to my last. Holding my pounding forehead in my palm, I inhaled a shallow breath into fiery lungs and held it. Some would think I'd just take the hint and stop drinking if this happened every morning after, but I still cherished these mornings, no matter how much it hurt. Flopping back, I spread my arms and legs to stare at the ceiling and Clarissa filled my mind's eye to project onto the white, smooth surface. It had been fifteen years since we last saw each other, but her hair was still a beautiful honey gold. Her face still had freckles that cut like diamonds. I didn't look the same as I did in high school. Whenever I saw a picture of myself, I couldn't help but cringe. But... Arisa was always like a fairy. When I first saw Clarissa, I nearly dropped to my knees at her beauty. She'd transferred to our school from Loveluck, and she thought our modest school of 450 students was huge. She was so innocent. I bet she's still innocent. I should go to this reunion next month. My lips twisted as one half went up and the other half went down. 
and a flurry of emotions bombarded my chest. What if she shows up? What if she doesn't? God. Luca. Carson knocked before cracking open the door, and I hummed without tearing my eyes off the ceiling. We're going to Kitty's. You in? Yeah. Hey, uh, before you go. Flopping my head to the side, I winced when my brain smashed against my skull, and Carson's eyes narrowed critically on me. When did you know that you loved Elizabeth? Are you thinking about Clarissa? Leaning on the doorframe, Carson crossed his arms and ankles as I nodded and sat up again. I was fully clothed, but he'd never cared about personal space anyway. Luca, man, I guess I knew from the second I saw her on the sidewalk. You've been hung up on Clarissa for fifteen years, man. Is this because of the reunion? Yeah. What if she shows up? What if she doesn't show up? I mean, I didn't go to the ten-year reunion, so... Trailing off, I inhaled a loud breath through my nose, and Carson watched me with hawk-like intensity. I always think about her the morning after getting drunk. Don't lie, my dude. You think about her constantly even if you don't want to admit it. Personally... I'm not going to bother with the reunion, but you should go, Luca, whether or not she shows up. It might help either way. Shooting me a pointed look that cut into my cheek, Carson knocked on the doorframe absently. Hurry up if you're coming with us. We're taking off in about a half an hour. Yeah, I'll be down. Leaving as suddenly as he'd appeared, Carson's words hung in the air heavily when he shut the door again. Throwing my legs over the side of the bed, I sighed harshly as I worked to unbutton my shirt. Digging my toes into the carpet, my body dragged itself up, and I ambled towards the bathroom on sluggish limbs. Indecision tore at my heart while I turned the shower knob just enough to get the water going. Last night had been celebratory, so I knew to bring an overnight bag with fresh clothes and socks. Stripping out of my jeans and button-down that reeked of alcohol, I gripped either side of the sink to stare at my reflection. True, the man I'd spent two years of my life prosecuting was finally going to get what he deserved, but... I was also celebrating ending my trial at a small county firm here. There were six law firms in this city, and I'd applied to all of them, got callbacks from all of them. In the end, I decided to go with a firm that handled a, a little of everything. I'd never done a divorce suit before, so that was something to look forward to, at least. None of my friends knew that I'd moved back until last night. I needed to make sure I would get the position first. I was competing with two other people, even though they weren't nearly as qualified as me. Okay. Slapping my palms against my cheeks, I shook my head wildly before tearing my eyes off myself. I'm back home. That's what matters. I hated Vegas, so there's no reason that my life can't go up from here. Frigidly cold water jolted my entire body, and goosebumps pocked my skin in thick blankets. Swiping my hand over my head, I tilted my face to the shower head, and the icy pelting of water abolished my lingering headache. Behind my shuttered lids, colorful spots assaulted the darkness, and I reached blindly for the soap on the ledge. Shivers raced down my spine and my hands shook as I washed myself. I spent less than two minutes under the spray, but it was enough to freeze my thoughts about Clarissa and this reunion. Shaking my head furiously, I rubbed my hands up my face and through my buzzed hair, and I let out a massive sigh. 
My asshole puckered when I stepped out of the glass-encased box. The air was so much warmer than the hairs on my body stood straight up. A sudden change of temperature tightened my thighs, and I snatched my towel off the toilet with trembling fingers. Thanks, drunk me, for putting this here. Luca? I stuck my head out of the crack in the door, and Anthony's brow rose as he started across the room. I need to borrow a shirt, if you got one. Blinking hard, I only just noticed his bare chest, and I scrunched up my nose as I worked my towel around my waist. Shouldering open the door, I stretched my arms above my head and arched with a groan, and the joints in my lower back popped. Anthony was covered pelvis to collarbone in tattoos, with complete sleeves, the whole shebang. I could vaguely remember when I'd gone with him for a few of them. The grim reaper that covered almost his entire back had been a doozy. His pectoral muscle had a pretty tattoo dedicated to Kate, even though she was a fucking bitch to pretty much everyone. The buds of her favorite flowers were all closed, colored light purple and pink, and he had a quote from the Hippocratic Oath on his ribs instead of a Bible verse. Reaching to rub my jaw and neck absently, I tore my eyes off his mesmerizing tattoos to grab my bag off the floor at the foot of the bed. Do I even want to know what happened to your clothes? Aren't those Carson's jeans? Anthony snorted roughly, and I eyeballed the pants that were clearly about to fall off. Wait, now I need to know. What happened? Amaya threw up on me when Sammy and I were trying to get her upstairs. It's not a big deal. I should have brought my bag. I didn't expect to get into a drinking match. Grinning viciously, I rifled through the plain black duffel bag as Anthony sighed in resignation. So, are you going to tell me the truth about moving back? I wanted to wait until I passed the probationary period at Johnson Perry Law before I mentioned anything. I'm just a junior lawyer, like in Vegas, but I had to beat out two other people. Plus, pulling out a crisp white t-shirt, I tossed it at Anthony, and he arched a brow inquisitively. I really just wanted to settle in without everyone breathing down my neck. Things like last night are fun and all, but I had to focus on work and my apartment and stuff. So, how'd you like it? The firm, I mean. Scrambling into the shirt, Anthony posed his question as I fished out of my own clothes. Handing him a belt, I shrugged absently, but my expression soured regardless. The senior partner, May, is a bit of a bitch, but I'm sure it'll pass. She gets distracted, but my ass isn't even discreet about it. Anthony turned his back to me as I unfurled my jeans, and I quickly stuck my feet into the legs. I mean, she's pretty and whatever, but I get it. I go to this happy ending massage parlor downtown twice a week, and it took me a while to find a girl that did it just right. The massage part, of course. Chuckling at himself... Anthony hooked his borrowed belt as I fastened my jeans on my hips, and I pulled my own t-shirt over my head. Being a doctor was a stressful job. I could remember when Anthony did cocaine to ease the edge of a bad week. That was back in his residency, though, and it didn't become much of a problem. Anyway, at least now you don't have to come from Vegas anymore. Imagine all the money you'll save on gas. Chapter 3 Ripping my engine, I grinned under my visor as my back wheel kicked up dirt and pebbles. Adrenaline surged through me, and I relished the sensation of pure horsepower thrumming up my spine. The rumble of motorcycles shook the ground as I kicked off, 
and I could still feel the vibrations through the footrests. Holding on to the road, I flexed my hands around the grips, and Spot zoomed past me with her bright red hair in a tight, flailing braid. Following behind her, Anthony and I rode parallel, and Carson, Elizabeth, and Ruddy crammed onto his bike behind us. Weaving back and forth on the deserted street, I glanced over as I jacked the throttle, and Anthony's head snapped back as his bike jerked to the right. Smirking broadly, goosebumps rose on my arms and legs, and Anthony revved his engine hard. Yeah, right. Scoffing under my breath, I sped up just until my front wheel completely passed Anthony's, and he shot me the middle finger. My heart rate went wild, and there was a calm moment of nothing but the engine and the blood drumming in my ears. Jerking the throttle, I sped off in front of Anthony, and we weaved around each other on the otherwise quiet back road. Sweat gathered under my arms from my leather jacket, the emotions, and the baking sun, but I relished the feelings bombarding me. On my roadster, nothing else mattered, and I left my thoughts in the dust as Anthony and I raced towards the city. Buildings loomed in front of us, getting closer and closer as the straightway sliced through the desert. The sand and baked dirt gave way to some plants every now and then, but it all whizzed past me. Only Anthony invaded my tunnel vision, and I ground my teeth as we swerved past Spot. She revved up, the roar of Spot's bike threatening and angry, and my grin widened. Of course, Anthony and my roadsters weren't designed to go over 80, but Spot regularly hit 100 miles per hour or faster. She weaved between us, the thick wheels of her fire-red and black racing bike gripping the road to burn slightly. For a second, I slowed and wondered how many tires Spot blew through a month. Her only mode of transportation was a sportster that had probably never driven below 60 miles per hour. My helmet beeped shrilly, and I slowed even more to tap a button on my phone as it sat safe on the narrow dash. What's up, Ant? Sniffing hard, I rocked back in my seat as I reached a comfortable speed, and my friend pulled up next to me. Learned your lesson? Anthony snorted roughly at my teasing, and I rolled my shoulders as I relaxed deep into the saddle. Glancing in my side mirrors, I could make out Carson's laden bike slowly but surely catching up to us. A smile stretched my lips at Ruddy's distinct black head sticking out from behind Carson's shoulder. So, I've been wondering this for a while. Right, uh, how come the money hasn't run out yet? Prickles raced down my spine at that, and I turned to Anthony's shaded visor to narrow my eyes. Pursing my lips, I could picture him frowning as he hummed into the speaker of my helmet. I thought so. Tyler's still in the game. But he changed the rules, huh? It's been over a year since the money should have run out. I mean, I was the one that got the best math scores in school, you know. Luca, I can do basic subtraction. You have to ask him if that's what you really want. All I know is he was asking about growing laws. I don't know if he was actually doing it. Deniability was an amazing thing, and Anthony barked a laugh with a rough shake of his head. Turning my attention back to the road, my eyes refocused as the city limits came upon us. He can do what he wants, Anthony. He can be as mysterious as he wants. It honestly doesn't matter to me. You'd think, after what he did at the bar with Sam, he'd maybe be a little more open to sharing. We're talking about Tyler here, Luca. I don't expect anything like that from him, 
and I never have. I was just wondering because he went through a lot, and I know Sophie went to therapy, but I doubt Tyler did. My lips twisted, and I blew out a breath as we leisured past the last mile marker before reaching the suburbs on the outside of the city. I'm just saying, I'm not surprised he kept up in some way. I'll have to thank him when I see him again. You do know there's this thing called legit, where you don't do things illegally. Right, Anthony? My tone darkened, but Anthony didn't reply even as he shrugged from the corner of my eye. If you ever get caught... I'm not going to get caught, okay? And even if I did, what are they going to get me for? I'm an employee of the clinic, and I have no control over insurance claims or anything. That's Tracy's job. Anthony's flippant attitude sparked irritation in my gut, and I ground my teeth and gripped the handlebars tighter. Trust me, Luca, okay? I'm not that dumb, right? You're a damned idiot, Anthony. Okay? That's what you are. I already know more than I want to about this shit. Licking my teeth as they tingled from my snap, I sighed in aggravation. All I know is that Tyler asked me about the growing laws. I don't know if he did anything. I don't want to know anymore. Okay. That's all I need to know, too. I've spent the past 15 years working to become a doctor, but I hated working in hospitals, just like you in Vegas. I spent six years doing my student rotations in a place I hated to get to this point. Grunting in agreement, I resisted the urge to cringe at the fresh memories of working in Las Vegas, and Anthony chuckled humorously. So, now that you're back for good, what are you planning on doing? I'm going to enjoy not being worked to death for one. The tense conversation slid by as we reached the inner ring of the suburbs, mostly apartments and condos. Swerving my bike absently, I nodded more to myself, and Anthony hummed softly. I mean, I went to Vegas for a reason, and I achieved my goal. I got what I needed to get an easy job here. I went to the Navy because I couldn't see a future for myself here. But now, I can. Yeah, I hear that. Your gramps was a prickly old bastard, but he knew his shit for sure. Hindsight is a wonder. Are you going to the reunion at the end of the month? Ugh, not this again. Probably. I think... I mean, I left for the Navy midway through the year, but I don't see why I shouldn't. But I could think of at least one reason why I thought I shouldn't go to the damn reunion. Clarissa might be there. That's the only reason I would go, to see if she shows up. I know you guys gave each other your virginities, but it's been 15 years, Luca. Don't you think she might have moved on by now? My throat tightened at the very mention, and my mouth dried even as I inhaled deep and sharp. Arching my back, I slowed to a stop at a sign and braced my feet on the hot pavement. I don't think that at all, Anthony. Clearing my throat of its hoarseness, I shook my head as Anthony came to a stop next to me. Glancing over, my eyes narrowed on him, and my heart throbbed against my ribs. I hope she did, but I hope she didn't. I know she has no right to want to see me, but I'm not the kid I was back then. Luca, I'm not judging you but no one's heard from Clarissa since she moved for college. If she did want to see you, don't you think she'd have come earlier? No. She'd want a secondary reason, so that she doesn't feel embarrassed. 
answering quickly. I shook my head and glanced around the four-way before rolling forward. She's very delicate, and people don't change so drastically. Anthony kept his big-ass mouth shut this time at the finality of my tone, but my mind had already turned decisively to Clarissa. Again, his points might have been valid, but I knew her, at least I did fifteen years ago. Things may change, but it didn't change that damn much. Clarissa was probably just as scared of seeing me as I was of seeing her. Our school was stupid in that we have a seven-year reunion, fifteen-year, twenty-year, twenty-five, and on and on. But I didn't have time to go to the first one. I was in law school, was wrestling with getting out of the Navy, and I didn't want her to see me like that. Maybe, though, the changes could be significant enough. Shaking my head furiously, I ripped the throttle to speed up, but I couldn't leave my thoughts in the dust kicked up behind me. Chapter 4 Luca Come here, you fat boy. Chuckling as Ruddy hauled his muscular, sturdy body into my lap, I scratched his sides roughly. With me, at least, he was a cuddler, and he grumbled in happiness as he leaned heavily against my chest. Yeah, you're my fat boy. Give me kisses, Ruddy. I'd seen Ruddy kill a person. I'd seen Ruddy bum-rush a fucking car for Elizabeth. I'd seen Ruddy gleefully terrorize Sammy. But he gave the best slobbery kisses ever, and I scrunched up my face as he slathered his dog saliva on my face. Sharp claws that had curved flesh hung up on my shoulders, and his teeth grazed my cheekbones as if he couldn't break a bone. His grumbles of pleased affection rumbled from his chest against mine, and I wrapped my arms around him to rub his back hard. He's a good boy. Aren't you such a good boy? You make me want to dumpster dive for a dog, don't you? Craning my neck, I grinned at Elizabeth sitting on the couch, watching us, and she smiled back in silence. How have you been, Elizabeth? She shrugged, wringing her fingers in her lap, and I nodded, even though I kind of wanted a real answer. Even after so many years, she only ever opened up her mouth for Carson and Anthony because he was her doctor, but I didn't take it personal. Turning my attention back to Ruddy, I pushed him onto his back to scratch and rub his belly, and his tongue flopped out of his mouth. Are you really thinking of getting a dog? Glancing up, his spot climbed onto the sofa with Elizabeth. My eyes narrowed at how close they sat. Spot was almost touching the much smaller woman. Well, of course they're close. Ruddy's an exception, you know. I know, I was just, I thought, I figured that maybe I could get a, a service animal and bring it to work so it's not home all day. Honestly, I wasn't really considering getting a pet, but the more I thought it out, it seemed like a good idea. Rubbing the length of Ruddy's belly, I smiled down at him as he groaned in satisfaction. I'll have to think about it a bit more. If you do, you should adopt. Humming softly in acknowledgement, I bopped my head side to side a spot ran her hand through her fiery red hair out of the corner of my eye. I, I was thinking of getting a cat or something, something small, that can sleep with me. Ruddy sleeps with me. It's the only time I don't have nightmares. Surprise twitched my brow at Spot's confession, and I didn't dare look up even as Elizabeth clasped her hand on the sofa. Spot never talked to me about anything. This was probably the longest conversation we'd ever had. She was young, only 23 now, 
she might not have been through as much as Elizabeth. But trauma was trauma. I think you should, Spot. I think that'd be a good idea. You know, I heard that bunnies were good comfort pets. Our conversation fizzled out, but my mind didn't stop churning. If Spot got a pet, it'd need to be something Ruddy wouldn't eat. He did eat dog food, but he also liked to kill and eat animals. Every so often, Carson would get a goat or something from a farm out in the boonies, and no one ever saw that goat again. Which, I mean, that's life. Ruddy was raised to be that kind of dog. He needed the muscle and brain function, so he'd had that kind of diet his entire life. Now, at two and a half years old, he was the smartest damn dog I'd ever totally attuned to his master's emotions. Anything anyone wanted from him, he knew how to do. After all, he ruined Sarah's face, damn near ripped her heart out. He terrorized Elizabeth's creepy uncle for hours and hours on end, but never actually touched him. It was honestly remarkable. I knew I wouldn't find a dog like this, but I didn't want a dog like Ruddy anyway. Luca? Mood's ready. Striding in from the kitchen, Carson grabbed my attention and Ruddy scrambled up onto his paws as I stood up. Sometimes, I wonder if you like that dog more than you like us. I do too, my guy. Clapping my hand on Carson's shoulder, I chuckled at his dark, mocking scowl. He shook his head roughly. Nah, I'm glad we could get together today. I got something to tell everyone. What? Tell me first. I'm better than them. Reasoning past him, I shook my own head, and Carson glared at my back. Saturdays were all fun and games, and I loved hanging out, knowing full well I could just let loose. We'd only missed two or three of these Saturdays in years, almost a decade, and I wasn't the only one that needed this day. Stepping through the back screen door, I hiked up my jeans and dusted my shirt of Ruddy's back black short hairs. Smell of the grill permeated the air, and I inhaled deeply before looking around. Anthony sprawled on a reclined chair, his sunglasses on, but his shirt nowhere to be found. But I could tell by his twiddling fingers that he wasn't dozing. Sammy manned the grill, also shirtless, and Amaya hung off him as they talked about what made the perfect burger. Sammy, you got a smoke I can bum? Reaching into his jean pocket without breaking his conversation, Sam tossed me his near-empty pack. Sticking the white butt between my lips, I snatched the grill lighter off the small shelf to spark up. Thanks. Yeah, whatever. You're still a fucking cheater, Luca. Inhaling a deep breath of toxic smoke, I grinned around my cigarette as Sam shot me a nasty glare. He'd gotten his ass kicked during our zombie game, and pride puffed out my chest at how hard he was taking it. You're just a sore loser, dude. My grin turned shit-eating, and Sam's face twisted in annoyance to highlight his scars. Changing the subject effortlessly before he got really butthurt, I took my smoke between my fingers to exhale up. Anyway, are you doing Anthony's thing again in a couple of weeks? Yeah. Turning back to the grill, Sam frowned as he checked under a burger and he wrapped his arm around Amaya as she stared, unblinking at the top grill. I wish he showed up last time, Luca. It was amazing. We made twice as much as normal with Amaya singing between bouts. I really liked her. Congratulations. I'll make it this time, though. My cheek twitched at the dubious look Sammy gave me, and I frowned as I took another drag of my smoke. I'm serious, I will. It's not like I'm working in Las Vegas anymore. 
I'm here to stay. Hey, I believe you. I just think the real reason you never go is because you're a squeamish bitch that can't handle the sight of blood, but whatever. Excuse me? My voice heightened in surprise, and Sammy's eyes flashed out that they caught me. I may not be able to kick your ass, but I can still kick your ass, my dude. Oh, you want to go, Luca? Sam stepped up to me, holding his spatula like my grams used to, and a strange sensation swept through me. I knew that I couldn't beat him in a fight, but he was almost a foot shorter than me. Licking my teeth, I gazed down at him before I couldn't stop my smirk anymore, and I barked out a harsh laugh. Shorty. Dick. Spitting venomously, Sam turned back to the grill curtly, and I stepped back to run my hand over my head. Whatever, dude. I'll believe you if you see you there, you fucking raging disappointment. Hey, 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 now. That one actually hurt. Smirking broadly, I stuck my smoke between my lips as Sammy waved his spatula at me dismissively. A ruckus behind me stole our attention, and my smile widened at the four bodies that shuffled out onto the deck. Carson? Not getting into it. Deal with it yourself. Instantly shutting me down, Carson dropped into a chair by the big glass table in the back corner, and I scoffed loudly. Shaking my head viciously, I ashed over the banister before taking another drag. Anthony spoke up without moving from his lounge chair. Speaking of raging disappointments, I'd like to bring everyone's attention to the fact that I got a friend request from Leon a couple days ago. Sammy tensed, and I exhaled sharply as Anthony hoisted himself up to sit and cross his legs. His tattoos rippled wildly, and I only briefly wondered how he could be so muscular when he never worked out. The air suddenly became heavy, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up under the dense atmosphere. He wanted to know if I'm still friends with Sammy and you. Carson, so he could apologize. Supposedly, he's in an N.A. program, and he's looking for forgiveness or some shit. If I ever see that motherfucker again, I'll kill him. Tell him that. Carson's gnarly snarl snapped through the air like a knife, and Sam grunted in agreement as his expression became pensive and dark. I don't give a fuck. I'll never forgive him. It's not my job to validate his shit behavior. I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying that that's what happened to me the other day. No one spoke up after Anthony's flippant declaration, and I leaned heavily on the railing to take a deep drag. Sammy sparked a smoke of his own, and Elizabeth wandered over to grab one for Carson. The reason everyone stressed about Leon was pretty fucking obvious, honestly. Everyone blamed Leon for Jason's death. Sure, Tyler might have been the one that provided the coke that Jason OD'd on, but it was Leon's fault. If Leon hadn't picked a fight with Sam and Carson, Jason might have lived a little longer. Exhaling a thick cloud of smoke, I tucked my chin against my chest as the silence stretched. Chapter 5 Clarissa Okay, okay. Open your mouth, Clary. Giggling wildly at Luca's demand, I parted my lips and he gingerly guided the slice of pizza into my mouth. His eyes glowed as they locked on mine, and I bit down to groan at how delicious this pizza was. Amazing, right? It's the best place on this side of the country, that's a fact. It is. Thanks for taking me here. Fire licked up my neck and my cheeks as they puffed out in a smile. And I locked my lips closed as he smiled in satisfaction. 
swallowing despite my tight throat, butterflies scattered in my belly, and Luca set the slice down on my plate to lean back, throwing his arm over the back of the booth. Um, so you come here a lot. Is it always this busy? Yeah. Glancing around, every table in the small shop was taken, and Luca paused for a quick second before continuing. Like I said, it's the best pizza for a long while off. People crossing up here through Reno stop here and stuff backpackers and, you know, stuff like that. I just really wanted to bring you here since you're new to town and everything, Clarissa. Turning back to Luca, my cheeks threatened to melt off my face when he reached to tuck a lock of my hair behind my ear. My heart went wild, and I held my breath as he leaned across the short booth. His lips touched mine tentatively, and all the hairs on my body stood up as goosebumps washed my arms and chest. Cupping the back of my head, he didn't do more than just that brush, and his face flushed as I stared, wide-eyed. That was so long ago. Blinking hard, I pushed the memory out of my mind's eye and shook my head hard. In front of me, the pizza place Luca had taken me to had a line out the door, and I wrapped my arms around myself. Releasing a shaky breath, I tried to keep my heart from squeezing out of my ribs, and the butterflies in my belly roiled my stomach. Wow, it's really been so long. Are you in line? Jumping with a surprised squeak, I whipped around to find a smiling face staring back at me. She held up her hands, her lush brown hair rustling when a car whizzed past, and her eyes twinkled brightly. Sorry, it's just you're standing at the end of the line. What? My brows rose high, and I glanced over to find the line had shortened to just poking out of one of the side double doors. Oh, uh, no, I mean, yes, I am. Sorry. That's okay. You been here before? Nodding as I shuffled forward, I gnawed on my bottom lip furiously and tried not to breathe. The smell brought back so many memories, and nothing about this place had changed. My eyes ached with the effort to not look at the booth Luca and I had sat in every time we came here, and I reached to rub my throbbing chest absently. I didn't believe my boyfriend when he said that this place had the best pizza ever, but it really is, and I have been to a lot of pizza places. Um, yeah, it is the best. Answering distractedly, I shuffled forward as someone walked past me with two pie boxes, and my gut nodded together. Do you know, is this place still the same owners and everything? I haven't been here in, God, the last time was uh, 15 years ago. Uh, no, but Tyler's lived here all his life, and he says this place hasn't changed since he was a kid. I just moved here at the end of the year before last, so I'm still considered new. Turning to watch her frown and wave her hand dismissively, I pursed my lips thinly, even as hers stretched into a welcoming smile. I'm Sophie. I apologize for sneaking up on you. This place... Must bring back some memories, huh? My first date with Tyler was here, so I totally get that. Really? My first date ever was here. A weight suddenly lifted off my shoulders, and I nodded when Sophie gasped lightly, her smile widening. I had my first kiss here, too. Uh, I'm Clarissa, but everyone calls me Clary for short. Ah, that's so sweet. Sophie punched my shoulder very gently, and a little embarrassed giggle escaped me as heat crept up my neck. I can't imagine that this is easy for you then, Clary. What brings you back? Um, well, it's 
kind of complicated, honestly. Shuffling forward, I took a deep, stabilizing breath laced heavily with the smells of pizza and wings, and Sophie tried to be sympathetic and not look too interested. It's my high school reunion soon, and I recently got released from a job, so I thought, you know, a change of pace might be a good thing. Oh, that sucks. I'm my own boss, but let me tell you, if I had an employee that acted the way I do and procrastinated as much as I do, I'd fire myself. My giggle was a, a little lighter this time, and Sophie's smile softened as she sighed and rocked back on her heels. So, do you have a new job here, or family? When I came here, I ended up living out of my car for almost a year. I didn't mind, though. It was actually kind of nice, especially not paying bills. Sophie winked at me, and my heart rate stabilized a little more as the line slowly but surely shortened. Glancing down at my heels, I smoothed my skirt against my thighs, and the flowy, silky fabric tickled my skin. At least, it was easier to focus on that sensation than thinking about how I was here, alone, with nothing but what I could carry in my car. No, no, uh, fam no family. I did get a teaching job at the elementary school, though, so I was offered a paid transplant, so I took it. Even though Sophie was a stranger, I felt bad for lying to her, and I clasped my hands against my abdomen. I actually had been hoping an opening would come up, and I was recently let go, so I jumped at the chance. Oh, yeah, gotta take the opportunities when they come, or they'll pass by, or something like that. So, you're a teacher. Do you know what grades you'll be teaching? Nodding as I shuffled forward a foot more, I crossed my arms under my bust as a sadness gripped my chest, as if Sensing my hesitancy, Sophie touched my arm gently, and a weak smile stretched my lips. You don't have to tell me. Sorry, I got ahead of myself with the whole first date thing. No, it's okay. I actually, I haven't talked to anyone about it uh, besides my mom. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be teaching first grade. My last school was a daycare, and I decided to go back to school for teaching a few years ago. Sophie's brows disappeared above her bangs, and my smile widened some. I've already got my degree in early childhood education and special needs education, so I just figured I'd go back for my B.A. I love little kids, but it's a burnout kind of job. Wow, that's so awesome! When I was in middle school, my teachers were the best after my accident. They would let me stay in the art room all day, as long as I, you know, got my work done for their classes. I mean, I guess it also had a bit to do with the depression and stuff, but... Sophie trailed off with a sigh as happy memories filled her eyes, and my smile strained. Shaking her head, she squeezed my bicep reassuringly. Anyone that can be a teacher deserves all the best in the world, Clarissa. I appreciate the sentiment, Sophie. We fell into quiet contemplation as the front counter drew closer and closer with each shuffle of my heels. True, I came here because there was an opening for the next school year, and my experiences in high school here made me optimistic. But that was a small part of the reason, and the rest was... Well, because of Luca. My cheeks heated in shame that I'd actually moved across the country for a man, but I moved the opposite way to forget him, and it had never happened. I hadn't been with anyone but Luca, but I had the courage of a chicken nugget. I couldn't come back just for him. What if he moved on? What if Luca found someone else in the past fifteen years? At the very least, having this new job and the reunion was a reason to come back, and if I didn't like living here, 
I could go back and live with my parents. But let's be honest here, Clarissa, I've never felt like that place was my home. Rolling my lips between my teeth, I gnawed diligently as the notion rang against the inside of my skull. Maine was nice and all, but I didn't like living there. I didn't like the woods and the freezing cold in the winters and the quagmires in the spring. I didn't like the accents the people there had. And I absolutely hated the ocean. I hated the tourist town that my parents decided to live in, and I hated crab and lobster season because that was all any restaurant would sell. And mostly, I miss Luca because I, I'd never gotten over him. Even when Jason died and Luca went off the rails. Even when Luca left me to go join the Navy at his grandfather's behest. Even when Luca didn't return my letters in those four years he was gone. I still loved him. I couldn't look at another man without comparing him to Luca. The disgust I felt whenever someone flirted with me had never lessened in all these years. I was 33 now. Luca probably wouldn't even recognize me. And if he did, I wasn't 16 anymore. But I had to try. And this pizza place was a good way to start building up that pulverized courage that squished between my proverbial fingers. Chapter 6 Luca Staring at the rows and rows of cages, each containing one dog each, I frowned deeply under tightly knit brows. Barking and rustling of claws on concrete filled my ears. The smell of cleaning products and dog and general feces curled the hairs in my nose. My gut churned, forcing my legs forward, and I glanced left and right at the caged animals on either side of me. This was a real shit way to live. In a cell, waiting, hoping that someone might say, I want you. So, do you have any idea of what you're looking for in terms of size and temperament, Mr. DeSanta? Shaking my head as I turned my gaze to the man showing me around, I stuffed my hands into my jean pockets to fiddle with my car keys. You mentioned you're a local lawyer. Maybe a dog with a little less energy would be good? I've heard the horror stories about those long nights. No, I don't know. I just want to see what connection I can make. I'll be talking to my boss before adoption to make sure I can bring him or her to work. My lips quirked up as I looked around while the guy nodded in understanding. My boss wanted to keep me happy. If I got a good, well-behaved dog that wasn't too monstrous, there was a good chance he'd let me bring it to work. In that case, what about this guy? Leading me about halfway down the aisle, the man gestured to the cage on the left. I knelt down to find a golden retriever wagging his tail furiously. He jumped up on the chain link, and I reached to pet him even though I kind of didn't want to. He's four and a half years old, super great with kids. His family suffered a house fire and couldn't keep him, but he's got a great temperament. I was thinking more a girl, honestly, my best friend has a male dog, and he's... he's very... I mean, I want them to get along, and I think a female would be a better option. Reaching to rub the back of my neck, a soreness coated my tongue. Ruddy would probably kill a male dog. At the very least, a female had a better chance of getting along with him. Not to mention, he wasn't fixed so that was a bit of an issue as well. Turning to the cage right behind me, I laid eyes on a female cocker spaniel of some kind 
and I pointed at her as she lifted her big brown eyes to me. What about her? The sign on her cage was scribbled with words, Welsh Springer Spaniel, and the guy came up next to me to cross his arms over his chest. She's been here for almost a year now. She was training to be a special needs dog, but she flunked out. The people that were sponsoring her decided to bring her here. Her name's Cookie. My mouth stretched into a smile at that as I gazed at Cookie. She looked like one of those fancy foreign Oreos, the thick white stripe running from her nose to the end of her tail split her long, chocolate-brown fur in half. She didn't try to jump up at me, even as I held eye contact with her, and only when I knelt down did she climb off her cot. Very gentle, for sure, and she loves water. Do you know why she flunked out of school? Reaching to touch the chain link, I didn't break eye contact with Cookie as she stuck her nose up against my fingers. Legally, I'm obligated to say that she just didn't make the cut, but I think they were inexperienced sponsors and honestly just didn't realize how hard it would be. Supposedly, Cookie's not the only dog they've done this to. It's friggin' criminal, if you ask me. She's a perfectly behaved dog. There's no reason they couldn't find her a home. It's just easier to drop her off. The guy's frown laced his tone, and I hummed softly as big brown eyes begged me to get her out of this shithole. Anyway, you want to take her for a walk? Yeah. Standing up as I unhooked a leash hanging off the cage, I smiled wider when Cookie's tail started to wag. She didn't get too excited too fast, and I stepped back as my guide opened the door. The barking around me became more intense, but it all became white noise as I watched Cookie patiently get hooked up. So you said she's perfectly behaved, right? What are her quirks? We do behavior tests, of course, but the one major thing I noticed is that she hates cars. My brows rose in surprise, and he shrugged as he walked Cookie out of the cage. Only when her entire body, even the tip of her tail, was in the aisle did she start to get hopeful, and she sniffed around my legs as she weaved between them. Spreading my feet to give her room, I gazed down at her as she rubbed her side heavily against my calf. I don't know why. Cookie doesn't seem afraid of cars, but she refuses to get in one. Do you know how she is with other dogs? Starting off towards the door, I ran my hand over my head as Cookie kept her shoulder in line with my knee. Her floppy ears perked up. Even her fur puffed out and my heart ached at the thought of how miserable she must be here. You said she's been here for a year, right? Yeah, she's only two years old, barely an adult. It's really sad, honestly. She's never had any problems with any other dogs here, but it's really a case-by-case -case basis, honestly. Every dog is different, and these ones are all sad and starved for attention. The longer a dog is in the pound, the more depressed they become. We let them into the yard every day, but if you're referencing the male dog you're worried about, it really depends on them specifically. Okay. A somewhat reassurance eased some of the worry bearing down on me, and I nodded firmly. I'd never seen Ruddy with another dog, and he loved me, so the option for jealousy was always there. He was the smartest dog I'd ever been around, but I wasn't his master. I mean, sure, he liked cuddling with me, but he never did it if Carson was in the room. So, if I was going to adopt, what would I need? Emerging into the yard, I knelt down as Cookie started to wag her tail in earnest. Her dog smile stretched wide, and she danced on her paws in front of me, 
as if she was trying to show off the sun bouncing off her coat. I live in an apartment, but I'm near a public park. Yeah, uh, we just need a letter from your landlord that you can have a dog of this size. You have to pay a $100 adoption fee, and uh, you're good to go. We have so many dogs that we don't have the luxury of being picky, although we try to make sure they're forever homes as best we can. Grunting in acknowledgement, I pursed my lips as Cookie nosed my open palms. Her whiskers tickled my fingers and she pawed at my jeans before rolling onto her back for pets. In addition to that, we do a home visit just to make sure it's a safe environment. We'll bring Cookie to you, and I'll check out your place and make sure she's comfortable and stuff. Usually the only reason we wouldn't leave her with you at that point is if you have another dog, but that's not an issue. No, uh, not an issue at all. Rubbing Cookie's shaggy belly, Tingles shot up my arm, and she wiggled around on the pavement. The yard was empty, and I spent a quiet moment petting her before opening my mouth again. So, should I just have you talk to my landlord directly? She's a really sweet old lady. Yeah, sure, but I still need written consent. We've had landlords try to sue us before, like we really have the money for that. Nodding again, I stood up and sniffed hard as Cookie climbed to her feet. You want to take her for a walk around the yard? Yes. Her ears perked up, head cocking, as I pulled my shirt off, and Cookie started to dance again as her powerful little body rippled in excitement. Let's see what she's made of. You were in the military? Me too. Army. Oh, cool. Sticking out my hand, I grinned as the guy whose name I still didn't know reached to punch the tattoo on my pectoral. I was in the Navy. People always ask me why, because I grew up here in the desert. Spending months out at sea was insane the first time. Yeah, yeah. I just got out last summer. So, let's see what you got, boat boy. My grin turned shit-eating, and I turned back to Cookie as she shivered with excitement. Chapter 7 Clarissa Staring at the small but nice efficiency apartment that I'd just gotten the keys for, I crossed my arms over my chest to sigh heavily. The cream-colored walls begged for a painting or some sort of bright adornment, and all the cupboards were empty. Two floor-to-ceiling windows sat on either side of the corner of the building, and I was, once again, glad that I'd gotten an apartment on the second floor. Granted, they required a crank to open, but at least no one could pop the screen and climb into my window. I should go shopping and get a bed and stuff, probably. Twirling my keys, my mumble was loud in the bare room, and I nodded to myself. Leaving the room, I fished my phone out of my jeans' back pocket to open my notes and start a list. I only absently locked the door behind me, but I knew that I'd need pretty much everything. Taking only what I could fit in my car was really just the important stuff I couldn't get rid of. Living with my parents all this time in Maine wasn't exactly conducive to adulting, although it made saving money much easier. Reno has a super Walmart. I'll have to go somewhere else for an actual mattress, though. Heading for the stairs, I twiddled away on my cell phone to watch my list grow longer and longer with each entry. Disposable was the way to go, but I needed pots and pans and bowls and blah blah blah. It'll take me an hour to get there, so should try to get everything in one shot. Frowning at the idea of shopping alone, I ran my hand through my hair absently before pushing open the stairwell door. I'm in such a grumpy mood today. Maybe 
My dark mood was because of the shopping alone issue, but I knew that it was only a symptom. The real, really real reason I was so down was because I'd been here for a week and hadn't heard from school yet. I wanted to get to work as soon as possible, anything to distract me from the fact that my reunion was less than two weeks away. And I'm really about to drive an hour on a desert road? I'd call Sophie, but she's probably already working. It's almost 10 a.m., after all. Taking the stairs to the first floor, my heels clicked softly on the concrete steps, and I emerged into the clean alleyway that led to the parking lot. This apartment building only had efficiencies, and not many of them because they were rather large. Both floors were only separated into six units, three on each side, and I'd snagged the corner with the most sun. My mind was all over the place as I climbed into my little black convertible, and the engine purred to life as I pushed the button that lowered the top. In Maine, I couldn't drive my car for more than half the year. It just wasn't a winter-slash-mud-appropriate vehicle. Pulling out of my space, I cleared the other cars before working my sunglasses onto my face. Already, Luca and the reunion started to overtake my brain, and I set my GPS as I sat at the mouth of the small lot. Gripping the wheel with both hands, I nodded to myself before rolling onto the street. This is going to be a long hour. My foreboding over the drive didn't disappoint, and I passed under Reno's entryway gate before finally yanking myself from my drowning thoughts. Glancing at the GPS on my dash, I forced my thoughts of Luca and the reunion out of my head for now, focusing on the present. I drove the clogged streets at a healthy twenty-five miles per hour. Rolling and nibbling on my lips, I tapped my wheel absently as I forced my mind to stay on track. Of course, that inevitably meant that I debated every choice in life that I'd made thus far. My parents had made the decision to move to Nevada when I was fourteen and actually relocated when I was fifteen. I could remember being so excited that I didn't sleep the night before. I had no friends in Michigan, and Nevada was a fresh start for me. The first day of tenth grade, I met Luca, and the memory filled my inner eye as I followed the line on my GPS. He was slender and tall, with short hair and an easy smile, and his eyes had drawn me in instantly. Sitting at a table with all his friends, he seemed so laid back and happy, and a small smile tilted my lips as a fuzzy feeling invaded my chest. It was love at first sight, but I suppose that's the key word. Was. I mean, we gave each other our virginities. It's not weird at all that I still think about it. Grumbling to myself as I spotted Walmart in the distance, I gripped the wheel tighter and inhaled sharply. Everything that happened to him, of course he needed to go find himself. It's not like he just nonchalantly got on a boat and never... But, like I constantly seemed to tell myself, that was a long time ago. I needed closure. I needed to know whether or not Luca still felt anything for me. I just I didn't want to ask. Ugh, why can't I just not think about it? I'll be a wreck by the time the reunion night comes. What if Luca doesn't even go? Exhaling a loud sigh, I rubbed my knees together through my jeans. If he doesn't go, I'll have my answer. Would I really, though? What if he's still in the Navy? What if he's not even on this continent? Unease tore apart my chest, and I pulled into the Walmart parking lot with dread tightening my gut. The truth was that I didn't know anything about Luca. I only knew he wasn't dead, 
because I'd Googled him before deciding to move back. Even then, I wasn't being honest with myself, and I pulled into a space at the back of the lot to turn my car off and slump against the wheel. I moved back because Luca hadn't shown up anywhere, which meant he was probably alive. Why do I even fight it? It's not going to stop until I see him for myself. At least, if he doesn't show up, maybe one of his friends will. My murmur didn't make me feel any better, and I grabbed my purse, keys, and phone to climb out of my convertible. Straightening my shoulders, I took a stabilizing breath before heading for the huge supercenter. Pulling my hair over my shoulders, my fingers were stiff from driving so long, and I smoothed my dress absently. The white on yellow floral pattern betrayed my current mood, and the heat glared down on me comfortingly. Come on, Clarissa, why can't I just be not, not, <laughs> me? Being back in the only place I'd ever felt at home, I couldn't stop talking to myself. I reached into my purse to grab my wireless headphones. At least I should make it look like I'm not talking to myself. Clary? Twisting as the hairs on my back of my neck stood up, I stiffened, and a familiar voice drew long with surprise. I knew I recognized your hair. What are you doing in Reno? Uh, uh, Sammy. Samuel grinned broadly with a nod, and my heart threatened to burst from my chest when he pulled me into a hug. My arms locked against his sides, and my heels left the ground, while the woman he was with only fiddled on her cell phone. Hey, hi, it's nice to see you. Um, yeah, no kidding. Are you here for the reunion? Setting me down to lean back, Sammy chuckled with a slight shake of his head before I could even process his words. Of course you are. You look so nervous already. Where's Luca? Blurting out the question, I held my breath as my face grew hot and Sam's thick brow furrowed. For a long, heavy second, he was quiet, and my heart throbbed harder and harder as my gut clenched tighter. Sam? Where's Luca? Chapter 8 Luca You're getting a dog, and you want to bring it to work? Nodding firmly, I watched Martin through narrowed eyes, and he drew a thoughtful expression. Okay, just make sure it doesn't shit on the carpet. Of course. Cookie seemed like a great dog. I'm having the guy come to my apartment over the weekend, so I'll start bringing her on Monday, if that's okay with you. Martin waved his hand dismissively with a faint hum, and excitement bubbled up like tar in my chest. Awesome. Thank you, Martin. I know it's not exactly a conventional request, but... I'm not gonna lie, Luca. I think you're an exceptional lawyer, and I want to keep you here. I also know all too well how this job destroys people. It certainly destroyed my marriage and my relationship with my kids, so... If you need to bring a dog to work, you should. For your sanity... You're taking Tuesday off too, right? For your high school reunion? Smiling in satisfaction, I leaned on the edge of my desk to cross my arms and ankles, and Martin reached to scratch his stubbed jaw. It's a big week then. I remember high school. Not my fondest memories. Me either in some respects. I'm still going to at least show up. It'll be an experience, at least. Martin didn't really reply to my declaration, and I arched a brow as he glanced out the open door to my office. Here, as in Vegas, I was just a junior lawyer, but I was more than content with that. I rarely pulled late-nighters, and I got paid pretty well. But there was always a silver lining, 
and I knew it was coming before Martin even opened his mouth. Expect May to complain about it, though. The dog, I mean. Not you taking Tuesday off. Although I'm sure she'll whine about that, too. He grimaced, deepening the lines around his mouth, and my lips downturned as he shot me a pointed look. Don't get big-headed, Luca, but make it through these next six months, please. I've been looking for a reason to get rid of her ever since we won that award. I just never had someone better come in. I mean, being the top firm in a city with three firms isn't exactly an achievement. No offense, of course. My boss waved me off and I scoffed a humorless laugh as I glanced out into the hallway. Why'd you put up with her in the first place? Believe it or not, May used to be less dramatic, not a complete 180, but tolerable. As I said, she's the one that had the most experience and was the sharpest of my employee pool, so please, please don't decide this place is too boring for you, Luca. Smirking, despite the haggardness that dragged down Martin's expression, I nodded firmly, and he clapped me on the shoulder. Good. Well, I'll get out of your hair, Luca. Finish prepping up, and then uh, you can go to lunch. Yeah. Wandering out of my office, Martin left me with a fuzzy feeling in my chest, and I rounded my desk to sit heavily and sigh happily. Sometimes... Things just worked out. The harder a person worked, the farther they'd get, at least in this profession. Man, whoever knew Sammy's old man would be right. Awesome. Drumming my fingers on my desk, I stared at the pile of folders in my intake box as my mind raced through their contents. Each was a case we could or could not take on, and I had already read them. The colorful tabs I had put on their edges reminded me of the case particulars. This was the part about being a lawyer that sucked. Everyone deserved a good lawyer, but it was my job to decide whether or not that person had a good chance of paying us back. Thus, this firm mostly handed employment cases and settlement assets and even wills. Reaching to grab a folder with a blue tab, the second blue tab down, I popped it open to scan the file. The guy had been in a pretty nasty car wreck with a semi that couldn't stop because he was trying to run the yellow light at the end of a highway ramp. His car had been totaled, the semi rolled over, and the driver of the truck was particularly unlucky. Someone waiting at the crosslight had caught the entire thing, with commentary, on a dash camera. Pretty open and shut. Setting the manila neatly beneath my outbox, I ran my pointer finger over the tabs as I stared blankly over the smooth surface. The black tab, black for dead, ha ha, caught my attention, and I pulled out the file from the very bottom of the pile. This poor lady had suffered medical complications during childbirth at the local hospital, and the family was trying to sue. Gnawing on the inside of my cheek, I rocked back in my chair as I scanned the pages carefully. Supposedly, the nurse had given the woman the wrong blood type during a transfusion after a slight hemorrhage during labor, which in itself is exceptionally fucking suit-worthy. But the family was suing for wrongful death of the baby who was, well still alive? Scanning the notes through narrowed pupils, my lips twisted in disgust as they moved with the flow of the words. Because the mother died while the baby was still inside her, the family was pursuing the case as a real person that had died and come back, like, for instance, with a defibrillator or a resuscitation. I didn't know the specifics on these particular laws, and I carefully put it in the outbox. Luca, you have a minute? The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I frowned as I glanced up at the door. May leaned on the frame, 
crossed her arms under her bust to strain the white, thin fabric of her shirt. I'm about to go to lunch. Would you like to come too? I'm skipping lunch. I have to go through this whole pile. Gesturing at the stack to my left. I frowned as May wandered into my small office. Was there something else you want? I was wondering what you want from me, actually. My brow twitched in irritation, and I thinned my lips as May perched on the edge of my desk. Her brown eyes twinkled as she scanned me, but my skin crawled as disgust clawed up the back of my throat. Maybe if we both go out to lunch, we can both get what we want, Luca. You think I want something from you? Why would I? I didn't try to hide my annoyance this time, and May's intelligent eyes narrowed as I scoffed. The only thing I want from you is for you to leave me the hell alone, May. I don't think you're attractive, and I certainly don't want to be stuck in a car with you. Well, aren't you just straight to the point? She leaned over me, crossing a long leg from under her pencil skirt, as if I hadn't just called her unattractive. Her long, bony face stretched into a sultry smile, and indecision tore at my chest. This was my office, and if I left, she'd think she won. At the same time, I just wanted her to fuck off. That's mean, Luca. Telling a girl she's ugly? I know for a fact that I'm not, so what are you afraid of? You're out of your probationary period. Get out, May. My patience wore thin, and my nasty snarl caused May to jerk back as her eyes widened in alarm. Pushing myself up, I towered over her, and she stood up to round the corner of my desk. All of her previous confidence vanished, and I tilted my head as fire rampaged through my veins. You may not be physically ugly, May, but you're a fucking bitch, and you're right. I passed my probationary period. Stepping up to her chest to chest, I clenched my hands into tight fists by my sides to keep myself from glabbing her slender chin. May finally seemed to get the hint and realized that this might be a bad idea, and I held her gaze as a sneer twisted my lips. Get out. Don't come back into my office unless it's business-related, May, or some harsh words will be the least of your problems, in case you forget. Leaning in to whisper in her ear darkly, I practically growled the declaration, and her breath hitched loudly. I'm not someone to fuck with, and you don't have the skills anyway. I'm not some weak bladder intern on his first job, May, and I won't tolerate being treated that way. May whipped around, her heels making no noise on the carpet as she ran away like the cock-hungry, unredeemable bitch she was, and I crossed my arms tightly over my chest. Everything I'd said was true. I didn't find May attractive in the least. She was too thin, too bony. Her eyes were too far apart, and her nose was too slender. Mostly, though, she just wasn't Clarissa. Also, it doesn't really help that May slept with the other intern and then used it as leverage. One of the first things I'd learned on my very first day of my trial period, was to stay far the fuck away from May. Never take so much as a mint from her, because she'll try to use it against me. I should rig my office, though, just in case. She'll probably try again, murmuring to myself. I cocked my head back as I debated the possibility of May changing tactics, by the end of the day, she'd probably be thinking of a new plan to get to me. Of that, I had no doubt. She was a control freak, 
overestimated her worth. Or maybe that's why she's trying in the first place, to get rid of me before I take her job. Either way, if May wanted to go there, I could go there. Maybe junior lawyer isn't all I'm satisfied with. Chapter 9 Luca The doorbell chimed, and tingles numbed my fingertips as I jumped up from the sofa. Smoothing my button down, I hiked up my jeans just in case, and a smile puffed out my cheeks. Striding to the front door of my apartment, excitement bubbled up like tar in my chest, and I could see Cookie behind my lids when I blinked. She knew what was going on by the third time I'd gone to see her at the pound, and I heard her pause on the linoleum before I grabbed the doorknob. Hey! I barely got the word out before a cookie leaped into my arms, and I chuckled as she licked my face furiously. Holding her forty-pound wiggly body, thrumming with happiness, I ignored the guy that held her leash as I rubbed her head furiously. Hey, hey, hey! Someone's happy to see me. That she is. I don't know what humans did to deserve dogs. My smile stretched, and I set Cookie down to step to the side. She strained at her lead, her body wriggling and shaking from her excitement, and I shook the guy's hand firmly. He looked beyond pleased. I was beyond pleased, and he stepped into my apartment to glance around. So, do you mind if I take a look around? Safety first. No, no, of course. If you've got the paperwork all set, my landlady should be down in a few minutes. You can let her go if you want. Nodding, he just released the leash and Cookie immediately bolted to my sofa to sniff around. She didn't climb on the furniture, and I shut the door to rock back on my heels and stuff my hands into my pockets. For a moment, we just watched her explore my living room, and her nose touched every single thing it could. Her tail never stopped wagging, even when she rolled around on the rug with little dog whines of joy. Do you mind showing me your kitchen? Where do you put cleaning products and all that? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm not gonna lie. I didn't get anything for her yet. I was hoping to take her to the pet store after and just... Gesturing him to follow me, I chuckled with Cookie whipped up to prance after us, and her claws clicked on the tile floor. My open floor apartment had more than enough space for her, and the pound employee nodded understandingly. So, I know you said she didn't like cars, but I was wondering, uh, what about motorcycles? Well, you can certainly try, Luca. I don't know exactly what her reaction might be, honestly. She could love it. He started opening my bottom cabinets as he answered my question, and I nodded firmly. Patting Cookie's head as she weaved between my legs, her pants were the only sound for a long moment. Uh, not to be intrusive, but what about your sleeping space? Do you plan on letting her sleep with you, or... Uh, no, I'll be getting her her own bed for sure. I'm also going to get her in with the groomer today, if I can. A knock on my door altered us to my landlady and Cookie clung close to my ass as I left the kitchen. Mrs. Mars was a sweet, tiny old lady, and she smiled under her thin, white curls when I opened the door. Ms. Mars, thanks for coming down. Uh, come in, please. Of course. Where is my newest tenant? Oh, yeah, did I forget to mention she's damn near blind? Smiling politely, I only shook my head and her wrinkles deepened when she grinned. I, I just need to sign something, right? My arthritis is acting up today. I 
Could have come to you, Miss Mars. Right this way. Holding out my arm, I led Ms. Mars into my apartment, and she reached around blindly. Cookie pushed her head up into her gnarled palm, and my landlady smiled happily. Her name is uh, Cookie. She's a great dog, from what I've seen so far. Oh, good. Good. You know, Lucas, I was always wondering when you'd get a companion. You'd never have anyone over. Ms. Mars stumbled over my mispronounced name, but I'd stopped trying to correct her. Entering the kitchen, I patted her hand on my arm, and she trained her clouded gaze on the pound employee unsteadily. Ah, you must be the man from the adoption agency. I'm the manager here, uh, Macy Mars. It's a pleasure to meet you, ma'am. They shook hands, and he pulled out a folded piece of paper from his back pocket. So I just need a signature. This states that basically you acknowledge that Luca is allowed to have a pet here, and you won't try to sue us to cover any damages the dog might cause to the apartment. Oh, yes, yes. For a second, I wondered if Miss Mars could even see the line at the bottom of the page, but she managed to scribble her signature illegibly at the bottom. There you go. All set. I just need the fifty-dollar pet fee now, Luther. My brows shot up in amusement at that one. I didn't think Ms. Mars ever said my name right. In fact, I think she messed up every single tenant's name. Reaching my free hand into my pocket, I pulled out the singular bill to gingerly put it in her waiting palm. She smiled, nodded, and left my arm to walk backwards through the door. And I inhaled deeply when she closed the barrier behind her. She seems lovely, doesn't she? Stealing my attention, the guy from the shelter smiled fondly, and he stuck out his hand for me. Well, uh, let me know how it is in a month or so, all right? If you have any problems, feel free to stop by, too. Thanks, man. Kneeling to rub Cookie's head and cheeks, he walked out of the kitchen without another word, and I led him out of my apartment. When the door was closed, and Cookie and I were alone, I looked down at her to find her looking at me with her big brown eyes. Well, I guess we should go to the pet store. Do you want to run there or take the bike, Cookie? Cookie shuffled backwards, her paws lifting off the hardwood, and I smiled as I bent to grab her leash. Yeah, I guess it's not safe to use the bike until I get you a harness or something anyway. Uh, let's just run. Leading Cookie into my bedroom at the back of my apartment, I let her sniff around as I got changed. Keeping an eye on her, I couldn't help but smile at how reserved she was once the pound guy had left. She knew she was here to stay, and that seemed to mellow her out a little. Swapping my jeans and button-down for running clothes, I stuffed my feet into a pair of sneakers before sucking my teeth gently at her. Cookie came trotting over, her steps quiet on the cream-colored carpet, and I grabbed her leash again. In the living room, I snatched my keys and wallet off the coffee table, and Cookie weaved between my legs excitedly. Let's go have some fun. Should we take the long way? She danced around, and I grabbed my phone off the table to slide it into my pocket before nodding firmly. Yeah, long way it is. Chapter 10 Clarissa Staring up at the neon sign that read, Black Angel's Bar, apprehension widened my pupils and curdled my blood. This was where Sammy said that Luca hung out, and I could totally see that. It was unsettling how easy it was to picture him on a bike, leather-clad, and a beer in his hand. Clarissa? The deep, thundering tone rolled up my back, 
and I jumped with a squeal of surprise. Flying to the right side of the building, surprise clogged my throat, and my lungs ached almost instantly. Clarissa, right? Remember me? Carson? Oh my God, Carson! My voice cracked sharply, and he grinned beneath his thick stubble. He was so tall, so broad. Yeah, you look so, so different. I mean, you don't look bad, of course, but... I know, it's okay. Just like Sam had, Carson pulled me into a bear hug, and my heels left the ground as his iron grip squeezed what little air I had breathed in. Man, is it good to see you. Are you looking for Luca? Um, um, yeah, I mean, yes, I am. I heard he comes here a lot. Setting me down to hold my shoulders, Carson scanned me from top to bottom, and goosebumps washed my exposed skin. Anxiousness coiled in my gut, and he released me to step back and swipe his hand through his hair. Thoughtfulness drenched his expression, and I only just realized the cigarette in his hand as he put it between his lips. Ah, uh, I'm not sure where he is right now specifically, but I can't tell you, I can't tell him you stopped by. You look really good, by the way, Clary. Disappointment flooded my chest, even as a polite smile stretched my lips. And Carson lit his cigarette to inhale deeply before continuing. Are you just here for the reunion, or? No, actually, I moved back. I got a job at the elementary school. Nodding as he exhaled up, Carson twisted at the faint creak from around the side of the bar. A massive, all-black pit bull came careening around the corner, and my smile became a little more genuine. Kneeling down while he just came right up on me, I reached out palm down, and he slobbered all over my hand and up my arm. Oh, this is ready. We're just on the way to the pet store. Were you going to hang around, Clary? I mean, Luca's not here right now. He's probably at work. It's Sunday, and he only takes the Saturdays off to come hang out at my place. N no, I think I'll just go home. I just, I, I was hoping to see him before the reunion, you know. Carson puffed on his cigarette, and I stood up to let Ruddy rub against the back of my legs. I just am hoping to make things a little less... Okay, well... well I'll let him know you're looking for him. Nodding, I gave a little wave as Carson and Ruddy walked off towards what was probably his motorcycle. The dog was very good about being harnessed and hauled up, and I crossed my arms tightly over my chest. That used to be us. When Luca would ride his dirt bike, he'd always invite me. It was special for us, going so fast that nothing else existed. Elizabeth, Spot, let's go. Ripping his throttle, Carson's booming voice chased the roar of the engine, and I headed back to my car rather than be nosy. My disappointment grew deep, dark, and I just sat in my car for a long moment as two women climbed onto a different racing motorcycle. Riding off together, the sounds of their bikes faded into nothing, and I gripped the steering wheel of my convertible to groan and flop forward. I kept missing Luca. How hard was it to find one man in this damn city? Ah, uh, I need something to do other than overthink Luca. My thoughts about him had never been so intrusive, so persistent. And I climbed out of my car again to head into the bar. The place was completely empty, aside from the bartender, and he shot me a friendly smile as I headed for a random stool. Hi. Hello. Welcome to Black Angel's Bar. What can I get for you? 
I also need to see an ID, please. Leaning on his forearms in front of me, he waited patiently as I pulled out my wallet. Oh. What brings you in here? Honestly, I think I just need to get tipsy and talk about my... Trailing off, I debated whether or not to say X, because technically we'd never broken up. Luca just told me he needed to go to the Navy and that he'd be back but didn't know when. Well, it's complicated. Well, I can help you with at least one of your two goals. Handing me back my ID with a satisfied nod, he straightened to reach under the bar and pull out a sweet milky rum in a stout bottle. Sometimes strangers are the best people to talk to, after all. I'm John. I, I don't really have any friends, so I've never really talked about it, really. I guess it all started with Jason dying. Tucking my ID back in my wallet while John popped open the bottle and slid it towards me, my mind slowed as I remembered in vivid detail the day that had summarily ruined my relationship, and guilt clogged my heart. I feel so bad for this, but I hate that he killed himself. He affected so many people so dramatically. We were all in high school at the time, you know, so it's not like we were equipped to deal with it. You think suicide is selfish, so you hate Jason. Hanging my head as I twirled the bottle in my palms, I couldn't answer when my mouth dried, but John had his answer. Personally, I think it's not a bad thing to believe. People that commit suicide do it out of selfishness, thinking that their death would maybe make things better, that being unable to actively influence means they can't th screw things up. I hadn't even met Jason, you know. A weak, unstable smile tilted my lips up even as my cheeks sunk into my face, and the blood drained as my heart squeezed. He was my boyfriend's brother, so I just never got the chance. It was only a few months into the year, and we'd just got together, so... But I think, I think that, honestly, I just hate him because of that. I've had a long time to think on it, you know, and if I'd met him, maybe I could understand why. You seem like a pretty emotionally stable girl, so I probably don't need to tell you that you can't dwell on what could have been, Clarissa. Taking a sip of my drink, I hummed softly around the lip of my bottle, and the sweet taste chased away the disgustingness of the conversation. John watched me closely, settling on his forearms again in front of me, and I sighed as the alcohol burned its way down to my stomach. Sometimes there's a benefit to looking in the past, to see what mistakes not to make again. Take your boyfriend, for instance. You let him get away, and, well, no offense, but that was clearly a mistake. Yeah, you're telling me. Luca went to join the Navy after Jason died. His grandpa had been pressuring him, and Jason's death made him snap. He started doing a lot of unhealthy things, not drugs, but he'd race around on his bike like he was just hoping something would... Trailing off, I licked my lips heavily, and I blinked back in the sting in my eyes as John nodded encouragingly. I just just thought he needed something I couldn't give him at the time. I mean, we were only fifteen, and Luca had just changed so drastically overnight. I'm not saying I'm entirely guiltless in letting him go, but that seems to be a theme of mine, I suppose. I'm never exactly what someone needs, so I just let them go. It's a tough age, Clarissa. If you did nothing to repair the wedge between you, then... Let me ask you this. How do you know you're never what someone needs at any given time? My eyes widened at that, and my breath hitched even as I drew the bottle to my lips again. John clasped his hands together, 
his face drawn thoughtfully, and I took a big gulp as the conversation took a far left turn. Don't get me wrong. Going into the Navy might very well be what Luca may have needed at the time. The structure, the discipline, especially the ability to fight through what he was feeling. But you moved away right after high school, right? Did you ever consider that you can acknowledge not being what Luca needed then, but being what he needs now? That's why you came back the way you did. I... I... I no, I, I guess I didn't. Pursing my lips thinly, I twiddled my thumbs against the side of the bottle and stared down at the polished bar top. I've been here for a few weeks now, but I keep missing him, barely. I mean, I've seen his friends and stuff, but I haven't actually seen him. It's funny how it works out like that. Well, your reunion is coming up, though, and, and Luca is going. Why don't you just see him then? It's hard to barely miss someone in a gym. There's only so many places you can hide in a giant box. I need to know if he still loves me. The words sounded so stupid rolling off my tongue, and my face flamed with embarrassment. John didn't have a single ounce of judgment anywhere on his face, and I propped my cheek on my fist as I gripped the bottle firmly. Chapter 11 Luca Coming up on my office building, I gazed up at the huge box of windows and tightened my grip on Cookie's lease. She kept in stride with me, panting softly, and I tore my eyes off the fourth floor to kneel down. Sitting back on her haunches, she held up her head as I adjusted her bow, and I ruffled her ears with a smile. Beautiful. Are you ready for your first day of work? Tossing her head back, Cookie licked her nose animatedly, and I stood up to lead her inside. That was another thing I'd noticed these past few days. Cookie didn't bark. I wasn't sure if it was part of her training, since some service dogs were trained not to bark, or if she was just a quiet dog. She would whine and give little woofs, but it was usually the dog equivalent to a whisper. Heading up the stairs rather than use the elevator, I ignored the curious glances on my back in the lobby. This was a professional building, but my boss had made a special employee pass for Cookie and hand-delivered it to my apartment. Glancing down as I pushed open the stairwell door, my smile widened at Cookie's perked ears and quizzical eyes. But Martin, being so accommodating, also made me weary because, well, obviously, he wanted me to take May's spot as his partner. This was a small firm, true, but I still wasn't sure if I wanted to take that responsibility. Since our conversation on Friday, the issue had battled in my mind for supremacy over my reunion. We'll just have to see what happens, I guess. By the time my mumble echoed up and down the stairs, I was at the fourth floor, and I paused to train my attention on Cookie. Her pretty, sparkled pink bow on her harness was still in place, and she craned her neck to sniff the air. The plain white harness itself fit perfectly, and there was no sign she was uncomfortable as I pushed open the door and guided her into my workplace. Martin leaned on the receptionist's desk, but their conversation paused when I neared with Cookie. His wallagled face broke out into a grin, and Cookie's tail wagged gently as Sonia jumped from her chair. Dress to impress, huh, Luca? Kneeling down, Martin held out his hand for Cookie, and Sonia rounded her desk to gush loudly. Her words droned out into a bunch of baby talk, but I kept my attention firmly on Cookie. The hairs on my arm stood up as anxiety coiled in my gut, and I held my breath. Cookie didn't seem to mind the attention, 
and Sonia patted her head excitedly while Martin stood up with a pronounced crack from his knees. You got the right idea, since you're taking tomorrow off. Yeah, I figured this was the best way to go. I've got to start getting Cookie used to my motorcycle, though. We walked here, and it's quite a hike. The city, like many in Nevada, was all flat. But my apartment was in the burbs, while my workplace was downtown. Nodding in understanding, Martin stuck his hands into his pockets, and I swiped my hand over my head while Sonia's canoodling drew attention. So, I'm going to bring her into my office and let her get settled. Sonia popped up when I tugged Cookie away from her, and I made my way to my office. Letting Cookie's leash go, I rounded my desk as she sniffed around the chairs and filing cabinets. Pulling my phone out of my jacket pocket, I shirked off the thick fabric to drape over the back of my chair before sitting down. I worked out, but just walking those four miles made my legs ache now that I wasn't using them. Stretching my legs out under my desk, I cupped the back of my head with interlocked fingers to watch Cookie. Just as she'd done at my apartment, she rolled around on the carpet and her dog tags jingled faintly. My own dog tags burned against my sternum, and I rolled my jaw absently as my mind wandered. Working dogs had extremely specific needs, and a Welsh Springer Spaniel was a terrible choice for a service animal. They needed a lot of exercise and stimulation, or so says Wikipedia. Grooming was a bit of an issue, too, because of their long fur and the amount they could shed. I'd gotten Cookie groomed when we were at the pet store, but chances were high that it'd be a weekly thing. I had a gnawing feeling that whoever had gotten Cookie didn't do their research. Springer Spaniels were hunting dogs, although she as an individual was very mellow. If I took her to the park and let her go, she'd still chase the pigeons and squirrels, and she never got too close to kids. Granted, We'd only been to the park once, so. My phone chimed, breaking my thoughts, and I glanced down at the text that popped up. Carson and Sammy, for some reason, had decided to go to the reunion tomorrow night, and suspicion rose in my chest as Anthony's face flashed on the screen. From Anthony. I'm excited for tomorrow. Good luck. Can't wait. He's so dumb. But everyone had changed their minds about going to the reunion, and I didn't know why. Maybe they just decided, fuck it, whatever. I wasn't going to the stupid reunion to reconnect with people that I only knew in passing. There was only one person I needed to see, and I didn't even know if she'd be there. Clarissa's image filled my inner eye and I flopped my head back down to blow out a hot breath. My heart ached, and I reached to rub the spot with a prickling palm as fond memories filled my head. The first time I'd ever seen Clary, we were at lunch. She looked lost and shy in her signature floral knee-length dress and ankle boots. It was the first day of tenth grade, and everyone at our high school already had their click. And our eyes met, hers so beautiful and big, oceans of blue that sucked me in. I invited her to sit with us, despite Sammy's whining, and the rest was history. It really is history. Fifteen years was a long time most of my relationship with Clarissa was post-Jason. When I made the decision to go into the Navy, things stabilized for a while. I stopped my reckless driving and started spending more and more time with her and my friends. About a week after school let out for the summer between 10th and 11th grade, Clary and I got together. We'd been at her house, and the sex just 
happened. She said something funny that I couldn't remember anymore, and I was struck. That was the first time I thought that I could spend the rest of my life with her. We already knew that I'd been seriously considering signing up for the Navy when I turned 17, but Clary had things she wanted to do. She wanted to become a teacher, and that required schooling and dedication. She wanted to go to college in Maine, where their programs were better than ours. But the longer we were away from each other, the harder it became. I wasn't afraid of much, but seeing Clarissa again after so long was terrifying. Tomorrow night, I may come face to face with her again. Just the notion of it, that, that it might happen, was almost enough to make me shit myself from the anxiety and fear. I'd been to war zones, for fuck's sake. I'd shot at people. I'd been all over the world. Luca? My head snapped forward, and I frowned automatically when May sauntered into my office with an armful of folders. I need you to organize these for me. Don't you have your own junior for this, May? Plopping the files on my desk, she only shot me a wink before turning, and I clenched my hands into tight fists. She swished her ass, or what pathetic excuse for an ass she had on her way out, and I reached down to pet Cookie as she hugged my leg. Damn it. Chapter 12 Clarissa Gazing up at the place I'd spent most of my teenage days inside, my eyes ached fiercely, and I smoothed my dress over my abdomen with nervousness, numbing my hands. Lights were streaming out of the auditorium, but most of the school was dark, and I shuffled from one booted foot to the other. My throat tightened, and I struggled to breathe as a fire threatened to melt my insides. Balloons hung still in the breezeless air, and a huge sign had been strapped to the front doors of the school. I can't do this. My lips trembled. Hell, my entire body trembled, and blood drummed in my ears, drown out my choked whisper. I shouldn't have come back. The roar of motorcycle engines was soft compared to the sound of my rampaging heart, and I hugged myself tightly. Inhaling a shallow breath, I couldn't tear my eyes off the school and what awaited me inside. By no means was I early, so Luca could very well be hanging around in the decorated gym. My open back dress hugged me like a second skin, agitating the goosebumps that blanketed my skin at the thought. Behind the slitted skirt, my legs shook, and I could feel the courage I'd spent so long building just seeping away. Clary? The whisper rolled up my bare spine, and the fine hairs on my back stood up as I caught my breath. My eyelids fluttered closed even as my muscles tensed, and time slowed to a near halt when I turned around. Clenching my jaw against the furious heat behind my eyes, I sucked in a sharp, short breath through flared nostrils. Luca's helmet smashed against the ground to bounce and roll away, but his hands didn't move his face a frozen mask of shock. He stared, open-mouthed, with wide, bright eyes. My heart palpitated dangerously, and I didn't see his friends lounging, watching, by their parked bikes only a few yards away. She's an angel, guys. My pupils blew at Luca's very crisp words, and he covered his mouth as his brows furrowed. He smacked his fist against his other palm, and I jolted as the sound clapped through the air like lightning. Oh, my God. 
I'm going to ask her out. Luca was looking right at me, but still seemed to be seeing through me, almost, and realization slapped me hard in the face. The first time he saw me, in the lunchroom. His very first thought of me was that I was an angel. No. My whisper rolled quickly, slowly off my tongue, and Luca blinked to break his spell over me. Stepping back on wobbly knees, I shook my head as my words failed me. Tears spilled over my eyelashes, and his shock gave way to panicked confusion before I turned to run towards the school. No, Clary. The hoarse tendrils of Luca's call slithered up my legs to lock them in place, and my heart stuttered. Clenching my jaw as my face grew hot, the hairs on my back and neck stood up when he came up behind me. Squeezing my eyes closed, my throat tightened and my tears dripped off my chin to trail between my breasts. Clarissa. His worshipful, unstable tone encased me in a thick bubble where nothing existed but us. Hiccuping a shallow breath, I forced myself to turn around, but my lungs deflated almost instantly. Luca stood only an inch or two from me, and his swirling brown eyes leaked before locking onto mine. My heart twisted painfully at his wobbling lips and red nose, and the studs on his leather jacket glinted brilliantly out of the corner of my eye. Tensing when Luca got down on his knees, my pupils blew when he opened his mouth, but no sound came out. His cheeks sunk into his skull because of the angle, and even crumpled, his head came to my navel. Gulping harshly didn't wash away the dense lump in my throat, but a tingled spread along my tongue with all the words that had built up these past fifteen years. But they, too, dried up to cotton and clump against the roof of my mouth and inside my cheeks. What should I say? What could I say? I dreamed of this moment forever, and now that it was here, d just croaking softly, I held up a finger weakly, and hope blossomed in Luca's entire expression. A small crease appeared between my brows, and I closed my eyes briefly as I tried to make right my frazzled mind. My lips twitched, but Luca didn't take his eyes off of me, even when I stepped back to breathe a rattling, shallow breath. When I cracked open my eyes again, Luca hadn't moved a single muscle, and my lips thinned as I slowly but surely gained control of myself. Seeing him for the first time in fifteen years, I couldn't hold a conversation with him. Who was I kidding? All the things I wanted to say to him couldn't really convey what I wanted to say. Luca sprung to his feet as the silence stretched thin, and I stiffened when he grabbed me. My hands automatically flew for his neck as his arms wound around me, and his hard, muscular body rippled like he was being electrocuted. Hot, chapped lips tainted with salt captured mine, and he cupped the back of my head to lift me off of my heeled feet. Melting into his searing kiss, I flung my arms around his shoulders, and Luca squeezed me to dislodge the air from my lungs. Loud cheering and clapping, and even a horn honking filtered into my scope of comprehension, and I smiled. My chest filled with emotions, making it impossible to breathe even after he pulled back to pant. Twirling me in circles, Luca's almost hysterical laugh echoed in my ears, and I tightened my grip on him. His smell filtered up my nostrils, and I ducked into his neck to inhale the deepest breath I'd had in days. Clary, Clary, Clary. 
mumbling in my ear. Luca's hot cheek burned against my temple, and I sighed in utter relief. I missed you. I love you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Luca. I missed you so, so much. I... Speaking up at the same time, Luca and I fell into companionable silence, and I'd never felt so connected to anyone. Tightening my arms around his neck, my nails dug into the leather of his jacket, and his palms flexed against my sides. I love you. I love you so, so, so much. Even, even though it's been so long, I... Let's, let's get out of here. Let's go somewhere else, just us. Nodding without any hesitation, I gasped when Luca set me on my feet, but he didn't let me go. Every time our eyes met was like the first time, and my breath caught as he cupped my cheek. I missed everything. All of your achievements, Clarissa. I missed just as much, Luca. My mumble earned me a, a sad smile, and I took a shuddering breath as I smoothed my palms down the front of Luca's jacket. Stroking my cheek with his thumb, he tightened his arm around my waist, and the ache in my eyes finally began to dull. I've thought of this moment for so long, Clary, but... You scramble my brain just as bad as before. Smiling broadly, a sob blubbers from my lips, and Luca croaked a laugh as he cupped the back of my head to hold me to his chest. Kissing my crown, he took a deep breath, and our chests pressed against each other when I did the same. His smell opened my throat and lungs, cooling the fire that ravaged my insides, and he kneaded my scalp as his heart beat erratically against mine. We have a lot to talk about, baby. Yeah. All the tension that had built up over the week seeped away as we stood in still, peaceful silence, and I nuzzled Luca's button down where his jacket opened. I could hear his dog tags clink softly, the metal grinding together, and he sighed heavily into my hair before I broke the quiet. I missed you. I don't know what else to say. It just went on and on, and I was, I was scared. I was terrified. Leaning back to swipe his hand over his head, Luca smiled, but it crossed his face as a more of a grimace. Oh, man, I'm so glad the guys didn't tell me you were here, or I would have chickened out. They didn't give me any answers either. My eyes flickered to the trio hanging around their bikes, watching us, and I rolled my lips between my teeth. Luca twisted, earning slick grins from his friends, and Anthony was the first to rush over in his crisp suit to clap Luca hard on the back. That was so adorable! Puffing out his lips, Anthony rocked Luca back and forth, but his teasing couldn't mask the absolutely genuine delight in his eyes. What are you going to do now? Because we didn't actually sign up to attend this reunion, and judging by the lack of cars, it's probably a pretty sad party. I'm taking her home, and you're not invited, Anthony. Taking my hand, Luca ducked out of his friend's grip to lead me back to his motorcycle, and I sucked in a sharp breath as my gut tightened. Grabbing his helmet from Samuel, he faced me to carefully put the gear securely on my head. Almost instantly, it became nearly impossible to breathe, and the world cast in dark shadows from the visor. A sense of deja vu that swept through me as Luca lifted me onto the back of his bike stabbed my chest. His very well-used saddle was still warm, and I tucked my dress between my legs 
as he climbed on in front of me. Wrapping my arms around him, I closed my eyes and he held my hand briefly before his bike roared to life. Chapter 13 Luca Pulling my helmet off Clarissa's head, I blinked hard as her beauty slapped me square in the face. Her puffy eyes and red nose made my heart twist, and dark red lines marred her smooth cheeks where her tears streamed down. Setting my helmet down, my hands itched to cup her soft jaw, and I didn't resist wrapping my hands around her neck gently. Watery, crystal blue eyes hid behind fluttering lids, and Clarissa smiled as her relieved sigh filled my lungs. Stroking her raw cheeks with my thumbs, I savored this moment alone, without even a motion-censored light to watch us. Now, I knew why everyone suddenly wanted to go to the reunion, but it didn't matter. Do you remember the first time you rode on my dirt bike? Leaning down to press my forehead against hers, I ground my teeth when Clarissa nodded instantly. You were so scared you almost couldn't get on it. It took me an hour to convince you. I made you promise not to go more than twenty miles per hour on it, but you did it anyway, and it was the most, the most amazing feeling. Goosebumps washed her arms as my palms slid down them, and I tangled our fingers together. Going so fast, it was like there was nothing else in the world but us. You have every right to hate me for what I did, Clary. I acted like you didn't exist after Jason died, and I acted like such a dick to you. Guilt slathered my tongue and inner cheeks, and I gulped down the dense lump in my throat. Larissa gasped, like she wanted to protest, but I thumbed her thick, quivering lips as I licked my own nervously. Rocking back, I caught her bright gaze, and she reached to dangle her long fingers around my wrists. Please, please, I need to say this. Okay. Jerking her head in a tiny nod. Clarissa inhaled sharp and shallow, and I cleared my throat roughly. The darkest time of my life floated up from the depths of my mind to batter my inner eye, and I exhaled a harsh, shuddering breath. I have regretted leaving you every single day of my adult life. Jason didn't mean more to me than you, Clary, and I realized that what I was upset about was everything I could potentially learn from him. Then I realized I ruined my potential with you because of his death when I should have held on to you tighter. Every day, every, every day, I wanted to call you, but what could I say? I'm sorry? That's not good enough. That's when I realized, Clarissa, that I wasn't good enough for you. Her eyes widened. Her tear trails pronounced as she went a shin. A small, sad smile tilted my lips. I want... This time, I want to be better. I want to try to be what you deserve, Clary. If you'll give me the chance. Y Yes, I will, Luca. My chest throbbed from the force of my beating heart, and Clarissa smiled sweetly as I heaved a sharp sigh of relief. Her delicate palms swept up my arms to cut my face, and she licked her thick lips with a shuddering breath of her own. I want to say, too, I, I never hated you, Luca. We were kids. I was always very aware of that fact. We were kids, and you did what you needed to get through Jason's suicide, but I knew that we'd be together again someday, somehow. 
This time, I want you to promise me that we can start fresh. No guilt, because we're both guilty. No comparing then and now, because we're not kids anymore. I promise, Clary. Her smile melted my heart, and I took her hands to lead her up the parking lot to the side door of the building. Tearing my eyes off her, my mind ran rampant as it tried to come up with my next step, but there was just so much I wanted to do. Have you eaten yet? I'll make you something. No, I was too nervous to eat earlier. Biting down on my bottom lip as I nodded, I pulled open the side screen to guide Clarissa into my apartment building. I was floating on clouds, and her long, curled, blonde hair swished as we walked up to the second floor. My fingers itched to run through her bright, sunshine locks, and I clenched my free hand into a tight fist. Me too. Uh, do you still like that Chinese place on West Main? Pulling my keys out of my jacket pocket, I slid past Clarissa to lead her down the hallway. I actually just moved back here from Las Vegas. After I got out of the Navy, I decided to become a lawyer, and Las Vegas was definitely the place to go for her experience. I remember when your grams used to ramble at me on and on after you left for boot camp about loving you for you. She expected such great things from you, Luca. My heart twisted at the fondness in her tone, and I stuck my key in the lock, glanced over at Clarice's faint smile. She was so proud you were going into the Navy. She said it would straighten you out, just like it did with your gramps. Yeah, well, she was right. Being in the Navy was the best thing I could have done for myself at the time. In hindsight, I think that it was best for both of us, honestly. Maybe not the ten years after, but definitely. Trailing off as I popped open the door, I couldn't help but smile when Cookie wriggled and wagged her tail furiously behind it. She stayed put until I walked in, only running up to me once I was fully inside my apartment. Larissa gasped happily as she shut the door behind us, and I patted Cookie's head before the dog spotted the woman. She's beautiful. Kneeling down as I rocked back on my heels to watch Clarissa smiled when Cookie sniffed and licked her. What kind of dog is she? What's her name? Cookie. I just adopted her from the pound a couple of days ago. I may have let my nerves about the reunion dictate my choice, but I don't regret it. Embarrassment stained my cheeks, but it was the truth. I'd gotten cookie so I didn't feel as bad if Clarissa showed up. Rolling into Clary's arms, cookie licked her chin and shoulders, and Clary scratched her sides with a pleased sound. She's a Welshie. I was even able to get my boss to let me bring her to work so she's not home alone all day. That's great. You know, I thought about getting a pet, but I can't bring it to school with me, so I never did. My mom's allergic to dogs, and my dad's allergic to cats, too, so... Trailing off with a heave sigh, Clarissa stole the breath from my lungs when she looked up and I rolled my lips between my teeth. She was so damn beautiful that it hurt to look at her, and her sweet smile puffed out her cheeks. A quake in my abdomen that I hadn't felt in fifteen years rippled down my thighs, and I inhaled sharply through flared nostrils. Clary. Her dress hugged her deep curves when she stood up, and the plain black silk rustled faintly as blood rampaged in my ears. Clarissa had never been thin, but she wore her excess in all the right places, and red crept up her neck to stain her cheeks. 
My harsh, shallow breaths rubbed my throat raw as I lost myself in the crystal pools of her eyes, and I barely registered stepping towards her. Her large breasts strained against her dress as the air became dense and hot, and her hair framed her face like a halo. Slowly reaching a trembling hand to her shoulder, I stared under furrowed brows, and my lips thinned as anxiety bored deep into my gut. Clarissa unzipped my jacket as I pushed the strap of her dress down, caressing her skin, marveling at the thick blanket of goosebumps that draped her chest and arms. My heart beat too fast inside my ribs that threatened to concave, and she pushed open my jacket to glide her palms up my chest. The first time I saw you naked, do you remember? My cock throbbed painfully, and Clarissa flushed bright red as mortification clung to my ribs like tar. Pushing down the strap past her bicep until the fabric barely clung to her nipple, I reached for the left strap. Her hands trembled and flexed against my shoulders, and she slid my jacket down before I paused to shirk the leather off completely. You... I, 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 stammering breathlessly, Clary turned beet red, and my lips twitched as I thumbed her chin. I'd never seen a girl naked before. I didn't even watch porn, which none of my friends believed. Clarissa was the only woman, and even back then. I was embarrassed, yes, but not ashamed. I mean, what man wouldn't blow his load at the sight of her naked? You're even more beautiful now. The strap of Clarissa's dress crested her shoulder, and the entire thing slid down her body. My cock strained against the zipper of my pants, but I grit my teeth and refused to look away from her glistening eyes. I have a shirt you can wear, but, I mean... I don't want to make love to you, Clary, but I don't want to wear clothes either. Shit, fuck, why, God? Why was I so damn stupid sometimes? Clarissa went wide-eyed at my verbal fumbling, and I tensed when she reached to tug my shirt out of my waistband. Her eyes never left mine, even as she struggled to undo the buttons, and I held my breath in fiery lungs, while my heart made a bid to squeeze out of my ribs. I hadn't been half-dressed with a woman in fifteen years, and the muscles in my neck strained as I gulped harshly. Chapter 14 Berisa Stroking Luca's prickly short hair, I relished his closeness as he sprawled atop me. We both thrummed with tension, that only intensified each other, and images flashed behind my shuttered lids. His shirt hid only my breasts, and his skin directly on mine burned from the heat of us. Against my sternum, his jaw worked and my abdomen pulsed wildly while underlying sexual tension dampened my plain black panties but just being intimate with Luca without being intimate was more satisfying, I thought. How was college for you, Clary? Humming softly, my lips parted in a sigh and Luca lifted himself on his hands and knees above me. Between my open legs, his boxers rubbed my thighs raw and I cracked open my eyes as my breath caught. Inquisitive eyes searched mine, and his bulge nestled tantalizingly against my heated, slickened folds. It sucked for me. Law school is no joke. It was pretty much the same as high school, honestly. I lived with my parents off campus, drive to classes, went home for dinner, 
and after I got my credentials, I worked at a daycare for four years, and then I went back and got my teaching certificates and stuff. Lucas' gaze narrowed at my wobbling answer, and my hands kneaded his muscular sides. His face flushed, eyes half-lidded with desire, and the dense atmosphere bore down on us heavily. I start work at the elementary school when the summer's over. I love you. My lips quirked up, and my eyes ached as Luca leaned down to kiss me. His powerful body shuddered violently, and I closed my eyes shut to soak up the emotions that clogged my throat. Hot, chapped lips trembled against mine, and he propped his forearm above my head as our kiss deepened. The taste of him tingled my buds when he slipped his tongue into my mouth to tangle with mine. Soft, desperate groans mingled as our tongues danced, and I shivered when Luca tilted his hips experimentally against mine. His kiss seared my thoughts away and he leaned on his forearm to caress down my sternum with unsteady fingers. My skin tightened eagerly, my nipples hardened into dusky peaks that ached for his touch. But he didn't peel back his shirt from my torso. Luca. Moaning his name, I arched into his palm as it trailed downward, and Luca kissed my cheek and jaw and trailed fire down my neck. My knees pulled up and out, and he groaned against me more earnestly as his harsh breaths scorched my skin. Gripping my hip, he inhaled deeply to suck the heat from me, and my moan cut off by his mouth. Our kiss turned sloppy, ravenous, as Luca and I gyrated against each other, and I wrapped my arms around his shoulders to dig my nails into his hot flesh. Needy whimpers breached my throat, and he rolled us onto our sides to grab my butt cheek and squeeze hard. Desperation tainted the sharp smell of sex that curled up my nose, and I hooked my calf against the back of his thighs to get him closer. The friction sent harsh spasms down my legs, and Luca groaned into my mouth as he pulled back to pant harshly. Cupping my head, he tucked my crown under his chin, and I moaned as undulations tore through my abdomen. Tensing as his thrusts became jerking, I clenched my jaw hard, and shivers raced up and down my spine wildly. Clary, Clary, baby. Trembling violently, Luca buried his face in my hair and tightened his grip on my butt, and I cried out hoarsely. My sensitive nub throbbed as his bulge rubbed against it, and he sputtered when his furious movements caused the head of his rod to pop out of the slit in his boxers. The smooth, spongy tip glided up my belly, aided by the sweat that caked my skin, and my hand flew down to grapple his hip. Luca, please, please. My high-pitched keen was his last straw, and Luca tensed with a hoarse, choking cry that rang in my ears. His cum roped between and under my breasts, his muscle rippling under taut, hot skin as he crushed my chin to the top of his sternum. Harsh breaths rolled down my neck and back as the head of his cock tightened and pulsed. It seemed to go on forever in the stillness. Wow. Sputtering a rasp, he inhaled sharp and loud, and Luca scratched my scalp gingerly before tangling his hand in my hair. Tugging very gently, that alone pulled and pleased gasp from my raw throat, and I moaned when he kissed me. 
the unstable passion of his mouth on mine kindled the fire in me, and I parted my lips for his tongue. I love you, Luca. Rolling me back underneath him, Luca kissed me with a fury that broke my heart. Tears rolled down into my hair, and he tore his head back to stroke them away with a heavy, trembling thumb. I never want to wake up another day without you, Clary. Sniffing harshly, I nodded before cracking open my eyes, and Luca ducked to press his forehead against mine. His eyelashes sparkled with his tears, and he blew out a heavy, hot breath that rolled down my neck. You're all I want, baby. No, no, no. Cupping his face, I blinked hard to clear my gaze, and he pursed his lips thinly. We're going to have a life together, Luca. For fifteen years I... Clarissa. Cutting me off with a sigh, Luca smiled watery, and I gnawed on the bottom of my lip as he hoisted himself up onto unsteady arms. I should take you on at least one date first, right? Like four, maybe, before we go there? Fifteen years is a long time to fantasize. This counts as a date. When the pizza gets here, it'll be a date. Hopefulness colored my tone, and Luca smiled broadly as his eyes lit up brilliantly. Caressing my cheek, he ducked to kiss me with a low grumble, and I giggled as my happiness overflowed from my chest. Okay. Biting my bottom lip playfully, Luca ground against me in a sensual deep stroke, and I kneaded the taut muscles of his sides greedily. Opening my mouth for his tongue, I moaned as his cum acted like a glue, sticking our midsections together. Nothing was better than this feeling, and his palm glided down my hip and under my outer thigh. Exploring Luca's torso as his muscles rippled and strained, I wrapped my hands around his neck to feel his rapid pulse. Sweat eased the friction of our bodies, but the sexual tension I'd been drowning under was almost completely gone. Bracing his forearm by my head, he pulled his mouth from mine to place hot, open-mouthed kisses on my neck. His thick stubble rubbed my skin raw, and I arched when he tentatively groped my breast with trembling fingers. Scorching, heavy breaths rolled down my sternum, and Luca captured my mouth as he tweaked my nipple. Gasping, as my hands ran over his shoulder blades, my lips tilted in a smile as he reacquainted himself with my body. He wasn't the skinny, lanky boy I remembered. The Navy's training was something he obviously hadn't forgotten in the years he'd been out. Kissing me sweetly as he took my wrist to guide my hand down sharply defined abs, Luca cupped my mound outside my panties. The hairs of his happy trail tickled my fingers, and I reached farther south as I spread my legs wider. Tearing his mouth from mine when I palmed his cock, his lips and nose brushed mine, and I squeezed as he thrust into my hand. His hardness throbbed, and he circled my nub gently to stoke the fire that nestled deep in my abdomen. Sometimes, cracking my eyes open, I caught Luca's gaze as I rolled my lips between my teeth, and flames licked my cheeks. In the beginning, I missed you so much that I... My whisper trailed off into nothing, and my chest tightened when Luca clenched his jaw. His eyes flashed, nostrils flaring as he inhaled sharp and loud, and my breath hitched when his fingers crept under my panties. 
pressing his forehead to mine. He didn't drop my gaze even when staring made me dizzy, and I whimpered when he slipped two fingers between my sopping folds. I know, Clary. The thick vein on the underside of his cock pulsed as I held still, and Luca pressed the flat of his fingers against my entrance. Exhaling a shuddering breath, I cupped the nape of his neck with my free hand, and our only movements were the rampaging of our hearts against each other. Chapter 15 Luca Are you tired? Humming softly, Clarissa nuzzled my chest but didn't open her eyes, and I watched the light gray of the sun spread across the ceiling. My lips quirked up, and I twirled a long lock of her hair around my fingers as I forced my next words out. I think I'm going to call out of work today. I don't want to get up. You have to go, Luca. Murmuring sluggishly, she cuddled up against my side, even as she protested, and my smile widened. I want to freak out by myself, if you don't mind. Right, uh, of course. Pressing a kiss to her forehead, I glanced over at the clock through narrowed pupils. Do you want me to leave Cookie for company after we go to the gym? Yeah. The bright green neon number flicked up to 5.22 a.m., and my chest hairs bristled at Clarissa's heavy sigh. My muscles were lead already, and I turned my gaze back to the ceiling with a blustering sigh of my own. We'd been up all night talking, touching, just being together and a serious thought to quit my job floated up from the depths of my brain. Fuck. Sitting up none too smoothly, I groaned as Clary grumbled in protest, and I threw my legs over the side of my bed. Rubbing my face with my palms, I sniffed and arched sharply, and the joints of my spine popped loudly. Rolling my shoulders, the release eased the heaviness flinging to my bones, and I twisted to watch her curl up tighter. Pushing my pillow into her arms, affection swarmed my chest when she clutched it, and my hands tingled as I pulled up the sheet over her face. Snatching the empty pizza boxes off the nightstand, I ran my free hand over my head as I stood up to amble towards the kitchen. Cookie was immediately on me, sniffing my ankles, but I ignored her for the moment to yawn into my fist. My heavy steps led me to the kitchen, and I set the two boxes on the counter to lean down and pet the white stripe down her back. You're such a good dog, Cookie. Smiling her dog smile at my attentions, Cookie rocked into my palm as I kneaded her chest with a pleased groan. I spent a moment petting her, rubbing her ears and scratching her back, but my mind was somewhere else. Part of me thought this couldn't be real. After fifteen years, Clarissa was back in my life. She was just as in love with me now as she was then and I was just as much in love with her. That notion was mind-boggling. How we could have gone all that time and just picked up where we left off. I was a better man now, though. Let's grab our stuff and head out. I'll just take a shower after. I didn't see the point in taking a shower just to go get sweaty again, and Cookie licked her nose animatedly. She was a damn smart dog, and I stood up to head back to my room to grab my gym bag. My gaze instantly settled on Clarissa, but she was passed out, and I yawned again, just looking at her bundled from under the sheet. 
silently popping open the closet. I snatched the duffel bag off the floor before flexing my toes against the carpet. Even my ankles were stiff, and I knew the exact reason why. Shaking my head furiously, I rolled my head to crack my neck, and I shut the closet door to open the top left drawer of my dresser. I sure as shit wasn't sixteen anymore. I wasn't used to sleeping with Clarissa next to me anymore. I wasn't even used to touching her anymore. My lips twisted at the memories of her body tangled with mine, her large, squishy breasts rubbing against my chest and her foot spasming against my calf. Being with her was alien in the physical sense after fifteen years, and I was pretty relieved that things hadn't gone farther than they did. Granted, things still went pretty far. Glancing over my shoulder as I shut the drawer, basketball shorts in hand, I ground my teeth together absently. Larissa peaked so easy that I didn't feel like a piece of shit, at the very least, for my problem, her foot stuck out from under her plain dark blue sheet covering her, and I held back a harsh sigh. Leaving the door cracked on my way out of the bedroom, I shook my head viciously. Everywhere, a thick layer of sweat crusted my skin, and I reached to swipe my jaw as I went to the bathroom. Gazing at myself in the mirror after relieving my bladder, my pupils narrowed into tight points at the smear on my stubble. The phantom taste of Clarissa dried my already cottoned mouth, and I turned on the sink faucet with a sharp twist. Over the course of the last ten hours, we'd done everything but sex, and I soaped my hands to clean my face. When I blinked, I could see her gorgeous thick body splayed, writhing above me, flushed pink with pleasure. My abs tickled with the sensation of her ass grinding against me, and I leaned on the sink heavily to blow out a hot breath. Shit. Turning off the faucet, I left the bathroom and barely realized I'd put on my shorts before I reached the living room. The socks laying on top of my bag were rough compared to Clarice's skin, and I stuffed my feet into worn running shoes. Taking Cookie's harness off the hook on the wall, I forced Clarissa from my mind for enough seconds to put it on the dog correctly. I was not doing well, at all. Working out always clears my head, though. Doubt soured my tongue, or maybe that was the fact that I hadn't brushed my teeth yet. Adjusting Cookie's harness, I nodded to myself at the snugness before standing up again. Let's go see if it will this time. Gathering Cookie's lease, I cast one last glance over my shoulder before checking my pockets for my phone and opening the door. She pranced out before me, and I locked the barrier behind me with keys I didn't remember grabbing. This morning sucked officially, and I ran my hand up my face and over my head heavily. Emerging into the already arid, hot atmosphere of early morning, I shouldered my bag before starting off at a light jog. Cookie tramped next to me, her tags clinking softly as the world around us struggled to stay asleep. Heading for the park by my place, I debated the best route to my gym. My phone chimed as I let Cookie do her business, a pink potty bag in hand, and I fished the device out of a side pocket of my duffel bag. Carson says, You're late. The simple message dragged down the corners of my mouth, and I didn't bother replying as I slipped my cell phone back and zipped the pocket closed. For months, since I moved back, Carson, Spot, and I would work out together. The gym was dog-friendly, and Ruddy joined us on most days. 
Worry curdled my blood as I gazed at Cookie, and I rolled my jaw as I leaned back on my heels. Cookie and Ruddy hadn't met yet, but I was hopeful that they'd get along. If they didn't, it'd kind of put a damper on things. Speaking of, I have to remember to ask Carson where he got Ruddy's stuff for his bike. Come on, Cookie. Prancing over to me after doing her business, Cookie cocked her head up and down, and I met her halfway to go pick it up. The first time Carson and I got together to work out a few months ago flickered in my mind's eye. He'd been suspicious about why I was in town more often, but I never actually told him I'd moved home. I needed to make sure I got the job with Martin first, because telling people made it official. My gym sat on the edge of the burrows, between the suburbs and the inner city's invisible line, and it took only ten minutes to run there. Sweat dripped down my bare back, and I pushed open the front doors to be bombarded with the stench of a well-used space. People were already working out, and I tightened my grip on Cookie's leash as I walked slowly towards the weights. Carson was spotting Spot, ha, and he helped her settle down when he noticed me. Hey, Luca, have fun last night? Scoffing at his shit-eating grin, I rolled my eyes, but Carson's and Spot's attention was already on Cookie. He's a cute dog, isn't she? Is she spayed? Yeah, she is. Cookie hugged my legs, and I rolled my shoulders and clapped my hands as I glanced around. Ruddy wasn't anywhere to be seen, and I cast Carson a curious glance before he shrugged. Where's Ruddy? With Elizabeth. As if that answer sufficed, Carson gestured me towards the treadmills without elaborating, and I frowned. Glancing down, I could see on Cookie's face that she was anxious being in a new place, and my lips thinned as I dropped the subject. Chapter 16 Luca Pulling a plain white shirt over my shoulders, I fastened the buttons as Clarissa stretched out on my bed languidly. She was much more awake now that the sun was fully out, and I checked my watch absently. She'd always been a morning person, my Clary, and she pulled her body taut with a sigh in the mirror's reflection before hoisting herself up to sit. So what's on the docket today? My lips quirked up as I watched her run her hands through her beautiful sunshine hair, and pleasantness spread through my chest. I don't know what being a junior lawyer's like, but I'll be hitting the courthouse after lunch, but up until then, a lot of paperwork. Martin will take any case he thinks is worthy of the money. Humming softly as I did my last button, Clarissa started to button her borrowed shirt closed, and I bit down on my bottom lip. You look good in my shirt. If you were any less muscly, I'd feel fat in this shirt. Turning on my heel to arch a brow high, I frowned even as her cheeks puffed out in a smile. Scanning her through narrowed eyes as I tied my tie with practiced hands, I clenched my jaw against the desire that built at the back of my throat. Clarissa wasn't and had never been thin, but she carried her twenty extra pounds in all the right places. Her breasts held the shirt out enough that her little pouch wasn't visible, and even if it was, I thought she was beautiful. Even though she wasn't comfortable with her body, she always wore a dress if she could. I liked it better when it was open. Choosing my words carefully... I inhaled deeply as Clary smiled broadly. When we were in high school, she'd been conscious of her breasts and thighs, but that appeared to have fled as she bounced up to her feet. 
Want to get together for lunch? I can come pick you up. Okay. Chirping her agreement, Clary wound her arms around my neck and I fixed my tie before ducking to kiss her. She pulled away quickly, teasing me with just a taste, and my own hands gripped her fleshy hips to keep her against me. I should go home at some point today, though. Right. Giggling at me, she pulled out of my grasp completely, and I cleared my throat roughly. Speaking of, when you call your mom, tell her I said hi. I will. I swear that she was probably more excited about my coming back than I was. She always liked you. She didn't even try to deny it, and I couldn't help but laugh as I shook my head. My car is still parked at school, too. I need to get that at some point before it's towed. Now, it seems useless to have a place of my own. What? You think I'm just going to let you stay here? Our banter lightened by my very soul, and Clarissa smiled and shot me a wink on the way out of my bedroom. Images flashed behind my eyes when I blinked, and I leaned on the dresser to sigh in content. In front of others, she was shy, but when we were alone, the first few weeks of our relationship in high school, she could barely look me in the eye. Oh, how far we've come. I gotta head out, but I'll put my number on the fridge. Cookie sat outside the bathroom, and I rubbed her head fondly as I passed by. They liked each other, which was good. Cookie wasn't allowed on my bed, but she didn't seem jealous in any way. She was just a very good-tempered dog, and I emerged into the kitchen feeling good-tempered myself. Scribbling my cell number on the whiteboard on my stainless steel refrigerator, I capped the marker and grabbed my briefcase off the counter. Twirling my keys absently, a pep invaded my step as I snatched my leather jacket and headed out. I doubted that even May could ruin my day, and I grabbed that feeling with both proverbial hands on my way out to the parking lot. Even my bike roaring to life was happier than usual, and I backed out of my spot to roll towards the road. Pushing my visor down, I grinned at the congested streets as people flocked to downtown. Revving the engine, my palms tingled up my arm, and I bit down on my bottom lip before racing out into traffic. I reached my workplace in record time, and I parked in my usual spot on the second floor of the lot easily. Sitting back in my saddle, I pulled my helmet off to glance around, and a satisfied sigh escaped my mouth. Luca! Looking over at the booming call, amplified by the space, I offered Martin a nod as he drove by in his shiny Mercedes. He parked close, and I shouldered my briefcase to wait for him before making the journey to the street. Hey, I thought you'd be bringing Cookie again. How was your reunion? Fast walking the four spaces to me, Martin shared in my good mood, and I stuffed my hands into the pockets of my work pants. I never actually made it inside. Cookie's at home with my girlfriend right now, though. I took her to the gym this morning, and she didn't seem to take it well. Nodding and understanding, Martin walked in step with me towards the elevator portal, and I blew out a heavy sigh. How was it yesterday without me? It was fine. Court went well. Poor kid's going to jail, but, but that's what you get when you get caught selling ketamine. I didn't really know what to say to that. The outcome was expected, and we'd get a good chunk of change from the city for it. Opening the heavy metal door for my boss, I followed in behind him, and he punched the elevator button before speaking up. So, about what you asked me to do with your office, Luca? It's just a precaution, Martin. 
I didn't mean to put you in a difficult spot. It's just trailing off. I scowled lightly as Martin watched me through narrowed eyes, and he tilted his head in insistence. If I get into it with May, I want to be able to say she started it, is all. I don't like how persistent she's being now that my trial period is up. These past two weeks, he just makes me uneasy. May is definitely someone used to getting what she wants. Honestly, I don't think putting the offices under surveillance is a bad idea anyway. We're prosecutors. I know what happens when there's no evidence. An ugly black blotch formed in my chest at his assurance, and Martin clapped a hand on my shoulder with a slight frown. I did it to everyone's office, including mine. If May does overstep her bounds with anyone, I'll have proof. Yeah, I just... I was in the Navy, you know, so... I could really hurt her if she got two in my face. Plus, it's not something people understand. Aggressive women. Clarissa had kept me from dreading this morning, and the elevator gave a shrill ping before the doors slid open. Martin didn't reply immediately, and my mind churned as I tried hard not to be ashamed. I had every right to worry about hurting May. I had killed people in the military, and that wasn't something that just went away even after a decade. When the doors closed, Martin faced me fully, and I held my breath as I straightened to shore myself up. Luca. Let's be realistic here, okay? We both know that there's not much we can do about May beyond firing her, and you could get a restraining order if you get the right judge. Think of it like this. Now, no one can get away with stealing office supplies, fudging their hours, or any of the other stupid shit that employees try to get away with. And if May does do anything that warrants termination, then we can terminate her. I know you're more aware of the issue because of your background, and I admire that about you. Nodding sharply, I exhaled through my teeth, and Martin mimicked me before clapping his palms to rub together. Good. Now, enough about the cameras and microphones. Let's talk about this case today. Chapter 17 Clarissa and You haven't picked up yet. It's Mom. This is my third time calling you. Almost noon there, so just get back to me when you get this, please. Hanging up to my end of my voicemail, I flopped my head back over the sofa to groan in frustration. Why does she never answer the phone when I need her? There was no one to answer my question, and I set my phone in my lap to pull my damp hair over my shoulder. Sophie was at work. Luca was at work. Everyone was at work. Luca hadn't even been gone an hour, and I was so... So very bored. It's going to be like this all summer until school starts, too. Maybe I should go find something to do. Let's go for a walk, Cookie, huh? What do you think about that? Cookie nearly jumped up off her paws at my cooing, and I smiled as I hoisted myself off the sofa. Looking down, my eyes narrowed and my lips thinned as I rolled up the hem of Luca's shirt. Oh, right. I don't have pants. I already suggested it out loud. It'd be mean to the dog not to go on a walk. Frowning slightly, I headed back to Luca's bedroom, and Cookie pranced gleefully behind me. Browsing through his drawers, I pull out a pair of basketball shorts to stick my legs in. He had a smaller waist than me, and my thumbs smoothed the elastic as it created a slight fold. Boys always get the long straw. I'll have to wear my heels, too. Maybe we can take a walk to my car. It'll be fine, I think. Nodding at my own mumble, I sniffed an inhale before snatching my wallet off the nightstand. I'm going to have to pin this location so I can get back here, though. Sitting on the bed to strap up my heels to my ankles, 
I couldn't help but smile as I gazed down at myself. I was sixteen years old. I would have refused to go anywhere looking like this. There was no possible way I was doing anything but the walk of shame, and that's what people would think. Thankfully, now, I was older, and that had to count for something. Clutching my phone in one hand and my wallet in the other, I found myself in the front of Luca's apartment, and I unhooked one of two harnesses hanging next to the door. Cookie wiggled and bounced around excitedly, whining softly, but she didn't actually jump or bark. Kneeling down, fondness struck my chest when she sat back on her haunches and lifted up one leg. Expectancy shimmered bright in her eyes, and she dipped her white speckled head with perked ears. The white harness hanging on the wall had an employee badge on its tag rings, but this harness was lavender-colored and definitely a different model. Easing Cookie into the thing, I made sure the harness was snug but not tight before standing up to prop my knuckles on my hips. You got a good life for a dog that spent the last year in the pound. Makes me wonder, you know, Cookie, who suffers for our choices, or lack of them, hmm? She couldn't answer me. She was just a dog, after all. Shaking my head, I grabbed a leash off the wall and hooked her, hooked her up before taking a deep, steadying breath. Well, I may not work out, but we can take a nice walk at least. It's not like I'm a couch potato. On the way to the street, Cookie didn't tug on the leash despite her obvious excitement, and I fiddled with my phone. There was a dog park just two blocks from here, and it was on the long way round a school where my car was still parked, according to the GPS. Gnawing on my bottom lip, I navigated to my contacts, and my thumb hovered over my mom's name and number. I was confident my mother would call me back, because she was nosy and had always loved Luca. She was almost as upset that he went into the military as I was, and she was just as happy I was moving back here as me. Her last words to me in person rang inside my head, and I smiled as affection clung to my ribs. If you and Luca get back together, I will move back in a heartbeat. She could have have been more serious, and her face flashed behind my lids when I blinked. Of course, you gotta answer your phone, Mom. How can you get the juicy details if you don't pick up? My heels clicked on the sidewalk, and they gazed around as I locked my phone with a single press of a button. Inhaling deeply, I relished the warm mid-morning air, and some of the tension in my shoulders eased as I sighed. The apartment building was on the inner edge of the suburbs, and I took a sharp right down the corner as a single car came to a stop at the sign. Everyone was at work, and the deserted streets gave way for my light mind to wander the night before. I needed to take a shower after Lucas and my es escapades, and I reached to run my hand through my hair to clear some of the tangles. My skin was tight, the thick, dry layers sitting on top crackling when I moved, but I had never felt so clean, so pure. Maybe it was because despite everything Luca and I did last night, my panties had never come off. There was a point, with my back plastered to his front, our bodies swaying front to back, his hands on my chest and his cock between my legs. Fire raced up my neck to fill my face, and I shook my head furiously to get rid of the mental image. The fine hairs on my cheeks stood up as I clenched my butt cheeks reflexively, but I forced my mind to a different thought. Luca was a good man. He was just such a better man than he had been, and a pang ripped through my chest that I'd missed such a beautiful transformation. Granted, it probably had a lot to do with the Navy, but I was positive that going straight into law school had done quite a bit, too. It didn't take a moment 
always busy, always striving, and some of the knots in my abdomen dissolved as the memory of his tales of Vegas filled my ears. Before I could get too far into it my own, my cell phone began to chime and vibrate, and I jumped in surprise. Cookie paused as my sharp gasp whistled through the air, and her big brown eyes locked on me as I fumbled with my phone. Mom, finally! Clearing my throat of its high pitch, I started on again and I reached down to pet Cookie's head as she plodded next to me. Holding my phone to my ear, I didn't give my mom a chance to speak up as words just tumbled out of my mouth. I need your help. I don't know what to do. Okay. I mean, you're not a crying mess, so what happened at the reunion last night? Did Luca go? We reached the dog park in the time it took me to blink, and I nodded even though my mom couldn't see me. My chest tightened at the half-dozen patrons milling around with their dogs, and I opened and closed the three gates in a heavy silence. The reunion was still a little fuzzy on my end, and I let go of Cookie's leash to let her wander off with her nose in the grass. Okay, so, yes, he was there, and yes, I mean, Mom, it's like, it's like the past fifteen years were fifteen minutes. I spent the night at his house, and nothing happened, of course, but... What do you mean, nothing happened? Clarissa? I don't believe that for a single second. Flames licked my cheeks, and I sat down on a bench to cradle my wallet and keys in my lap. Mom? Nothing happened. We talked a lot. We have a lot of catching up to do, right? You were up until you had to go to work, and... Okay, but that's not the point, Mom. We made, we made up, and it... I don't know what to do now, it... It was like it was like we were seeing each other for the first time again, and I just don't know what to do. Pursing my lips, as my dilemma became clear, I leaned back to cross my knees, and the warmth of the wooden bench seeped through my borrowed shorts. I need your advice. Well, I say you marry him before you get distracted again, Clarissa. Chuffing in embarrassment at my mom's matter-of-fact tone, my throat tightened and my smile strained. Trust me, okay? I am your mom, Clary, and I know what's best for you. If things had happened differently, you and Luca would have been that couple that got married in high school with your parents' permission or something. I knew it. Luca's grandparents knew it. Hell, your grumpy, wrinkly old science teacher knew it. So, that's my advice. Go to the courthouse and get married. Mom, I'm not going to do that. Grumbling quietly, I rolled my lips between my teeth as my mom groaned, and I could hear what questions she'd blurt out next. And before you ask me why I asked for your advice, if I'm not going to take it, marrying Luca seems a little drastic, okay? I was thinking you'd have something to say that that wasn't that. You get your conservative side from your father's side of the family, okay, Clarissa? Be a little spontaneous. Put yourself out there. It's not like you're marrying a stranger, okay? Why don't you just start from the beginning? Did you see Luca before the reunion? Chapter 18 Luca Someone's in a rush today. The hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up as May purrs, and I scowled darkly before wiping my face of emotion. She'd been up my ass all damned morning for petty shit, and a scorching short sigh dried my lips before I twisted. Today, she wore only the lightest makeup, eyeliner, and mascara. Not that I was an expert and it only highlighted the brightness in her gaze. Do you have special plans for lunch, Luca? Yes, I do. What do you want, May? My tongue tingled with the urge to just scream at her to 
leave me the fuck alone. What was so wrong with this woman that she couldn't take a hint? Surely, May was used to men wanting her, but why couldn't she just go after one of them? Rounding my desk, she swished her tiny hips in her pencil skirt, and I frowned as questions whizzed through my head at lightning speed. I brought lunch today. I thought we could eat together. Taking my leather jacket off the hook behind my desk, I folded it over my arm to hide my clenched fist. Leaning on my desk, she crossed her long arms over her B-cup breasts, but it didn't help them look bigger. Uh, no, let me tell you again. I'm not interested in you in any way, shape, or form, May. I don't find you attractive, and I want you to leave me alone. Speaking loud and clear, I frowned when May's face twisted at my rejection, which was stupid because I didn't know what she expected, honestly. I'm not having lunch with you today, tomorrow, or any other day. I'm not having sex with you. I'm not taking you for a ride on my bike or going out for coffee because I have fixed your flat tire. I'm not you don't leave me alone, May, I'll file a harassment complaint against you. Yo, what? Excuse me? She advanced on me, her face turning red with anger that flashed in her eyes, and I tensed even as I held my ground. May got in my face, and I desperately hoped that a camera was able to catch this corner. I'm the partner here, and you are the junior, Luca. I can make your life miserable. My eyelid twitched in agitation, and I clenched my jaw to grind my teeth hard at her vicious hiss, like the snake she was. May fumed, her face inches from mine, and I took her shoulders to force her back a step. Leave me alone. Just because I'm a junior doesn't mean you can push me around. You want to fire me? Why don't you just go throw a temper tantrum at Martin to get what you want? You know, like in kindergarten. He's my senior here. He's the one that can fire me, not you. She gasped in a front at my snarl, and I stepped out from the corner and away from her as she went still with shocked fury. Leave my office, May, before I physically remove you. Holding open the door, I checked my watch only to frown at the time. Lunch had started two minutes ago, and now I was late. When I looked up again, May hadn't moved, and I arched a brow in threat while she continued to glare. Do you need me to count down from five? That really pissed her off, and she stomped past me even though the carpet made her exit a little lackluster. May flipped her hair as she stormed into the hallway, and I followed her to close and lock my office door. Her anger heated the conditioned air, but I shoved her bony ass out of my mind on my way to the stairs. Thankfully, I'd made it a point not to use the elevators regardless. Those things just inspired laziness. Shuffling into my jacket, I rolled my shoulders sharply and shook my head hard as I pulled my cell phone from my pants pocket. Navigating to Clarissa's contact, I tapped the green call button absently, and I reached the first floor to open the metal door to the lobby. Hello? Clary's breathless tone sapped the anxiety gorging my muscles, and I smiled slightly as I passed the receptionist's desk. Let me pull over, Luca. I went and got my car, uh, no, uh, Cookie, just sit. Stay in the seat. We're not getting out yet. Cookie is in your car? Surprise laced my voice thickly, and my brows rose as I followed slowly behind a group of people from another floor. She hates cars. How'd you manage that? Oh, it's a convertible. She got in no problemo when I put the top down. I think she just doesn't like small places like that. 
We went for a walk so I could get my car, and we stopped at the dog park while I talked to my mom for two hours. My smile widened, and I pulled open the stairwell door to the parking garage while everyone else piled onto the elevator. Um, so uh, how's your day so far? Uh, it's the usual, I guess. It's not like I went on vacation and everyone at my office wants to know how it was, you know. It was just a day for a cringy reunion that I ended up not even going to. Clarissa giggled at my oversimplification, and I took the stairs two at a time as I fished my keys out of my other pocket. What'd your mom say? Did you tell her I said hi? I mean, she hasn't really changed in 15 years, Luca, so after I got out some details... Trailing off, Clarissa's smile shone in her voice, and the line crackled as the concrete interfered with my service signal. And no big deal. I expected as much. At least, she said something about talking to my dad about moving back to Nevada. Well, let me know if she needs help finding a house or whatever. I know a guy that can hook her up. Humming an acknowledgement, Clarissa was quiet for a moment, and I hugged the outer edge of the garage to avoid the call being dropped. So, do you want anything specific for lunch, or I personally am really wanting a salad for some reason? Actually, I was thinking the same thing, since I'm already in my car... Do you just want me to pick you up instead? Where's your firm? Stopping short, I couldn't help but chuckle lowly, and I rocked back on my heels as I gazed at my bike longingly. Then again, I've never been in a convertible. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I'll text you the address so you can just put it in your GPS. With an affirmative okay, Clarissa hung up, and I turned on my heel to shoot her a quick text. The address marked scene immediately, and my legs carried me easily back the way I'd come as a line of cars started to back up around the bend of the second level. I actually haven't driven a car since. I couldn't even remember the last time I'd driven a car. Monsoons in Las Vegas were never a problem, because it had only rained for thirty seconds. The overcast was always worse than the actual downpour. The joys of living in the desert. Larissa rolled up on me in a sleek white convertible, very much a feminine car. Right when I exited the parking garage, and I grinned broadly, Cookie wiggled happily, and I held her back with a chuckle before popping open the door. She sat in my lap, licking my face with little whines, and her tail wagged furiously against my knees. She's happy to see you. Reaching over the center console to squeeze Clary's thigh over her yellow-white floral dress, I leaned back and buckled my seat before she flicked on her blinker. We had a great morning. I miss the heat. It's not the same on the coast. Every morning is muggy and just uncomfortable. I remember the feeling. I was in Germany during the fall. It was honestly the worst. Holding Cookie's harness firmly, I stroked her down her back as she calmed from the movement of the car. Oh, you can take this next left at the light to get around all this traffic. Where are we going? The issue right now was the congested road, and Clarissa kept her blinker on as cars refused to let her merge into the turn lane. I'm okay to grab anything, really. I was wondering, too, what you might want for dinner. I'm gonna... Like, I went, went to your kitchen. It wasn't impressive. What did you honestly expect, though? These past few days were rough. I basically only ate what was easiest sandwiches and stuff. Sometimes I just don't want to cook after work, especially if it was a rough day. Covering my hand to drive with one, Clarissa nodded as she jabbed the gas, and her car sputtered forward with a jerk. A car honked furious and long, and I glanced over my shoulder at the silver minivan she'd cut off. 
There's a restaurant just on the other side of downtown that only serves vegetarian. They have their own farm, but this is the desert, so there's only so much they can grow. They open in about 20 minutes and close when the food's gone, usually before five. It's pricey, but it's really worth it. They have their own garden? How, if they're in the middle of the city? By the time Clarissa made it to the light, it had already turned red, and we stopped behind a black, shiny BMW. Glancing over at me, she flopped her head against the rest, and I rolled my jaw absently. They bought up two plots next to the place. Part of it is also a community garden, because there's a lot of homeless transients that come through. I actually know the guy that owns it. Trailing off, I realized too late that I said a little too much, and Clarissa's inquisitive gaze caught mine. It's a bit of a story. These past ten years, I was involved in some less than savory activities. Well, not involved, more like aware of. It sounds like a bit of a story, Luca. My lip twitched at the obvious undertone, and I only nodded at Clary's expectant glance. The car in front of us rolled forward, and she couldn't hold my eyes to force the truth out of me. Not that it seems to matter, because she'd just bring it up later in private. Clarissa got some of that infamous nosiness from her mother, after all. Chapter 19 Clarissa Wait, whoa, wait, wait, well, back up. You're telling me that you had a major drug-selling operation going on with your friends? Luca winced at my hiss, holding up his hands in surrender, and I stabbed a cherry tomato hard as emotions bombarded my chest. How? 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 Explain. I wasn't involved, involved, Clary. I just gave them legal advice and told them what to be careful of. It's all over, Nunwell, mostly. I'm pretty sure Tyler's still got something going, but that isn't something I know anything about. Not daring to tear my eyes away, I pursed my lips thinly, and Luca's assurances did nothing to ease my suspicions. Shooting me a smile, he nodded, as if that helped any, and I stuffed my tomato in my mouth roughly. Listen, I told you because I didn't want to not tell you, Clarissa. I'm totally straight, no bad, nothing, okay? It's over, and even if it wasn't, I'm not connected to it in any way. It was all Carson, Sammy, and Tyler, mostly. I just gave them legal advice. It's been years. I believe you that it's over, Luca, but I don't like it. You knew I wouldn't like it, and I appreciate that you told me, but I wish you didn't. Frowning, I swallowed my bite as he smiled tenderly, and I leaned back against the chair to huff. That's dangerous. I mean... It's important. We, we've done a lot for this city, Clary. It's not like we just hoarded all the money. Anthony's clinic is free for anyone and everyone. The homeless people, the vets, the people without health insurance or adequate health insurance. This restaurant is what it is because of it. I have no student debt because of it. To be honest, though... There's worse things that Anthony and Sammy do, but I don't know anything about that either. I just wanted you to be aware because it'll answer some questions. The benefits outweigh the risks. Luca was doing a pretty good job of convincing me of that part, but I held my frown even as I relaxed a little. Reaching across the small circular table... He held my hand tightly, and electricity rose the hairs on my arm. We've been through a lot, Clary. And 
I ran away to the middle of the ocean. It was just as much about giving back to this city than anything. I stayed out of it because that was what was best for me, even though I kept my friendships with the guys. Fine, as long as it's over now. I can't really be mad about something that happened in the past. Scrunching up my nose, I blew out a hot breath at Luca's relieved expression and slump of his shoulders. Um, just one question. Who's Tyler? Oh, right. You never met him. Squeezing my hand, Luca retreated to grab his fork again, and I bopped my head in agreement. He's Jason's best friend, or was, when he was alive. After Jason died, Tyler kind of became the leader instead, and he's pretty rough around the edges, but he's a good guy. Full of himself, but it's gotten better recently. His girlfriend kicks him around a lot for his attitude, even though she's not much better. Humming softly as we turned our attention back to our half-eaten salads, I reached under the table to pat Cookie's head softly. That news wasn't what I had ever thought to hear from Luca's lips. Being affiliated with drug dealers in a pretty big operation that spanned the whole state? Like, what? But if I judged Luca for that, I'd have to judge him for running away to the Navy. I'd have to judge him for not being there to take me to prom. I would have no choice but to judge him for not once contacting me after he'd gotten back. So, how are you like being a prosecutor here versus in Las Vegas? I can't imagine it's nearly as busy. Changing the subject bluntly, I glanced over as Luca cast me a thoughtful glance as he chewed. These salads were really good, but I could definitely use some ham on mine. Even with the dressing, which was delicious, it was a little bland. Pushing a forkful of lettuce past my teeth, I watched him without regret over coming here. Definitely gonna go to a deli after, though. It's not even close, but honestly, I only worked in Vegas to get the experience. If I did that here, it would have taken forever. There's always people committing crimes or getting divorced after a wild night and stuff like that. I always planned to move back here when I felt that I could. What about your teaching, Clary? Where'd you do daycare? I, I didn't like daycare. Mild venom soured my tongue and I propped my elbow on the table to hold my chin on my knuckles. Luca nodded with a grunt as he rifled through his salad, and memories flashed behind my eyes when I blinked. I mean, I like kids and all, but working in a daycare? I never want to do it again. Those two years were definitely enough for me. I don't know if it's just because of the area. A lot of the kids I had were on the wealthier end, but it really just made me so frazzled. These four-year-olds acted like they were the bosses. They didn't respect anyone, and their parents were the absolute worst to deal with. I had this one lady come in and screaming at me about filing charges because her daughter had an accident and changed her pants. Did she? Luca chuckled at my dumb look and I speared a piece of cucumber to guide it past my teeth as he sighed. You'd be surprised how many cases I sort through that involve idiot parents. Just last Thursday, I read about this woman that wanted to sue her daughter's high school for making her read Shakespeare. I mean, personally. I think reading Shakespeare in itself should be a crime, but you only think that because you got picked to read the Romeo parts out loud because... No one volunteered. He scowled playfully at my jab, and I giggled as I held my free hand to my chest. I thought it was great, Luca. Yeah, well, I felt like an idiot at the time. I mean, what does that do for us, anyway? Shrugging, 
I didn't have an answer for that, and I glanced around the restaurant with appreciation as the conversation stalled. Herbs hung at every window, and there was a patio that was unfortunately closed today. Luca and I had been able to bypass the line of people waiting to grab their salads or sandwiches and run back to work. Clearly, this was more of a takeout place, although quite a few tables around us were taken. I hate Maine. Gnawing on my inner cheek, I ducked my head to shovel a forkful into my mouth, and Luca's intent eyes settled on me. Chewing and swallowing quickly, my lips downturned, and I shook my head slightly. I hated Maine for so, so, so many reasons. After I graduated high school here, I went to college for six years. I lived with my parents and had jobs and friends and stuff, but I hate Maine. After my first year at the daycare, I realized it wasn't for me, so I started debating going back for my bachelor's degree in education. I mean, I already had my associates in general sciences and English and math. That sounds like a lot of debt is what it sounds like, Clary. My lips quirked into a grim smile, and I shook my head again. I moved to Maine three days after graduation, so by the time I felt I was ready to go, emotionally, I mean, I was already a resident. It was really hard on me after you went into the Navy. I used to go visit your grandparents all the time, but... A pang struck my chest, and I sighed as pain glistened in Luca's expression. I don't know, I guess a part of me realized that it wouldn't last forever. I don't think I ever expected it to last as long as it did, but I knew that when this separation did end, I needed to be ready. I needed to be put together, my life, so, yeah, if I was going to get anything done, it had to be while you were gone. Reaching across the table once again, Luca held my hand tight and I smiled as a pleasant sensation ripped through my chest. So, everything wasn't for naught. It was important. That's the important thing, right? We were two functioning adults, with careers and friends and goals. The ends justify the means. Because I had no doubt that I wasn't enough to get Luca through the tragedy of death. He opened his mouth, but his watch started to beep insistently, and I couldn't help my heart sinking at the knowledge that his lunch was almost over. Chapter 20 Luca Flipping through files, I frowned as irritation swept through my chest, and I flopped back in my chair to blow out a hot breath. Rubbing my hands down my face and neck, my palms tingled and I sucked in a sharp breath through clenched teeth. Court had gone great. That kid was scared shitless, but that was his problem. I sat the entire time, watching him beat back tears while Martin nailed his coffin. My phone pinged shrilly, tearing my thoughts off my current predicament, and I frowned as I swiped it off my desk. From Clary. I got my friend's mac and cheese recipe for dinner. Some of my bad mood seeped away, but one glance at the time made it fleeting. I still had an hour on the clock to look for this file, and I had a sinking feeling that I wasn't going to find it. After Mays and my blowout, I wouldn't be surprised if she'd taken it. Typing back a quick reply, I locked my phone as I glanced around my office. The place had cameras before, but Martin had got them all upgraded to improve video quality and audio. When I got back from lunch with Clary, I'd seen the little sign at the receptionist's desk declaring people were being recorded. For a prosecutor's office, having that security was important. We dealt with a lot of scumbags, although it was nothing as bad as Las Vegas. Maybe I just misplaced it in my rush out. Drumming my fingers on my wooden desk, 
I swished my chair side to side as my mumble hung heavy in the air. Pushing myself to my feet, I walked the short distance to the filing cabinet and flicked through the colored tabs. They were all current or recently ended cases, but there was no use not checking. Luca? My head snapped up, and I frowned when Jessica popped her head into my door. There's a girl here for you. She says you were her mom's friend. Did she give a name? All thoughts of that file flew from my mind, and Jessica shook her head as I rushed out of my office. Stalking down the hall, I ignored the curious gazes and practically shoved my co-workers out of the way. Anxiety boiled my blood, as I had a pretty good idea who Jessica was talking about, and my breath hitched when I flung open the security door to the lobby. Esther. She looked so bad, her skin paper-thin and pale where it wasn't black and blue, and her name rolled off my tongue a shaky whisper. Her obvious black eye and split lip shimmered ugly in the bright white lights, and goosebumps pocked my skin. A fire sparked in my gut to engulf my heart and lungs, and she gave me the most pathetic, weak smile as she hugged herself with more strength than she had. Esther didn't greet me. If she so much as sniffled, she'd probably break down, and she was overly aware of the people staring at her. Blinking hard, a horrified gasp lodged in my throat when I realized why she looked particularly gaunt and frail. She'd been scalped. All of her hair was gone, and pink, New patches of skin spotted the short, sparse bristles. Come here, come, come here, come here, honey. My heart thundered furiously, and my quick words couldn't beat my legs as they carried me over to her. Wrapping my arms around Esther's tiny body, I grimaced at her shivering. Tension everywhere. It's okay. Croaking a laugh at my lie, Esther choked on her own tongue, and I took a breath in a futile attempt to stabilize myself. She stunk like piss and blood, the acrid stench of someone when she died and shit herself. There wasn't a single part of me that cared. Okay, okay. Let's go back to my office and you can tell me all about this, this time. Holding an arm around her shoulders, I led Esther to the door and she walked with a noticeable limp favoring her right side. Everyone waiting to see May and Martin watched in pity and curiosity and I nodded at Jessica when she held open the barrier for me. Do you need anything? Pursing my lips thinly, I debated the question as we passed Martin's open office door. He was in the middle of discussing a mutual divorce, but he stopped talking mid-sentence to shoot up with shock and disgust, twisting his features. Sending him a hard look, I only shook my head slightly, and the exchange took no longer than four short steps. Uh, no, just... I got this handled. I appreciate it, though. She sort of lagged back, but didn't stop following us, and I trained my eyes on along the way to my office before glancing over my shoulder. I actually, can, can you run around the corner and pick up some things for me? I'll write you a list. Of course. Finally reaching my office, I led Esther inside as I silently debated my options. I'd gotten her a whole new identity, a new look, a new life, and her piece-of-shit stepfather still found her. Sitting her down on the sofa, I walked around my desk to grab my pad and pen and scribble down some basic items. My hands shook 
from my muted rage, and I fished my wallet out of my pocket to hand Jessica a large bill. Also, scrawling a note and tearing off a corner of the list page, I folded it up and cast Jessica a stern glance. Give this to the cashier. They'll know what to do. Jessica, don't open it. Uh, okay. Frowning at her dubious answer, I handed her the list and the cash, and she nodded more firmly. I, I won't open it. Good. Passing over the note, my eyes narrowed as Jessica scurried off and shut the door behind her, and my frown deepened into a grimace. Walking around my desk to turn a chair, I sat down to clasp my hands together and brace my forearms on my knees. Esther looked like she was going to pass out, now that she was finally safe, and I wondered whether or not questioning her would be a good idea. Esther, how did he find you? I don't know. I did everything you said, Luca. Her rasping voice gyrated painfully against my eardrums, and my eyelid twitched at the hopelessness that rampaged across her thin face. I came home and he... he was there waiting for me. I tried to run away, but... How did you get all the way back to Nevada? I sent you to Washington, D.C. I need to contact Arthur and get fresh papers for her again. This time, I was keeping Esther close, or I could actually do something if her stepfather showed up. She was quiet for what seemed like forever, and I held my breath until she parted her busted lips. I escaped, and I went to the airport and they gave me a ticket here. I told them you were my mom's Navy buddy, gave them all your information. Th there were some cops waiting in Reno for me who drove me here. The cop, was his name Tony? She nodded dully, and I exhaled in relief as my nails dug into the fleshy parts between my knuckles. Okay, that's good. He's a good guy, and he knows when to stay out of things. I'm going to call my doctor friend, okay? I'm going to get some food in you, patch you up, and I'll take you somewhere safe, Esther. Okay. Pushing myself up, I swiped my phone off my desk to dial Anthony's number because it just seemed faster than searching for his contact. Keeping one eye on Esther, I covered my mouth with my palm to squeeze my jaw. She was only 16 years old. I mean, she was no Elizabeth, which was great, but... I'm already here. Tony called me already. I'm getting in the elevator now. I texted Carson to bring Ruddy. He should be here soon. Hanging up before I could get a word in, Anthony's declarations eased some of the tensions buzzing through my body. Ruddy loved women. He was particularly good with women who'd been abused. Sure, he'd killed that FBI agent, but he was a good goddamn dog. Buck, okay. Blowing out a hot breath, I rocked back on my heels as I ran my hands over my head. Twisting to face Esther fully, my eyes narrowed as her head bobbed dangerously. Striding over to take her shoulders in my palms, the hairs on my arms stood up when she jumped. It's okay now, Esther. Just lay down. I'll handle this. Chapter 21 Clarissa. Come on, Cookie. Leaping out of my car, Cookie headed for the doors to the lobby before I could even get a hold of her leash. Balancing a Tupperware container in one arm, I pushed open the door and snatched her leash before she could bolt inside. Anxiety curdled in my gut on the way to the elevator, and I jabbed the button relentlessly, which, for its credit, the doors slid open immediately. Okay, okay, just take a few breaths. 
It'll be okay, whatever it is. Luca's cryptic text about an emergency in his office made me sick to my stomach to read, and I took huge, stabilizing breaths on my way up to the fourth floor. The atmosphere in his office was toxic, setting my lungs on fire the second the metal doors cracked open. Walking up to the receptionist window, I opened my mouth, but she just stood up and walked away to open the door for me. This way. She patted Cookie's head as we passed the threshold, and I followed her to a closed door about halfway down the hallway. Knocking quietly, the only answer she received was a grunt, and I held my breath as apprehension flooded my system. The barrier flung open, and Luca's stressed-out expression twisted my heart when he scowled at her, not even noticing me. What, Sonia? Gulping down the dense lump in my throat, I took a half a breath before the stench of urine curled my nostril hairs. Cookie nosed up to Luca, and his eyes snapped down to narrow before following the leash up to me. Oh, Clary, baby, I, I told you to leave that at the... A sharp, shrill cry cut Luca off, and he whirled around as Sonia blanched noticeably. Without a glance at me, she walked back the way we'd come, and I poked my head in the door. But immediately, I wished I hadn't. I'm almost done, Esther. Just breathe. A couple more stitches, and I'll be done with your face. I dropped the leash in shock, and Cookie crawled on her belly toward the plain, gray sofa that everyone was crowded around. Just stay still for me. She was just a kid, so tiny, surrounded by grown men, and my heart broke in two for her as she practically strangled a huge pit bull against her. My knees trembled and cracked when they bent, and I shut the door again as Anthony, or who I assumed was Anthony, stitched up her ruined, swollen face. The massive dog didn't seem to care about how hard she had a hold of him, her nails buried in his fleshy jowls, and her knees digging into his sides. He just sat there, stoic, with his head resting against her thigh. Oh, my God. My whisper was loud in the room, and Luca and Carson's eyes snapped to me. Cookie wormed her way on the sofa, curling around Esther's back to lick her elbow, and I covered my mouth with my free hand. What happened? Clary, this is really not the time to explain. I felt stupid even as Luca walked over to my burden before I dropped it, and he cupped my face to force my gaze to his. I told you to leave it at the, re the reception desk for a reason. I'll listen next time. Nodding furiously, I pursed my lips thinly, and Luca squeezed my cheeks together before releasing me. Do you need anything, Luca? Nothing you can do right now, baby. My wide, achy eyes inevitably went back to Esther, and Luca leaned on his desk as her body jerked from the stab of a needle. She cried uncontrollably, and my chest tightened as regret clung to my ribs like sticky tar. I'll definitely, definitely listen next time. She should go to the hospital, Luca. If she did, you'll just find her again. They wouldn't let her leave, either, because she's underage. Anthony can fix anything that's wrong with her right here. This was clearly not the optimal setting to be doing this kind of thing, and displeased thickened Luca's sharp words. I can't believe this is happening again. I thought she would be fine with the identity Arthur gave her. Guys, we have a problem. Anthony spoke up rather calmly considering, and 
My heart skipped a beat as he held out Esther's leg straight. Her ankle is broken, and I have to set it. I really think we should bring her to the clinic at this point. Broken? Like, broken? Broken? Isn't she made it all the way here from D.C.? On it? Luca rubbed the back of his neck as he started to pace furiously, and I was struck with the sudden, startling realization of exactly how much things had changed in the past fifteen years. I'll fucking kill him, I swear to fucking God. Luca, calm down, okay? Esther's stepfather isn't the issue right now. It's been three years since you sent her to D.C. to live with your aunt, and at the very least... You've got a couple of weeks before he manages to track her down again, so just take some breaths. Go outside if you have to. Fuck you, Anthony. Anthony only frowned under tightly knit brows at Luca's snarl, and I reached over to touch his arm. Luca jerked away like he'd been burned, and I struggled a reassuring smile. Clary, oh, I forgot you were here. Shit. Do you want to go outside and get some air? Uncertainty wavered his bright eyes, and I took his hand gingerly to tug insistently. Luca? If anyone that's not me walks through that door, Carson. Ruddy will handle it, Luca. Got your back, man. Carson cracked a grim smirk, and I pursed my lips thinly as clamminess sunk my cheeks. The dogs are getting along at least. Come on. Grasping Luca's hand more firmly, I tangled our fingers and he only looked over his shoulder as I guided him out of his office. His stiffness zinged at my arm and I pursed my lips as I debated what to do next. The building was ten stories high, so the fastest way out would be down, but the calmest area was the roof. This was most certainly not how I expected this day to go, and I sighed heavily through my nose. We'll go to the roof. Mumbling more to myself on the way towards the waiting room, I nodded absently. We reached the elevator in the time it took to blink, and I held my breath as the doors slid open with only the slightest grating of metal. Luca, who is that? Turning to him to pose my question, I tensed when Luca wrapped his arms around me to squeeze tightly. His short, sharp breaths ruffled my hair as his nose buried in my crown. But I didn't question him further. Whoever this girl was, she was very important to him. That much was clear. She was obviously way too old to be his daughter, but way too young to be of romantic interest. Her name is Esther. She's the daughter of my best friend from the Navy, Marissa. The elevator jostled its way up six floors slowly, and my heart lurched at Luca's coarse grumbling. Marissa was killed three years ago by her husband, and I was one of the attendants on the case prosecuting him. Since she was military, it was easy for him to claim self-defense. She had a history of outbursts and PTSD, so he walked. Is that the real reason you came back? Kneading his powerful sides as the muscles strained, I pursed my lips when Luca didn't really answer, not that he needed to. When Tyler got back from being kidnapped or whatever... We'd just lost the case. I was here to get a new identity for Esther from Sammy's brother-in-law, and I shipped her out to the coast to live with my aunt. There was no way that bastard should have found her, and she was doing so good. She was in the accelerated program at college, had friends, the whole shebang. My aunt and I have no contact, and I told her that if anything like this happened, not to contact me because... Esther knew not to come back to Nevada. I would handle it, but seeing her like this. It's okay to be overwhelmed, Luca. 
Are you taking her back to your apartment? Leaning back to heave a gasping sigh, Luca shook his head as he leaned heavily on the railing. Where is she going? Carson will take her in. He's collecting quite the menagerie of lost, broken little girls. I had no friggin' clue what that meant, but didn't ask about it when the elevator gave a shrill ping. Casting his eyes firmly on me, Luca blinked back redness and water, and I held out my hand for him as the doors slid open. Chapter 22 Luca Does this happen often because of the... Trailing off, uncertainly, Clary frowned as I stretched my legs long, and I leaned back on the cool, shadowed pavement where the stairs popped out of the top of my office building. No, this has nothing to do with that, Clarissa. Esther was just a tiny little baby when Marisa joined the Navy. I was two years her senior, and I wasn't doing too well because of Jason and you and everything. And she wasn't doing well either, so we just kind of stuck to each other. We kept in close contact until her death, and Esther and I, my lips twisted in distaste, and Clarissa watched me with a morbid interest painting her pretty rounded face. I will always have her back. Does he know who you are? Shaking my head, I flopped my head to the side as my heart slowly began to stabilize. What if he comes after her? I already said, Clary. I'll kill him. Staring her dead in the face, I gauged Clarissa's reaction through narrowed eyes. Anxiety nodded my gut, and I held my breath as she gasped in horrified shock. I've done it before. I will do it again. I won't get caught and I won't feel bad. Clary didn't seem disgusted, but her lips parted farther in surprise at the coldness in my tone. Apparently, things had changed a lot more in the past fifteen years than either of us had initially realized. Clasping my hands tightly in my lap, I resisted the urge to just bang my head against the wall. At lunch, Everything had been going swimmingly, and now. I think when, when we got home, we, we need to have a serious discussion. Clenching my jaw, I only nodded, and Clarissa sighed heavily as she hugged her knees just a foot in front of me. Some of the color returned to her face, and my ribs weren't crushing my heart and lungs anymore, so that was good. Those were good signs. So, do you think Esther's stepdad will follow her here? I honestly couldn't say. The guy's not exactly a textbook dickwad, you know. I'd bet my money that he stumbled up on Esther by accident and shot his shot. My mind turned to Cody for the first time in a long time. He was still off interviewing the worst of the worst, as he'd been doing for a few years now. Every so often, Anthony would get a call and we'd all get updated on the newest, most fascinating person on death row. It'll be fine. I just never expected to see Esther again, and it was... Let's take a few more minutes before we go back downstairs, okay? Rolling my jaw... I licked my teeth as Clary's soothing voice washed the tension from my body. The hot, dry air that filled my lungs kept my anger alive, barely, and I trained my gaze on her firmly. Above us, the sun was still hours from setting, and Clarissa ran her hands through her bright, luscious hair to rest her cheek on her knees. You know, Luca, it's been a long day. Well, 
a long past hour or so. Esther is safe now. I know it's hard to look past it when she's right in front of you, but everything will be okay. She huffed, like she couldn't believe what she was saying, and I frowned darkly. It's hypocritical of me, considering the most traumatic experience I've ever had can't compare, but there's always a silver lining. Yeah, I was afraid that Ruddy would attack Cookie. I think this is the best situation for them, at least. Did I really want to explain the enigma that was Ruddy? Not really. Ruddy's very territorial. His owner, Elizabeth, found him in a trash bag. God, he must be around three, maybe four years old now. Anyway, she's super messed up, so Ruddy developed accordingly. He goes after anyone he doesn't like, and the only man he'll listen to is Carson. Yeah, I kind of got that when I saw Esther basically strangling him while Anthony stitched up her face. Honestly, Ruddy looks like a dog you don't want to mess with. Nodding absently, I took deep breaths and I held up my hands to find that they'd thankfully stopped shaking. I always wanted a dog, but I was going to school full time and my parents didn't want the responsibility. When I was working in Las Vegas, I barely had time to sleep, let alone take care of something else. I... A heavy metal door to the roof popped open to cut me off, and I glanced over as Martin emerged with a cigarette hanging from his mouth. Pursing my lips as they twisted, I just kept my mouth shut. There was no apology that I could utter that would ease this situation. My boss had twenty years on me, had seen a lot of shit, and we both knew that it never got easier. Sparking up, he leaned heavily on the wall to slide down to crouch, and he cast me a weary side glance through narrowed brown eyes. You're paying to replace that couch, Luca, and the cleaners that I'm going to have to call to get rid of the smell. Nodding silently, I clutched my jaw hard, and Martin blew out a thick, toxic breath as he propped one forearm on his knee. What kind of backlash can I expect from this? It's not every day a beaten teenager comes crawling into my office. Esther's a Navy brat, Martin. They know where to go when they need help. I'll keep her out of your hair. But I was just telling Clary, I don't think her stepfather will come after her again. I think he stumbled on her by accident. Taking a drag as I answered, Martin grunted quietly and I reached to rub my jaw and neck roughly. If he rightly assumes she went to her mom's Navy buddies, he won't bother. I have a feeling that you're the least dangerous of your friends, Luca. My eyebrow twitched at his slow declaration, and Martin frowned as he exhaled smoke through his nose. You're lucky I want to make you my partner, otherwise I'd fire you for this. Yeah, well, if... Tony called me rather than just dropping her off here. I could have been a little more discreet about this whole thing. Carson will take her home when Anthony doses her up. He just needs her awake to know she feels the pain. My phone chimed insistently, and I fished it out of my pocket to lick my lips heavily at the name flashing on the screen. Answering the call... I held the speaker to my ear, and there was a slight, awkward pause before I spoke up. Arthur, hey, you got my message. Yes, I did. Sammy's on his way now from Las Vegas to pick up the stuff. There's absolutely no way the identity I gave Esther would have failed, Luca. I made it special, pulled out all the stops. Arthur's so damn cringy. His voice was higher than usual because of his stress, and I grimaced as he sighed sharply. The identity didn't fail, Arthur. Calm down. Esther's stepfather is a marshal, remember? 
There's every possibility that he just saw her somewhere in D.C. Relax. Take a couple breaths. The seconds ticked by like minutes, and I glanced over at my boss to find him studiously staring between his knees at the floor. Were you able to track him down? Yeah, I mean, of course. That's easy. I was able to hack into a laptop at, caf at a cafe he was at at lunch earlier. According to that, he has no plans on leaving D.C., but I don't know who he was talking to on the phone. Whoever it was, he was talking about Esther running back and that he had no intention of going after her because, and I quote, those Navy bastards are too much of a hassle. Okay. Keep an eye out for him, for me, Arthur. I owe you one. Arthur snorted at that, and I felt a whole hell of a lot better than I had just a few minutes ago. Hanging up without another word, I dropped my phone into my lap to glance between the two people sitting next to me, listening to everything that was said. Chances are, he really won't come after her. Arthur's really good at his job. The guy wouldn't have known he was being listened in on. I'm going to pretend I never heard any of that, okay? As long as there's no more little lost girls that come looking for you, Luca, I'm going to sweep this under the rug. There won't be a second chance. I like you. I want to work with you. But I can't have this shit happening. Standing up, Martin flicked his cigarette off the roof, and I followed suit hastily to nod. It won't happen again, sir. I had to physically stop myself from saluting before Martin turned on his heel and stalked off down the stairs. Heaving a massive sigh when the door closed, I crossed my arm and cupped my chin as I slowly turned back to Clarissa. She closed her eyes, pinching the bridge of her nose with a hard sigh of her own, and a guilty smile stretched my lips while she climbed to her feet. Chapter 23 Clarissa. Huffing as the bed dipped, I hugged my pillow tighter, and Luca walked around to my side to kiss my cheek. Stroking my hair, he mumbled something about getting in the shower, but I clung to my peaceful sleep with a vice grip. My cheek tingled when he smiled, and he pulled the thin sheet over my head to block out the light. In the back of my mind, I knew why I didn't want to wake up. I don't want to face what happened last night. Esther, Carson, and Ruddy had piled into a beat-up old car that barely ran, but her presence lingered. Luca hadn't slept well, and I peeked out at the clock to frown at the numbers glaring back at me reading 6.44 a.m., he wasn't going to work out this morning, and I sat up to stretch my arms taut and arch in a hard stretch. The stark Nevada summer leaked through the windows in the form of bright sunlight, and I stared blankly at my feet poking up under the sheets. My mind whirred leisurely, and I pursed my lips thinly as I pondered what I was going to do today. Chances were that I'd just overthink. Time would fly by. I still wanted to talk to Luca, but now wasn't exactly the best moment. My lip twitched at that, and I threw my legs over the side of the bed to stand and flex my toes against the carpet. Cookie watched me from her bed, her tail starting to wag, and my palm tingled as I crouched by her to pet her. She rolled onto her belly for scratches, and I couldn't help the relief that sagged my shoulders. Walking to the bathroom, I cracked open the door, and the sound of water hitting tile drummed my ears. My abdomen clenched, and I inhaled a deep, moist lungful of air as I slid my panties down my legs. Luca twisted when I pulled back the plastic curtain, and my heart rate jacked up as I stepped into the shower. Roaming his chest and arms, my eyes widened at how beautiful he was, 
and I rolled my lips between my teeth. Are you okay? Snapping to mine as they trained on his face, Luca's eyes narrowed, and I stepped up to him to palm his muscular sides. He was tense everywhere, and he wrapped an arm over my shoulder as water drenched my hair. I'm not saying I understand, but if you need to talk about it, Luca, I can listen. I appreciate it, baby. Closing my eyes as rives ran down my face, I pressed my cheek to his chest, and Luca kissed my crown and squeezed me gently. I'm sorry, I don't know how to handle what happened yesterday. At least it's happening right now, right? You were up all night. What were you thinking of? I just held Luca. There wasn't much else I could do right now, but... That wasn't enough, it seemed, as he sighed heavily at my probing. Rubbing his sides with my palms, I reached around and up to knead his shoulder blades. I was thinking, I'm so, so lucky that you didn't spend the night at your place, Clarissa. My heart twisted at his mumble, and I gasped when Luca squeezed me more firmly. I wish this didn't happen at all. I wish Esther kept having the life she deserved. I mean, yeah, I did some things that weren't exactly on the straight and narrow to get her there, but she was doing so good, Clary. I was doing so good knowing she was okay, thriving even. But she's okay now, Luca. She'll be safe with Carson. Otherwise, you wouldn't have handed her off to him. Luca hadn't been the only one thinking that last night, and I glanced up as he relaxed a little against my chest. You're not worried about that. It's something else, isn't it? For a long time, Luca was quiet, but I didn't press him for an answer as I stroked his back in long sweeps. Without my heels, he was so much taller than me that my head didn't even reach his chin and his jaw ticked before he nodded curtly. I never wanted you to see that side of me, Clarissa. That's why I never contacted you when I got back from the Navy. I wasn't okay. Seeing Esther, seeing her brought it all back. My heart throbbed for him, and the obvious strain in his voice, and I lifted myself on my tiptoes to touch my lips to his. Luca tensed before relaxing with a heavy sigh, and I cupped his face in my hands as his arm slid down to my waist. The passion in his kiss as it deepened blew me away, and I opened my mouth for his sweet invasion. Luca's tongue danced against mine, and he cupped the back of my head as a moan built in my throat. The taste of him was intoxicating, wiping away all the terrible things going on inside us from the night before. I loved all of you before, Luca, and I can love this part of you too. Murmuring softly, my moan broke through as Luca gripped my butt and shuffled until my back pressed against the warm tiles. Hoisting my feet off the floor, he wrapped my legs around his waist and my nails dug into his shoulders. The water became cold compared to the heat raging inside me, and our kiss turned ravenous as he ground against my core. Clary. Spreading my butt cheeks with needy palms, Luca groaned my name and shivers raced up and down my spine. The thick ridge of the head of his cock flicked my nub with each sensual tilt of his hips, but he didn't try to enter me. Losing myself in his kiss, I savored his taste and swallowed his gasp when the friction parted my folds. Oh, yes, Luca. Leaning back, Luca's lips assaulted my neck, 
and I arched into his mouth as it veered towards my breast. His teeth grazed my pocked skin, and he sucked on the swell of the tight globe as the length of his cock pulsed against my entrance. Ducking to claim my nipple, he nibbled and sucked gently, and shocks skittered down to coil in my belly. Fuck! My ankles dug into the small of Luca's back when one palm suddenly left my butt, and I moaned gutterly. His body shivered with his need, and his fingers circled my nub furiously to force me higher. Pants morphed into breathless gasps, and he bit down on my inner breast as he thrust sharper. Yes, yes, Luca. Oh, good. It's so, so good. Frantic whispers squeezed out of me behind the lump in my throat, and Luca groaned into the valley between my breasts. Rolling my nub between his fingers, he set off my release as his cock rippled and his skin bristled against my folds. Clamping down on nothing, I held my breath against the pressure that built behind my eyes. His strangled grunts and gasps slithered between his teeth, and his hips snapped back before hot, sticky ropes clung my thighs. Shivering, struggling to breathe, I flopped my head forward to cradle Luca's against my breast, and he exhaled to sink into me. A tickle of a sensation crept up on me. How strange it was that we hadn't had sex yet. I'd hoped, beyond hope, in the pink fog of my mind, that it wouldn't take months like it had when we were teenagers. Clary. Humming softly, I shook my pesky thoughts away as Luca tilted his head to capture my mouth, and a whimper of delight floated between us. There's no rush, baby. I know. Cracking my eyes open, I couldn't help but smile at the peaceful expression on his face, and I reached to stroke the back of his head soothingly. I don't think I'm rushing. I just want you to know you're not the only one that grew up. We'll go on a date. Even as the beautiful moment ebbed away, Luca didn't set me on my feet, and I arched a brow as his lips quirked up. A twinkle brightened his eyes, and he rolled his bottom lip between his teeth before nodding more at his own suggestion. I want to take you out, and this time I wanted to ask my gramps for money. A surprised giggle escaped me at that, and his smile widened when I only nodded quietly. Kissing my lips quickly, passionately, Luca eased one of my legs down and then the other, and I hung on to him as my knees wobbled dangerously. You're going to have to if you don't get going, Luca. Suddenly, it became easier to breathe, and I didn't take offense at all when Luca rushed out of the shower. Leaning on the wall, I reached to peel my sopping wet hair over my shoulder and a pleasant feeling engulfed my entire body. I could do this every day, definitely, and no drama was going to get in my way. Chapter 24 Luca You're absolutely positive she'll be okay in this thing, right, Luca? Nodding as I fastened Cookie's harness a little more snugly, I glanced up as Clarissa eyeballed the saddle extension Carson had ordered for me. I don't know. What if she falls out? She'll be fine, baby. We'll go slow. Clary didn't answer, and I picked Cookie up and set her in what was essentially a cushioned milk crate. She sniffed around but didn't seem too nervous while I clipped the multiple buckles that would hold her in place. Ruddy had been riding all his life, so he just had a seat extension, but I'd rather be safe than sorry with Cookie. Ready? Lowering herself, 
Cookie found a comfortable spot. The crate wasn't very big, so she had to crouch diagonally in it. I was fairly confident that once she got the hang of riding, she'd be able to sit up, and I nodded to myself. Turning to Clary, I couldn't help but smile, and affection washed my ribs thickly as I held out my hand. It's okay. Trust me. The last time we did this, Luca, you went from zero to eighty in like two seconds, okay? So forgive me if I'm a little skeptical. My smirk widened as she huffed, and Clarissa took my hand to swing her leg over the back of the bike. She straddled the saddle like a pro, and pride flushed my veins while she tucked her plain lavender dress underneath her. Fixing my helmet onto her head, I ran my palm down her thick braid, and she pulled down the visor before I climbed into the saddle in front of her. We were just going to the park around the corner. It was late enough in the evening that the parking lot should be pretty empty. Jacking the throttle, I held out my elbows as lean fingers caressed my chest, and I glanced over my shoulder absently. Cookie's ears were low, her eyes wide with apprehension, but she didn't look like she'd try to jump out of her seat. Slow and easy, girl. It's okay. Walking out of my space, I didn't rev the engine as Cookie cowered a little. By no means did I expect this to be easy, but it was going better than I thought it would, at the very least. Stopping at the lip of the small lot, I glanced around before easing the throttle. We only drove fast enough not to fall over, and prickles raced under my skin from the desire to just burst out. Every time I looked back, Cookie seemed a little more stable and surer of the situation, and I bit back a grin when her ears flopped forward. The sun cast a dark gold across the buildings around us, but they gave way when I turned right to head for the park. Just as I had hoped, there were not many cars and most of them were parked up against the sidewalk rather than closer to the road. Do you remember the first time we went on a night ride? Speaking loudly to be heard over my motorcycle, Clarissa drew my attention as I leisured towards the empty part of the lot. I think about it a lot, how quiet and peaceful it was. I mean, it was until I brought you home at 5 a.m. and your dad beat the shit out of me. Smiling at the memory, I shook my head as Clary tightened her arms around me and her breasts squished against my back when she sucked in a sharp breath. So worth it, though. That night ride was the first time I worked up the courage to touch your breast. He did not beat the shit out of you, Luca. He just punched you, okay? Barking a laugh at Clarice's chiding, a tingle shot through my jaw and neck, and I sped up as we took a wide turn. We weren't supposed to be gone so long anyway, and you knew it. 11 p.m., isn't very early, and if we didn't, if I didn't get distracted with my face between your legs, we would have made it back on time. I could feel the heat radiating from the open visor to scorch my neck, and she squeaked in embarrassment as I sighed fondly. You loved it. Hanging out in the desert on a blanket, writing, I remember, okay? Stop. Chuckling at her squeal, I glanced behind me to find her brilliant eyes narrowed on me, and she dug her fingernails into my sides as penance. Just, just focus on driving, Luca. You know, Clary, I loved you from the second I first saw you. That night was when I realized that I didn't want to live without you. I don't know what the difference is, but it was really eye-opening for me. When Jason died, we'd only been together for six months or so, but 
over the years, I realized that I never worried that you, would be, you wouldn't be waiting for me. An ugliness morphed my face at how selfish I was, and Clarissa's hands smoothed away my chest as we rode around in easy, slow circles. I knew you'd always be there for me. You'd come back. That it was just a matter of time. When I left for the Navy, I knew we'd be together one way or another. Even though I was scared of what you thought of me after I came back, I never stopped hoping that you'd show up in my life again. I do know, Luca. Picking up some speed, I looked back at Cookie and smiled as she looked around, seemingly much more comfortable. The hot air stuck my shirt to my skin as I reached fifteen miles per hour, and Clary rested the side of the helmet against my back. I did everything I did these past seventeen years for you, so you would be proud of me when we met again. Affection gnawed deep into my chest, and I reached to hold her hand as I twisted the throttle gently. Enjoying this moment of closeness, I breathed deep and easy, and we lapsed into a peaceful silence. When I went into work this morning, the cleaners had gotten Esther's stench out of my office, and the sofa had been replaced with the same of a lighter color. Martin briefly questioned me about her, whether she was okay, but didn't really want to get into details. I didn't blame him at all, and the fact of the matter was that Carson was more than equipped to deal with Esther. After all, he had Spot and Elizabeth to help him out. He loved being the hero, and he would always help a woman in need. Carson had always been like that, but Jason's death had really amplified that aspect of him. If he could, he would, maybe, but... It was because he felt like he could have helped Jason, or he needed to make it up to his brother. Plus, there was the added benefit that May had left me alone all day, so there was that. If she so much as glanced in my direction, I would have done more than bruise her ego. Clearing my throat roughly, I sped up a little more to head for the street, and the sun made our shadows long. I think that's long enough for now. Cookie's doing pretty okay. We can do a little more tomorrow. We'd only been driving for about ten minutes, but I was more than happy that Cookie wasn't trying to jump out of her seat. Twisting to look, Clary nodded out of the corner of her eye, and I pulled on to the main road with practiced movements. Is it boring being at my apartment by yourself while I'm at work? Yes, but it's okay. I'm finding things to fill my time. Honestly, though, I can't wait until the summer comes closer to ending so I can get to work myself. The short block whizzed past us as Clarissa answered, and I turned into the driveway of my apartment building to walk to my spot. When the engine cut... Clary climbed off easily, and I kicked down the stand to follow suit. Pulling the helmet off her, I couldn't help but smile at her grin, and I hooked the strap onto the handlebar before getting Cookie unhooked. She wiggled with excitement, and she danced once her paws were firmly on the concrete. You're okay, see? That wasn't so bad, Cookie. Her ears twitched as she pranced around and I wrapped my arm around Clarice's waist to start towards the side door. I'm not going to lie, though. I have the itch now. I haven't gone so slow in... forever. Ever, actually. You can go for a ride if you want. I'm just going to finish the dishes and do some studying, probably. Opening the door for her and Cookie... I bopped my head side to side in thought as I scanned Clary's voluptuous body. 
I think it's a different itch. Chapter 25 Clarissa Do you know how good you look in my jacket? Flames licked up my neck as Luca pulled the zipper of his leathers down and his smir he smirked in a way that I could only describe as sexy. I love being able to squeeze you, Clary. Why do I have a feeling I'm not going to get the dishes done? Shivering when Luca dragged his jacket down my arms, I bit down on my bottom lip and he huffed a wisp of a laugh. If this is about this morning, Luca, I just wanted you to feel better. You're not ob placing a calloused finger to my lips to quiet me. Luca bent to slide an arm under my knees and the other around my back. Cookies lapping at her water bowl drowned out my scope of comprehension as he swept me off my feet, and my need for him coiled in my abdomen. Holding me like I weighed no more than a few feathers, he strode straight back and, uh, and tall across the living room and through the kitchen. It's not about this morning, Clarissa. It's about every morning we didn't have. My breath hitched at the earnestness in Luca's tone, and he set me ever so gently on his bed to anchor himself over me. Seriousness drenched his expression, and I held my breath as he leaned in close to my face. Happiness. It can be snatched away so easily. We spent over half our lives away from each other, Clary, over fifteen years. And why? Because I was too afraid to come after you. I'm not letting another minute get eaten up by being afraid. Luca. Cupping his ticking jaw, I tried to think of something to say, only to come up blank, and I blinked back the sting in my eyes. I am so sorry. Crackling harshly, my whisper brightened the twinkles in Luca's dark eyes, and he rocked on his knees to nuzzle my nose with his. Closing my eyes, I gasped a shuddering, shallow breath, and my lips trembled when he brushed them so faintly. Emotions I hadn't felt since Luca left for the military clogged my throat, and he seemed to struggle with kissing me firmly. His harsh breaths rolled down my neck, and Luca's thighs trembled against mine as we fell into a moment of pure stillness. My heart stuttered, and the pillowcase under my head pulled taut before he captured my mouth with a sweetness that melted my very soul. Cupping his neck, I pulled him down and opened my mouth, and his tongue tangled around mine to slather his taste. Soft whimpers lodged behind the dense lump in my throat, and my knees fell apart in invitation. Luca collapsed atop me, his lips caressing mine so nicely, and my palms glided over his shoulders. His muscles rippled powerfully from behind his shirt, and my fingers tingled as they skirted the collar of his work shirt. Grinding beneath my quivering thighs, his bulge stoked the fire in my abdomen, and my hands trembled as I fiddled with his buttons. There were no words left to say, and Luca shimmied off the fabric without once his lips breaking mine. Air invaded the, the thin space between my skull and my brain, and I moaned softly when he licked the roof of my mouth. Balancing on one elbow, his free hand trailed down my neck, and I arched with a gasp when he pushed down the silky cups of my dress. Wiggling and worming, until my dress pooled at my hips, but couldn't go farther. I unbuckled Luca's belt to slip the leather out of the loops. I didn't have the arm strength to do more in this particular moment as he grabbed my wrists to hold them on either side of my head. Shuffling down, he 
finally broke our kiss, and needy wheezes burst from my mouth as he kissed down my neck. Luca's apartment was so quiet that the blood drumming in my ears had nothing to drown out, and I closed my eyes to savor every tickle of each hair on his chest. His fingers tangled in mine to clutch tight, and he placed hot, open-mouthed kisses over the swell of my bared breasts. The friction between my legs sent shocks down to my toes, and I tilted my hips in sync with his as red invaded the screens behind my eyelids. Clarissa. Goosebumps pocked my skin at his worshipful groan, and Luca nosed the valley between my breasts. Kissing down my belly, he nibbled my fleshy bits with a hungry rumble, and I clenched when he dipped his tongue into my navel. Caressing down my arms, Luca gingerly pulled my dress out from under me, and I cracked open my eyes. Fire raced up my body to fill my face. He looked like he could just die right here and now. Blinking back the water that skewed my vision, I sniffed my suddenly stuffed nose, and he draped himself over me to capture my lips with a grunt. Wait. Jerking back just as fast, panic flashed in Luca's eyes, and my heart leaped into my throat. I don't have any condoms. Are you on the pill, Clary? No, but we don't have to. I'm supposed to get my period in a few days, so we're fine. Uncertainty flooded Luca's orbs, and I frowned under furrowed brows. Would it make you feel better to go get some? Is it all right if I get them in the morning? The question surprised me for some reason, and I nodded dumbly as Luca ran his hand over his buzzed head. I should have thought of it earlier. I'm sorry. Luca. His concern was touching, and I reached out for him to hold him to my chest. Sprawling heavily on top of me, Luca released a heavy sigh, and I kissed his prickly crown gently. It's okay. He didn't respond verbally, only hoisting himself up to capture my lips hard, and a moan bubbled up from deep in my chest. The taste of him washed any other words I could conjure to the back of my mind, and I focused on the feeling of him. Touching my tongue to his, I savored our kiss as he reached between us and the hairs on his knuckles tickled my clit while he unfastened his pants. Greedy palms explored Luca's muscular back, and excitement rippled down my arms as the sinew pulled taut. Tearing his mouth from mine to pant furiously, he shuffled out of his jeans and my eyes flickered down to widen. His cock stood tall, a darker red on the top half, and I quailed as it swung when it kicked his pants off the foot of the bed. Taking my hand, Luca guided my fingers to his throbbing hot skin, and a gasp burst from my tight throat. The silky skin jumped at my touch, and I sucked in a sharp breath as my abdomen clenched. Spreading the thick bead that seeped from his head, I couldn't pinpoint why this time was different. I'd seen him plenty of times in the last few days, but this, this wasn't the same. Clarissa. My gaze blew up, and Luca draped himself over to kiss my lips so sweetly that tears welled in my eyes. I love you, Clary. I love you, Luca. His lips tilted up against mine, and my body moved on its own as my tears beat against the backs of my eye sockets instantly, palming his cock, 
I gulped down harsh breaths, and my heart beat too furiously to work as he positioned himself between my thighs. The bulbous head of his rod pressed against my entrance, and I released him to grab his face with my nails as apprehension curdled my blood. Slowly, gently, Luca thrust, and the head of his cock stretched my entrance as the unfamiliar sensation prickled up my spine. Clenching my jaw, I held my breath in fiery lungs, and his kiss stilled against my thin lips. Easing into my channel, the thick crease of his head caressed my walls, and I grappled for his shoulders senselessly. It feels like it did before, but so, so, so much better. C Clary. Choking on his own voice, Luca gasped when his hips pressed against mine, and a shiver raked my entire body. My knees jerked up under his arms, and I clamped down on his cock as pleasure slammed into my ribs. Oh, God, baby, yes, yes. Craning my neck as my skin came too tight, I whimpered as Luca pulled back to set a slow pace. Arching into his chest, the pressure bearing down on me threatened to crush my bones, and harsh undulations twisted my abdomen. Goosebumps blanketed my skin, and Luca's groan echoed in my ears as he ducked into my neck. Licking and sucking my sweat-slickened skin, Luca's cock filled my channel again and again, and I drowned in the rapture of it. It was like... It was like... It was like a religious fever during Mass, when the old church with no air conditioning was so hot that the fanatics started to hallucinate. Sweat dripped down my neck and between my breasts, and an urge prickled my tongue that I couldn't fight. Kissing Luca's shoulder, I licked the thick layer of the salt off, and my taste buds set alight. Propping himself up on shaky arms, Luca plunged deep into my depths, and my eyes rolled even as his locked onto my face. His harsh pants dried the sweat accumulating between my breasts, and his short, sharp grunts bounced around inside my skull. My lips parted in a silent scream of utter euphoria, and he ground his hips against mine with a low, guttural groan. Fuck. Luca jerked his hips back, and my eyelids flew open to catch his expression contorting in pleasure. Through glazed eyes, I couldn't see anything but how beautiful he was. His perfect lips parted, and a tiny crease between his eyebrows... It was enough to push my tears off my eyelashes. The muscles in his neck strained, and the vein in his forehead popped to throb wildly. Hot, sticky ropes lassoed to my thigh, but I barely felt the burn when he caught my eyes under heavy hoods. Chapter 26 Luca Pulling up to Carson's house to find Sammy's bike and Anthony's car already in the driveway, excitement zinged up my arms even after I cut the engine. My bike calmed, and I kicked out the stand before Clary climbed off to unhook Cookie from her harness. I don't know, Luca. I mean, I've never been allowed to come to this thing before. I don't see why I can now. She'd been complaining so much that I wondered if she just didn't want to go, and I cast Clarissa a pointed look. Flushing red as she set Cookie on the ground, she smoothed her floral knee-length dress in the short moment of silence. I'm just saying. It'll be fine. 
Tyler and his girlfriend are going to be here. And there's Elizabeth, Spot, and Esther. You were never allowed to come before because we didn't want you getting bored and trying to hang out with us. No offense. Smiling when Clary shook her head, I headed towards the front door rather than pick my way through Carson's garage. Besides, you're a much better cook than Sammy. Just because Sam's the best cook out of all you guys, pointing at me to circle her fingers, Clarissa frowned as my grin widened. It doesn't mean he's good. Okay? You should all know how to cook, okay? It's important. He's gotten way better on the grill, you know. She didn't care about my defense, and I pushed open the door only to pause at the sight that met me. Elizabeth, Spot, and Esther were all sitting on the sofa, staring, crying into the bowls of snacks. They were watching some telenovela, and I had to do a double take when I saw the television their eyes were glued to. Carson didn't have that big a fucking television when I was here last week. Esther's ankle was wrapped in a full cast, but her crutches were nowhere to be seen as she pulled her uninjured leg up to hug her knee under her chin. I didn't have more than a second to take in this extremely weird sight, though, and uh, I frowned deeply at the smell that wafted into my nostrils. What happened between Wednesday and today? Amaya ignored me as she rushed out of the kitchen with a fresh bowl of popcorn, and I wondered where Carson had gotten all these damn bowls. Following the sounds of Sammy and Carson shit-talking each other, I emerged into the back while Clary hung in the living room. Spot, Clary, and Esther were fluent in Spanish. I wasn't sure about Amaya, though. Guys, Where'd you get that big-ass TV? What'd I miss? Carson shoved Sam clear off the deck stairs before I posed my question, and he frowned at me over his broad shoulder. What happened to your living room? They get bored easily. My brows jacked up as I barked a surprised laugh, and Carson sauntered over to me with a shrug. At least I'm not policing them anymore. Spot and Amaya don't get along at all. They're not best buds. Coming up on Carson, Sammy wiped his hands up his face with a sly grin and elbows his best friend playfully. But that's okay because they're not arguing if they're eyeball deep in a romance novel. Okay. The fact of the matter was that I hadn't really noticed the girls squabbling. I was always too busy arguing with Anthony over who was better at dragsters. Anyway, I'm starving. Let's light up the grill. Tyler's bringing pizzas. My brows rose higher, and Carson shrugged absently. He offered to pay for it, so I told him to go for it. Everything's changing, huh? You're being forced to grow up on Saturdays? Wandering to a chair, I dropped heavily to stretch out my legs, and I took a hot, hard breath to sigh. I want to ask Clary to move in with me. Have you talked to Arthur yet about Esther? Shaking my head, I propped my arm underneath as I thought on that subject. Esther's stepfather was a marshal. If what he did to her came out... He'd have one hell of a time. I got no problem with her staying here, Luca, but not if it's going to become an issue. It won't, Carson, and even if it does, I'll handle it. Arthur will call me if anything changes. Where's Anthony at? I saw his car in the driveway. Changing the subject with no tact, I was met with quiet, but I didn't push the issue. Saturdays were our days to be the kids we couldn't be, but it was inevitable that we'd have to grow up at some point. 
sad as that was, I couldn't exactly complain. We were 33 years old, and even one day was going to whittle away into memories. I'm surprised you haven't asked her already. For Clary to move in with you, I mean. Seems kind of pointless to be renting a place if she's at yours all the time. I only grunted at that, and Sammy dropped into the chair next to mine to cross his ankles and pull off his shirt. Amaya just kept leaving shit in my apartment until it became our house. Honestly, though, ever since she got that stint in Vegas, it's been boring as fuck at home. I'm glad that Benny's got her doing her, doing her all that shit and she doesn't get on my ass anything, but... Ruddy loves the attention, though. He didn't even come up with me this time. Scowling at the sky, I chuffed softly, and Sammy chuckled at my complaining. I'm not gonna lie. I've been thinking about Marissa a lot. She seemed so smart, you know. How could she marry that dick? Neither you nor Esther have said his name. What is it? Discomfort lodged deep in my chest, and I reached to rub the spot as Carson leaned on the railing with a cigarette between his lips. It's Jason. His name is Jason. The air became uncomfortably hot and heavy, and I blew out a breath as Carson, in particular, struggled with my revelation. It was the strangest thing, going after him in court. Believe it or not, but I've never prosecuted anyone named Jason before, and it was really hard. After the trial was over and he walked, I decided that it was time to come back. As long as you're confident that Esther's stepfather won't try her again, I don't mind having her here. What about you, Luca? Are you okay that she's here? I barked a harsh laugh at that, and Carson took a deep drag of his smoke before offering it to me. The toxic lungful I inhaled felt good coupled with this topic, and I took a long moment to think as I held my breath. I never wanted to see her again. If I ever did, it was because something bad happened, I think. Esther just made me really aware that things can change. Our past can catch up to us even after we thought we were clear of it. Like, Spot hasn't got her old bike back. Tyler still doesn't ride more than twice a week. And that's only because Sophie makes him. The things we do have consequences, Carson. The things we don't do have consequences. Taking a second drag, I handed the butt back to him and he grunted absently. I think you should ask her, Luca. It's not like you guys were never destined to be together anyway. You spent 15 years apart. Just fuck it. Humming softly, I exhaled through my nose, and Sammy tilted his head to shoot me a shit-eating grin. We weren't sure you'd even know what day it was to come by today. Hey, guys. Twisting, as Anthony ambled onto the porch, I offered a wave as he sat down a huge cooler no doubt filled with beers. I brought the beer. I'm fucking starving. Those wretched women are eating all the snacks. Where's Ruddy and Cookie? Was no one going to answer my questions today? Anthony ignored me to toss out beer bottles and I scowled darkly. Dude, relax. They're humping it out in the hallway. Your dog is fine. Rolling my eyes, I didn't bother to respond to that, and Anthony giggled like a little boy. I think Ruddy really likes Cookie. He's not trying to kill her, at least. You're a fucking idiot, my dude. Seriously. Chapter 27 Luca Parking in my usual spot, I pulled off my helmet, feeling better than I had in a long time. Well, not a long time, but it's been a week since the whole issue with Esther, so the office is back to normal. People that dealt with the despicable constantly had thick skin, and I swung my keys around my finger as I walked to the stairs. Today, 
I was going to take Clary on a nice date and ask her to move in with me. I just needed to make it through the workday. No cookie today? Sonia was waiting for the elevator when I shuffled through the door, and I shook my head as she pouted in disappointment. It's always a better day when she comes in. I like her more than you, Luca. I don't blame you. She's a great dog. She winked her blue eyes at me as I passed and headed for the stairs, and I shirked off my jacket on the way down. Monday and Tuesday had gone splendidly. There was no reason Wednesday would be any different. After Saturday, there seemed to be a settling down now that everyone was around each other. Of course, Tyler and Sophie didn't show up, so Anthony had to get the grill food. We made Carson pay for it all, since it was his fault for trusting Tyler in the first place. Not once in 18 years did Tyler show up to a Saturday get-together, and that hadn't changed. Shuffling down the congested sidewalk the short distance to my building, I broke out of the crowd waiting for the elevator to take the stairs once again. Not a soul followed me, but I didn't mind as my footfall echoed up the concrete walls. Twirling my keys as I punched in the security code to my floor, I popped open the door to the waiting room to find it empty. The firm didn't open for another half an hour, and I swiped my key card to get into the offices. In such a quiet space, the shrill beep rang in my ears, and I walked into my office to hang up my leather jacket on one peg and my suit jacket on another. I never found that file I misplaced, though. Dropping heavily into my chair, I booted up my computer and drummed my fingers as I watched the screen flicker. It wasn't majorly important, and I can just draw it up again in, like, an hour, but... But I'm really sure I didn't actually misplace it. My brows drew together as the logo displayed and the loading bar filled white, and I exhaled heavily through my nose. No one but Martin and May could get into my office, and he wouldn't just take the file without telling me. You're in early, Luca. Glancing up as a frown tugged down my lips, my eyes narrowed into tight points as May sauntered into my office. Her hair hung flat over her shoulders, as it always did, but for some reason it looked particularly dead today. Too much flat ironing and blonde hair dye. I come in at this time every day, May. What do you want? She perched on my desk next to me, flaunting her long legs as she crossed her knees, and I swiveled away from her shooting me the most unconvincing, innocent expression, May reached to caress my arm as her eyes flooded with fake sympathy. My skin crawled, but I refused to show her just how uncomfortable she made me. This was all a game to her, and there was no way she'd get me to play. I just want to make sure you're okay. Last week was really rattling stroking up my bicep as she spoke. May hooked two long fingers under my collar, and I pursed my lips thinly. Are you okay, Luca? Take your hand off me, or I'll break it. Grinding the demand out through clenched teeth, I glared hotly and a savage satisfaction raced up my spine when May hesitated. I couldn't figure out her motive. Was she just so used to getting what she wanted that my denying her was maddening? Did she think I'd give in if she was persistent enough? May wanted to fuck me, nothing more. She wanted leverage, and power and sex would give her that. You're so tense. My eyelid twitched at her mumble, 
and May's dull brown eyes darkened into muddy pools under half-hooded lids. Her fingers flittered over my shoulder, and she leaned over until her face was only a foot from mine. Do I make you uncomfortable? In the sense that you're disgusting, yes. Truth rang quickly in my tone, and I'd never seen a woman become so enraged so fast as May did in that moment. Her palm left me as if I'd burned her, but in that same second came flying towards my face, backhanding me hard enough to turn my face to make my chair squeak. Her heat rolled off her like a furnace, and I reached to rub my jaw absently. How dare you! The strange sensation of an impact without pain skittered down my neck, and May straddled me in my chair. For a second, I let her think she had the upper hand, and she gripped my chin until her French nails dug into my jaw. Forcing me to her eyes, she rubbed against me with her bag-of-bones body, and my anger slowly started to flood my chest. I've been nice to you, Luca. Shut up already with the power trip, okay? It's boring. Drawling as I cut her off, which only seemed to irritate May more, I pushed her off me roughly. She went tumbling to the floor, her heel catching on the armrest of my chair. Pushing myself to my feet, I stood over her until she climbed to hers just as quickly with an ugliness in her expression that made me sick to my fucking stomach. I'll give you one warning, May, and one warning only. Get out of my office. Keep your hands off me, or I will not restrain myself. How dare you! You've already said that. I shouldn't have let this go on as long as it did. Sure, I hadn't exactly reciprocated, but I played along in the hopes that May would get the hint. Obviously, I was wrong. And I rounded my desk to open my office door. Leave. Do you think I'll take orders from you? May trembled with rage that sharpened her voice and she tromped over to me to point her finger into my chest. Moving faster than she anticipated, because I had never touched her before, I grabbed her pointer finger and snapped it back. In a flash, she was on her knees, shrieking, clutching her broken finger, and I leaned on the door frame to cross my ankles. Get out of my office. Is that proof enough? Her screaming drew attention from Sonia and the few interns trying to impress by coming in early, and they huddled a little ways down the hall out of the corner of my eye. May stood up, tears streaming mascara down her face, and she reared back her uninjured hand to slap me again. But again, I grabbed it and twisted, and she let out this incredibly high, ear-splitting wail as her fragile wrist snapped in two. Honestly, what did she hope to achieve by this? The question had no answer, of course, and I frowned when she dropped to curl into a fetal position on the floor, unable to even hold her hands now. Let's get one thing straight here, May. I am not lucky to work here. You are lucky to have me. I'm not some shrimpy bitch you can manipulate into fucking you. I'm not afraid of you. I don't have a single shred of likeness for you. Whatever you think is going to happen from trying to push me, I guarantee you it's not going to happen. Crouching down, I kept my hands firmly in view of those watching, and May whimpered beyond her tears. Now, her face was red with pain instead of rage, but I found no satisfaction from it. Stay away from me. I've told you for months to leave me alone, May, and I'm tired of saying it. So, if you need something from me for work, which you shouldn't because you're not my senior, send an intern. I'd tried to be friendly to these people, to like them and 
get them to like me. But in this moment, I didn't give much of a fuck as I straightened. Stepping around May and out of my office, I glanced over at the horrified faces of the interns watching. Sonia seems pretty okay, though. Then again, May treated Sonia like shit because she was prettier, had bigger breasts, and a nicer ass. Not that it was anything more than an observation, of course. Does anyone have anything to say? Just in that moment, Martin came bustling in through the door by the receptionist's desk, and my lips twisted as I held back a sigh. He paused at the blockade in the hallway, and he tossed me an inquisitive look under high brows. Two of the interns skirted me to help May to her feet, and I rubbed up my face and into my hair as she started screaming about calling the police and pressing charges. Chapter 28 Clarissa Tapping my foot to the beat of Cookie's pants, I waited for the elevator doors to slide open with irritated impatience. It wasn't like Luca to not take my call. He'd usually text if he could, but we had lunch plans, and he'd gotten out for his break twenty minutes ago. Shouldering my purse absently when the metal box gave a shrill ping, I emerged onto the fourth floor only to pause at the absurd number of cops milling around the waiting room. There had to be at least four, not even counting who might be in back, and worry clung to my ribs as I strode to the receptionist's desk. Sonia, what happened? Sonia leaned over through the window to pet Cookie happily, like seeing the dog just made her day so much better. Glancing around, she gestured me closer with her free hand, and surprise lifted my brows. Luca broke May's hand this morning. The police just now decided to show up. Shock slammed into my chest, and I gasped as my heart leaped into my throat. Sonia tossed me a questioning look before leaning closer, and a slight frown marred her bird-like features. You didn't know about May? I won't say anything. You should get the story from Luca. I'll let you go through. Uh, thanks? I had no idea... What to say to that? Too busy wrapping my mind around why I didn't know about this May person. Shuffling over a few feet, I pulled the door open and when Sonia popped the handle and she leaned her forearms on the desk to rattle her bangles mutedly. You and Luca have been dating for a really long time, right? Well, I mean, sort of. I went to Maine for school, but... Yeah, we've been on and off since the tenth grade. Appreciation wiggled Sonia's brow, and I glanced down the hallway to find every single door shut and all the employees lined up against the wall. Why? I was just wondering. I had to look up all the potentials before they were hired, so I called Luca's last firm. The receptionist there thought he was gay because he never showed any interest in anyone the entire six years he was there. I guess that can also be attributed to being in love with someone else. It makes more sense, at least. She sighed wistfully, propping her chin on her fist to shoot me a small smile. I've never been in a relationship longer than two years. I can't imagine being so in love with someone that they're celibate all the time. Uh, uh, I, uh, y you know, no offense or anything, Sonia, but I really, I don't think this is an appropriate topic. What, what, what the, uh, fumbling over my words as my ears burned, I pursed my lips to stop my incredulous, uncomfortable laugh from bursting through. Uh, anyway, what happened this morning that Luca broke her hand? May slapped him. 
A shocked gasp escaped the dense lump in my throat, and my eyes fixed on Luca's office door to narrow. I guess she's been trying to get in his pants since he started here, and he finally got sick of it. She never listened to him to leave him alone. I mean, I get why. She's a really strong-minded person, maybe is the best way to describe it. She's used to getting what she wants and thinks she's better than everyone else. This morning, May must have just pushed him over the edge. He broke her finger, and then she tried to hit him, so he broke her hand. Then she went to the hospital, and Martin called the cops because that's what you're supposed to do. But it's almost 12.30 in the afternoon. Luca goes into work at 7.30 in the morning, Sonia. She only shrugged, and I leaned against the desk to cross my arms tightly over my chest. What took the police so long? I mean, an assault at a prosecutor's office? It's not exactly at the top of their list, you know. There was a huge fire out in the industry park. Did you know about that? Shaking my head as the subject slid by on pins and needles, I glanced over at Sonia, nodded, and her dangling earrings tinkled and sparkled. Oh, yeah, it was devastating. This time of year, everything is so dry, and the industrial park always catches fire to some degree every single year. Usually, there's not much to fuel the flames, but I guess that it stretched up the side of the ravine over there. No one died, thankfully, but it took all night to kill it. I didn't know that, no. I didn't watch the news last night. Luca and I have this rule, no electronics. I mean, unless we want to watch a movie together or something. Scrunching up my nose, I wondered if it was really a rule because it had just kind of happened on Monday. My mom wouldn't stop texting me, and Luca was scrolling the news app on his phone. We were sitting inches from each other, but not interacting. And it's pretty clear from the security footage that she instigated it. So if you're not looking to press charges on her, I don't see a point in getting involved. My head snapped to the side at the deep, unfamiliar voice, and I watched Luca and a policeman exit his office to shake hands firmly. You black angels really aren't too bad, you know? I'm glad I don't pay for my own gas, though. I appreciate it, Tony. Tell your wife I said hello. We've done a lot for this city. Lucas' words from what seemed like so long ago popped into my head, and my lips thinned as Cookie started to wiggle in excitement against my legs. He had the police in his pocket, at the very least. They gave him a wide berth because he was in his motorcycle club. Black Angels. It's fitting. The pressure on my heart eased when Luca caught my gaze, and I cracked a smile as he strode over casually. Guilt ate at his features, deepening the lines around his mouth, and he ducked to kiss my cheek lingeringly. I'm sorry I couldn't get back to you, baby. Martin took my cell phone until the police got here. Humming softly, I breathed a sigh of relief while Luca crouched down to pet Cookie, and she licked and sniffed around his collar furiously. Do you still want to go out to lunch? I need something good after all this drama. M yeah, you can tell me all about it on the way. Arching a brow, I cocked my head at the sharp glance that Luca sent me, and his face contorted in displeasure. Did your boss tell you that you can leave? Clary. Straightening to sigh in exasperation, Luca ran his hand over his head before slowly turning his heel. Beside me, Sonia stifled a giggle, shaking her head as she walked back to her chair, and my mind started to wander without distractions. What an oxymoron. Luca had broken a woman's hand. That, in itself, wasn't nearly as surprising as the reason why, though. 
I wonder how many times he told her no to get to this point. I've been approved to leave for lunch, Clarissa. Blinking hard as Luca clicked his heels and gave me a half-hearted salute, I smiled absently at his antics. We walked quietly to the stairs, and he only spoke up after his heavy sigh echoed off the concrete walls. Before you say anything, I just want to clarify that I never gave May any indication at all that I was interested in her, Clary. Cookie bounced down the stairs, happy to be by Luca's side again, and I cast him a side glance to catch the apprehension drenching his expression. Rolling my bottom lip between my teeth to gnaw diligently, I spent a second or two deciding on what to say. Women lawyers were always more ambitious, more controlling, more devious. I completely understood why May wouldn't take rejection well. I never doubted that you didn't, Luca. His shoulders sagged in relief, and I flexed my hand around Cookie's leash as we rounded a landing on the second floor. What happened? She overstepped. I wouldn't just break her wrist unless she touched me first. Clary, you know that. May came on to me, and I told her that she was disgusting, and she hit me. I didn't do anything but tell her to leave, but she pushed. She tried to stab me with her fingernail, so I broke her finger. She tried to hit me a second time, so I broke her wrist. She'll be fine in six to eight weeks. Luca spoke like that was no big deal, and to him, I was positive that it wasn't. May started the fight, but he finished it, and that was all well and good, but they worked together. I've told her countless times to leave me alone, and now she will, unless she wants me to break something else. There are 204 other bones in her body, and they all stick out under her skin, so I'm not lacking options. Chapter 29 Luca The pizza place that Clarissa and I had gone on our first date so long ago was absolutely packed for the lunch rush. Obviously, I'd made the right decision in calling in our order before we left my office building. Walking over to the takeout window, I pulled my wallet out of my jacket, and the girl behind the counter asked my name without really looking at me. Granted, she had thirty other people to serve, so I didn't take it personally. We exchanged cash for pizza within seconds, and I strode out to Clary's car sitting on the curb to hop in. She was quiet, but not hostile, and we headed for the nearest park located close to our high school in relatively comfortable silence. Is it true you were celibate the whole time we were apart? Speaking up quickly as she pulled into one of the few available parking spots, Clarissa turned to stare at me directly. I nearly choked on my own spit, and goosebumps washed my arms and legs as my abdomen tightened. Is it? What kind of question is that, Clary? Of course I was. Flames licked up my neck all the way to my ears, and I tapped the top of the pizza box in agitation. Her eyes widened like she wasn't expecting that answer, and affection tickled my heartstrings as I opened my mouth. You're it for me. You always have been, Clarissa. Oh, oh. Flexing her fingers on the wheel, Clary tore her eyes off me to frown under furrowed brows. Good. I couldn't help but laugh a little at that, and she shook her head to spill her lustrous curls over her shoulders. Popping open the door, she climbed out, 
and I followed suit as Cookie climbed over the center console. Her tail wagged, but I didn't bother grabbing her leash as we walked to the nearest bench. So, Tony, the cop that you were talking to, does he know about what your friends were doing? Nodding firmly, I slid into a spot, and Clarissa sat across from me as I focused my thoughts on that particular topic. How'd that happen? I'm not sure on the beginning, since it was Tyler that managed all that stuff, but Tony eventually just learned that if he got a call involving us, he was just wasting gas. He didn't want to be involved in policing us, and we didn't want him involved. We handle it all on our own, but he has an obligation to show up at least. Tyler used to pay him off, but I don't know if it's still going on. Tyler just pays for all this stuff for you? No questions asked? No expectations? Shrugging at the barrage, I opened the pizza box to inhale deeply, and Clarissa immediately reached to grab a slice of pepperoni. Why'd they stop? They must have made a lot of money. Well, from what I understand, it stopped because the anti-Semites started making moves. Neo-Nazis and white supremacists and cults and stuff were Tyler's best customers, right? Pausing to snatch a slice of onion and sausage, I glanced over at Clary to smirk at her dumbfounded expression. Yeah, it's bad. I mostly kept Sammy under the radar in Las Vegas, which was a huge profit venture for them because of the partiers. After the falling out, when Tyler and Spot got kidnapped, they decided to downsize, I guess. I'm honestly pretty fuzzy on it all. As I've said... I only give legal advice, pretty much. Tyler, Sammy, and Carson are smart enough to stay out of the spotlight without my help. Oh, okay. Taking a big bite, I nodded at her drawl, and Clary propped her elbows on the table to poise her slice. But you said Tyler's still in it. Yeah, I think he's got his own thing going on. Can't spend money if you don't make money, and Tyler's been in the game since we were kids. I also think it has a lot to do with his guilt over Jason's death. At one point, he was selling marijuana, ketamine, homemade oxy, shrooms, and cocaine. But I think he cut out the cocaine. She took her bites as I swallowed, and I watched her face closely as I chose my next words carefully. We fund a lot with all that money. It's a lot to lose. Anthony's clinic is almost entirely funded by Tyler's money and donations made by powerful, less-than-legal people. So, a lot of homeless people end up here. With them comes the need for food and shelter, so we fund a few churches. And with that support... They're able to stabilize themselves, and they get jobs here, and so on. So, to do good, you have to do some bad, huh? At least Clarissa was open-minded, and the thoughtfulness in her tone wafted into my ears. For a moment, we were too immersed in our pizza to continue the conversation, but the peaceful quiet didn't last long. Licking my lips... I reached to grab a tissue that had been sticking out of the box, and she picked off a piece of pepperoni to give to Cookie, sitting expectantly under the table. I have never ever met a homeless person anywhere I've ever been that was homeless because they wanted to be, Clary. I've never met a homeless person that wasn't generous with what little they had. Now, drug addicts, on the other hand, shaking my head, I took a bite of my slice and the cheese stuck to the roof of my mouth. Clary nodded at my unspoken words, 
and I rocked back to gaze out over the park. I've never met a drug addict that didn't want to do drugs. Everyone knows drugs are bad. I don't have any sympathy for them. At no point does someone think, I'll shoot this heroin and not want to do it again, without at least a little bit of doubt. What if they want to get clean? I couldn't stop myself from rolling my eyes at her question, and she frowned under furrowed brows. Acknowledging you want to change is a good thing, Luca. Yes, I totally agree. Wanting to get clean is great, but all that could have been avoided if you didn't start using in the first place, that's all I'm saying. Nodding around her bite, Clarissa hummed softly, and I bit into my garlicky crust to stretch out my legs carefully under the table. Don't you want to ask me about May? Not particularly. I trust you, Luca. My chest warmed at her muffled quip, and Clarissa blushed faintly as she dabbed the corners of her mouth with a napkin. You kind of broke her hands. What else is there more to ask about? I don't know. I thought that you'd be interested in the details. Training my eyes on her, I could see that I was right, and she licked her lips heavily. She's upped her game since I passed my trial period. Martin wants me to replace her as partner. My very first day, Sonia came up to me and told me to stay away from her, which was fairly easy considering I'm Martin's junior and not hers. He wants you to replace her as partner? That's amazing. Congratulations. Smiling fondly, I nodded in thanks and took another bite, and I glanced down to find the pizza already half gone. Picking up another slice of pepperoni... I braced myself on my elbows as Clary snuck a piece of sausage under the table. Honestly, I can't wait to start my new job. It's so boring being at home alone. I've always been at school and I worked for a little bit, but I've never just done nothing. Enjoy it while you can, baby. The first year of teaching is supposed to be insane, right? Clary only waved me off, and pride clung to my ribs like a thick, sticky tar. The sun was glinting off her hair just right. The look on her face was so beautiful, and I was caught. I was going to ask tonight, Clarissa, but will you move in with me? She stiffened, her eyes widening as they fixated on me, and I clenched my jaw as nerves ate at my gut. It was a huge step for us, and my heart drummed hard in my chest. We'd never talked about the future when we were teenagers, but we needed even the loosest of plans now. Um, um, of course, of, of course I will, Luca. I just, my lease is for a year, and you can keep it. Speaking up quickly as Clary fumbled over her words, I smiled reassuringly as I reached across the table. She took my hand without breaking eye contact, and my smile widened as surprise sent a twitch through her slender brows. You can have your own place to go to. I wouldn't just not let you have that. I know how much it means to you, Clarissa. Blinking hard, Clary jerked her chin out, and I squeezed her fingers between mine. The sun hit her just right, and she glowed like an angel. She was it for me. Always. Chapter 30 Clarissa Let's go, baby. We're going to be late. Throwing my leg over Luca's bike and putting my helmet on, I couldn't help but giggle at the excitement in his voice. The sun had set fully, the streets dark, but for the lamps that hung overhead, and he climbed in the saddle in front of me. Tensions thrummed through him, 
and I wrapped my arms around him as he jacked the throttle. The motorcycle roared to life, and he walked back out of his space and towards the lip of the lot. Glancing back, he flipped down the visor to his own helmet when I nodded, and excitement flooded my system. Suddenly, I was sixteen again, and he took the bump between the sidewalk and the curb before ripping the engine. We were going to dinner tonight, but Luca and I were invited to go for a night ride with his friends instead. It was an easy decision, and I tightened my grip on him as we practically flew. The speedometer needle flicked at eighty miles per hour, and a grin stretched my lips as the wind stuck his leather jacket to my body. There's, Lu there's Anthony. Luca's voice filtered through the speakers in the helmet, and I tensed when he zoomed down the straightaway that fed into downtown. I couldn't hear anything above the roar of his motorcycle, and his chuckle was the only indication that we'd passed Anthony. Loser. Where are we going? Are we just riding around, or... Speaking up when Luca slowed to sixty, I looked behind us to find Anthony advancing. He and Luca both had cruisers, and I knew enough about them to know that maintaining eighty miles per hour was pushing it. We're going in the opposite direction of the bar, right? Yeah. We're going out into the desert. Carson's already there, setting up a bonfire. My grin widened, and a little giggle burst from my lips as Luca left one handle to squeeze my hands, clasped against his chest. It'll be fun. Anthony caught up to us, swerving his bike dangerously close, but they'd been riding for so long that Luca swung easily to avoid us. The speaker in my headgear gave a shrill click, and Luca let go of my hand to touch a button on his phone when the screen lit up. Perched on a special mount, the device gave a second ping, and Anthony's voice filtered through our, both of our helmets. You're a damn show-off, Luca. I have a reason to show off. Rolling my lips between my teeth as Luca weaved between empty lanes, I rested the cheek of my helmet against his back. Anyway, what's up with tonight? Hell if I know. Tyler just told us to get together in the desert, that he had something important to say, and he wanted everyone there when he said it. Luca grumbled something illegible at that, and I couldn't tell who sighed into the headsets. I know he didn't show up last week, but what'd you honestly expect? Besides, he meant everyone is in just us, but Johnny is going to be there too, I guess. Johnny? Why? There were apparently more questions than answers, and the line fell silent as I pondered what could possibly be happening. Do you think it has anything to do with the Mexicans that kidnapped Tyler and Spot? He's still selling, right? Of course he is. I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see what happens when we get there, I guess. Cruising through downtown, we rode to the outskirts of the city in quiet, and I lost myself in thought. Watching the buildings pass us by, I contemplated the last time I had felt so happy, despite how stressful the day had been. Just hours ago, Luca was being questioned by the police for hurting his co-worker, and then we went out to a very nice lunch where he asked me to move in with him. When he got home from work, I was out with Cookie, and when we returned from the park, Luca mentioned wanting to go for a ride instead of dinner. Now, we were stepping into an unknown situation which wasn't nerve-wracking. Uh, no, it was exciting. Are you sad you'll be the only single guy there, Anthony? Luca's tease pulled a bark of laughter from Anthony, and my brows rose in surprise. 
We passed the city line signs in a blur of slightly lighter black, and Luca slowed down to fifty miles per hour. Seriously, though. Gotta get going on that, man. What happened to wanting a woman waiting on you hand and foot, huh? Haven't found an old soul like that yet, Luca. All these progressive women, there's nothing wrong with that or anything, but it's not for me, for sure. My interest peaked as I glanced over at Anthony and his headlight flickered off his visor when he tilted his head. I will say this, though. My masseur is as close as I've ever gotten to being in love. She's got magic hands. Somehow manages to make me feel ten years younger. Why don't you ask her out? I mean, it's not like you haven't been going to see her for the past five years anyway. Might as well shoot your shot, my guy. The way that Luca talked with his friends brought back some vivid memories, and I smiled as Anthony snorted loudly. What? You should at least try. I pay her to rub my back and blow me, Luca. Why would she be dumb enough to do that for free? The hairs on the back of my neck stood up when Luca tensed at Anthony's snap, and his friend let out a harsh sigh. Not many people are lucky enough to find their damn soulmate or whatever in the tenth grade, dude. That's not what I meant, and you know it, Anthony. No, it's exactly what you meant, Luca. Just because it was simple for you doesn't mean it's simple for me. Yeah, I've been going to her for years. But you know what else? I haven't said more than three fucking words to her. So take that and fucking shove it, Luca. Before Luca could even breathe, Anthony exited the call and ripped the engine of his motorcycle to zoom forward. The faint red of his brake light disappeared after a few hundred yards, and I frowned at the uncomfortable silence that he left in the dust. Shit. I didn't even think of that. Speaking up with a sharp whistle of an inhale, Luca tensed before blowing out a hard breath. She's probably not a masseuse by choice, damn it. I should have thought of it before opening my big-ass mouth. What? What does that even mean? I regretted the question as soon as it left my lips, and Luca glanced back at me from under his visor. She's probably a prostitute or something. My breath caught even as Luca rolled his shoulders, and he jerked the throttle to send the bike flying. The arid landscape around us was almost entirely black, but for a few specks of light in the distance. There they are. Just forget about that conversation, okay, Clary? Gladly. Shaking my head to free myself of that particular nasty conversation, I tightened my grip on Luca. My leggings protected my skin from the wind for the most part, and his leather jacket clung to my leather jacket from the heat. Well, technically, they were both his, but one of them was mine. We should go for a night ride on Friday, just the two of us. Speaking up as the lights began to reflect off chrome, I smiled when Luca nodded instantly. When was the last time you went night riding alone? Not since you left. Fondness assaulted my ribs, and I pressed my palms flat on Luca's chest. Even with the leather, I could feel his muscles. He was hard everywhere, just like he could be sometimes with his personality. But I had never felt safer. What the fuck is that? Alarm rang in Luca's sharp tone, and I lifted my head to peer through the darkness. I could barely see anything, but I wasn't used to the visor's shadow, and all I could make out was the lights of the bikes already parked far off the side of the road. Chapter 31 Luca What? What? The floodlights came on 
the hum of generators buzzing through the otherwise silent air, and my bike calmed as I leaned back in the saddle. Clary's squeak through my headset echoed my own awe, and I gazed at the pool that sat in the middle of the desert. A whole entire fucking pool, complete with the stench of chlorine. What the hell is going on? Pulling my helmet off as Carson came sauntering over, looking just as puzzled as me. How'd Tyler get a fucking pool out here? Where'd the water come from? I don't know. I just got here. I don't even own a bathing suit. I haven't been swimming since high school gym class, my dude. Backing up my bike a few more feet away from the pool for safety, I kicked down the stand and Clarissa climbed off the back. What did Tyler tell you? He just said to show up. He had something important to tell us. Glancing around, surprise widened my eyes at exactly who had shown up. Carson, Anthony, and Sammy, all of the girls, and a few people I didn't recognize. This was here when I got here. I've been waiting for Tyler to show up to explain it. We better not get baptized or something. Reaching to scratch my head, I shirked my leather off and hung my helmet as my confusion only deepened. Tyler had been struggling so damn hard these past two years, and I hadn't personally seen him in a long while. Every so often, he'd ride with Carson or Sammy, but according to them, he always broke off early. And, I mean, I get it. His most prized possession had been destroyed by a crackhead Nazi. That fucking sucks. Did Carson build your bike too? Snapping up, I eyeballed the tall, thin man currently sweating his ass off through his T-shirt as he strode over. It's nice. Uh, yeah, he did. Do you ride? The guy shook his head, and my confusion only deepened even as he stuck out his hand. Grabbing it without thinking, I couldn't help but appreciate the firm grip, and he shot me a smile with dimples so deep that they cast shadows on his face. I'm Kyle, Sophie's brother. Blinking hard, I only nodded, and I released Kyle's calloused, work-hardened palm to wrap my arm around Clary. I was thinking of getting into riding, though. Here comes a truck, guys. All eyes turned east, and Clarissa swept back her hair as a large pickup truck came barreling through the desert. I couldn't make out anything but the headlights, and I tightened my grip on her wearily. The truck came closer and closer, until I could tell that it was silver, and it came to a steady stop only to pull a U-turn. Backing up at the end of the line of bikes, the floodlights illuminated the bed, and I wasn't sure how many more surprises I could take. The bed was overflowing with alcohol and hot food and ice coolers and a huge piñata strapped to the back. This is going to be one hell of a party, man. The words escaped me on a bare breath, and I frowned under furrowed brows when Tyler hopped out of the driver's seat. Johnny followed, and Sophie jumped down from the passenger seat. Under the buzzing floodlights, her little white sundress was stark, surrounded by so much black and sand, and my frazzled brain still didn't make the connection. Shit, dude. Are you two getting married? Sammy's girlish shriek crackled through the air like lightning, and I choked on my own spit as Carson tensed just a foot from me. Tyler actually blushed under the incredibly bright lights, but didn't really answer, and Clary's gasp echoed in the stunned silence. Yes, 
We are. Johnny's an ordained minister. Sophie practically chirped with a mischievous wink, her happiness radiating from her like she was the sun, and my brows jacked up. It took my dumb ass a second to realize that she was joking, and I turned to catch the tail end of Johnny's nasty glare. What? He is? Johnny, is that true? Johnny was a hitman has-been, and he shrugged firmly as he pulled down the tailgate. Wait, can you marry me and Clary, too? I beg your pardon? Clarissa shrieked so loud and high that I winced, and she smacked me hard on the arm with the meanest glare ever. I am not getting married without proper planning, Luca. Do you even know how awful that is? Baby. Holding my hands up in surrender to her red-faced wrath and embarrassment, I shot her an apologetic look. I didn't say right now. Yeah, you know, I just figured it'd be funner this way. Cutting into the conversation, Sophie sauntered over to hold Clarice's arm, stay her smacking me again, and I wasn't about to open my mouth. This was all overwhelming, completely out of the blue, and Clary turned bright red as Sophie smiled broadly. Tyler was feeling really guilty about last Saturday, but you know how he is. So I decided that the desert was the best place rather than going all the way to Carson's or something. It's neutral. You should have warned me or something. I didn't even dress for this kind of thing. My gaze flickered between the both of them as Sophie's brothers sort of ganged up on Tyler in the background. I would have brought something more than myself, at least. That was kind of the point between you and me. Tyler just doesn't know how to ask for anything. Plus, I didn't want to go where my brothers and him can get arrested for fighting. They shared a little giggle, and I wondered when they'd become such fast friends. Telenovas really do the trick, huh? Anyway, this is what we came up with. The funnest times are always the smallest. Can I at least do your hair for you? Do you need any help with anything? I suck at doing my own hair. I would love it if you could do it, Clary. They walked off towards the truck, and I cupped my mouth to hide my grimace. If I knew this was a damn shindig... I would have worn something a little more prepared than a t-shirt. Beside me, Carson sighed in irritation, and I ran both my hands up my face and over my head as Sophie's shout rang out. Hey! Don't punch his face yet! How much you want to bet they decided this three months ago? Glancing over as Anthony sidled up, wallet in hand, I reached into my back pocket as he waved a $50 bill. I got 50 bucks. I'll bet 200 that she just told him and he was like, whatever, fine. Thumbing through my cash, I handed a small wad to Anthony as Carson snorted at my declaration. I haven't seen much of him enough to bet higher, but you're gonna lose that bet, Luca. The ominous in Carson's tone drew a groan from me, and he sniffed harder before pulling out his wallet as well. Elizabeth asked me why I won't marry her a couple weeks ago. She's so... simple. No offense, but I'd really rather not think about you two doing the do, Carson. It gives me the jeebies. Speaking up to wipe the fondness and affection from Carson's eyes as he glared hotly at me, I held up my hands once again in surrender. I mean, she's twenty-two now, but she's got the brain of an eight-year-old. How do you even know, Luca? You haven't exactly been around her much. Guilt twitched my cheek, and he blew out a hot breath through his nose before storming off to help unload the truck. Truthfully, Luca, I don't think they're having sex anymore. 
Anthony's thoughtful tone pulled a grunt from behind my clenched jaw, and he shrugged as he stuffed hands into his jean pockets. I can tell you, at least that Elizabeth isn't having sex anymore. Carson's not my patient, though. I'm just saying, did he even know that she was overaged when they got together? She's always given me fucked up vibes, Anthony. She gives everyone fucked up vibes. Even Clary mentioned Saturday that she seemed a little awkward, which, you know, is just her being polite. I was fairly positive she was overage when she came into my clinic, and I told Carson as much. Plus, it helped a lot that her DNA was already all over the police databases from when she was dumped in the Hudson River or whatever river it was. I don't remember anymore. Trailing off, Anthony scratched his stubbled jaw hard, and I tore my gaze off the truck to stare at him through narrowed eyes. About earlier, I wanted to apologize, Luca. I think you're right. I've been going to see this girl for years, and we both know that it's not words that speak loudest. Anthony, if she's in trouble, I can help you out, man. His lips twisted into a nasty snarl, but he still jerked his head in a nod, and I clapped a hand heavily on his shoulder. We can handle it. Let's... let's just enjoy tonight. That's what this is all about, having fun. Honestly, I don't remember the last time I went swimming. Not bothering to reply to that, I rocked back on my heels as my palm slid from Anthony's shoulder. He was right, of course. This was a good time, no matter how impromptu. It was rude not to enjoy the extensive selection of alcohol, the catered hot food, the huge above-ground pool. Chapter 32 Clarissa Holding Lucas' hand tightly as Johnny mixed Jaeger bombs, I couldn't help the awkwardness that bubbled up like a black, sticky tar in my chest. I didn't know anyone here but Luca, and I had never felt more like an outsider. This was a surprise for everyone, even as they cheered when the truck pumped out alternative rock, but I really wasn't sure what to think of this. I had always dreamed of marrying Luca in a church, a real church, with a real wedding dress. The thoughts whizzing through my head only made me feel worse, and Luca leaned over to kiss my temple tenderly. This was casual, sure, but everyone was a worse person at weddings. It was a troubling revelation, at the very least. Are you okay, Clary? Nodding absently, I rested my head on his shoulder. There weren't even chairs to sit on. Everyone else might have thought this was a quaint setup, but I couldn't stop the nagging feeling that this was just trashy. Do you want to leave early? It's not just that, it's just... Trailing off as my words failed me, I only sighed heavily. Everyone looked so happy, deliriously so, and I tore my eyes off her to stare at my sandaled feet. I'm not sure what it is. Hey, you can tell me, baby. Squeezing my hand, Luca turned his attention fully on me, and I battled a frown. What's wrong? First, it was Esther... The next week, it was May, and now Sophie and Tyler did this, and I know it's not for any particular reason, but but I feel like things just keep, I don't know, popping up. I know it's not their fault or anything, but I just want things to be normal. Ducking as I did a dismal job at explaining myself, I gave a huff as I dug my sandal into the sand. Things happened so fast, and then they got slow, and then they got fast again. I mean, the reunion wasn't even a month ago, but it feels... 
Hey, 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 Clarissa. It's not wrong to want some stability. Holding my head, Luca kneaded my scalp gingerly, and I frowned fully against his bicep. Things will calm down, baby, I promise. I feel like I don't belong here, Luca. I feel like everything's out of control. I spend all day with nothing to do. I don't have friends here anymore. There's things going on that have, have been since before I came back, and I don't really know how to handle it. There were better times to talk about how I felt, but in this moment those feelings were overwhelming. I dropped everything, left everything behind, and here everything is still happening the same way it has forever. Clary, trust me, baby, I know it's not what we imagined. When I pictured you coming back, none of this was even on my list of what might happen. I know it's harder on you because you're not working, have nothing to do, but we can get through this together. Kissing my temple again, Luca sighed to rustle my eyelashes. And again, I never pictured anything specific about our future. There was never any plan, never any particular thoughts. It was all vague. It reminds me a lot of what happened when Jason died, Luca. And I can't, I can't go through that again. There was always something with someone else, and I feel really bad about it, but I just want to focus on us. And we can't even do that because of Cookie. Guilt clogged my throat at bringing up the dog. I liked Cookie a lot. I thought she was a great dog but she was just another thing to take our attention from each other. After fifteen years, this wasn't how I thought I'd feel when I met Luca again. Part of me wondered if I'd done the right thing, holding out for him the way I'd, I had. There were so many expectations, but we never really talked about what we wanted from each other. And this was just an amplification of that notion. Maybe we should make a plan then. My brows twitched in surprise at Luca's firm suggestion, and I lifted my head as he nodded. His mouth set, and his eyes flashed as they met mine to narrow into fine points. Let's do that. Make a plan. Maybe that's what we're doing wrong. Just winging it. If we make a plan, we'll feel a little more comfortable, maybe. Maybe... Maybe I should try to get a hobby, too. Something I can do that's not at home. Even just the suggestion of a plan made some of the tension seep from my shoulders, and Luca hugged me to his side as I sighed heavily. I didn't think it'd be this hard. I'm sure not having a job right now isn't really helping the situation, baby. We'll work it out, okay? You and me. My lips quirked in a small smile, and our little bubble popped when the floodlights suddenly died. Tensing at the intense darkness that engulfed everyone and everything, I held Luca's sides, but almost instantly the bonfire was lit. The clearing, or as much as this patch of desert was, glowed as the flames went higher and burned brighter. Staring up at the large pile of wood, I kneaded Luca's sides at his arms around my shoulders tightened. The atmosphere shifted instantly, and I smiled a little as the last of the discomfort of the surprise seeped away into the dark. I'll be right back. Slipping his arm from me, Luca walked over to Tyler to shake hands, and Luca clapped the older man on the back. I could barely remember who Tyler was. I'd never met him, and he seemed extremely unapproachable at Jason's wake. Watching them interact, I could see it in Luca's face how much he respected Tyler, and my smile widened as I leaned back on my heels. Clarissa! Twisting at the call, my brows rose in surprise as Sophie walked over from the truck with a blanket and rosy happiness 
beaming from her long features. I brought blankets because I didn't have time to get chairs before we had to get the food. I spent weeks worrying about today. It's amazing, Sophie. I'm not going to lie, though. I kind of feel like the odd one out. Saturday wasn't so bad because we just watched movies while the guys hung out, but trailing off, I took the offered blanket to hold to my chest and sighed, and Sophie nodded with an understanding glimmer in her eye. I totally get it. You know, these guys have been friends for so long that it's hard to integrate into their clique. You're not alone, Clarissa. That's also kind of why I invited all the girls and my brothers, so it would feel a little less us versus them. When my smile widened, my shoulders easing, and I clutched my blanket a little looser as Sophie gestured me towards the pool. I spent a long time thinking I didn't really want to spend time with them, but they're the closest thing Tyler has to family. Yeah, I'm an only child, so it's a little hard. My parents are still in Maine, and I haven't started my job yet. I start teaching in the fall, but until then... By the way, did Ruddy stay home too, do you know? Nodding firmly at my none-too-subtle change of topic, Sophie shamelessly pulled off her shirt and jeans until she was standing in nothing but her underwear. Flames licked up my neck, and I gulped down the sudden tightness in my throat as she climbed up the ladder to the pool. Uh, uh, Sophie, I don't have a bathing suit. No one does! The hairs on the back of my neck stood up at the hot, alcohol-soaked breath that rolled down my back, and Amaya clapped both her hands on my shoulders. Let's do some debauchery. Get naked. What? Before I could more than utter a word out, huge arms wrapped around Amaya's waist and Sammy lifted her clear over his head. Leaping back, a shocked gasp burst from my throat when he just tossed her into the pool like she was a rag doll. Her shriek pierced the air, and water sloshed over the side of the pool, standing just taller than me. Sorry, Clary. Amaya became a little unbearable when she's drunk. Don't listen to her. Speaking the apology as he climbed the steps, Sam didn't so much as glance my way before jumping. The chlorine-laden spray sprinkled my face, and my heart rampaged in my chest as splashes and giggles erupted from just a few feet away. Do you need help getting in the pool, Esther? Twisting as Carson slid his arm around her, I could barely keep up with how fast things seemed to move. Ever so gingerly, Carson carried Esther to the pool to help her straddle the side. She couldn't get her cast wet, but he held her leg just above the edge of the plaster. Watching it was surreal. I knew that Esther didn't know Carson, and he just let her live in his house and treated her like Spot and Elizabeth. Sort of like a little sister, I suppose, would be the best way to put it. He took her in without any questions, but went above and beyond to do her right. Here, Clary. Holding a red solo cup in front of my face, Luca came up against my back and I took the offering as he kissed my neck. You okay? For a long moment, I was silent, gazing around at all of these people that were so tightly bound together. Sophie's brothers were still buzzing around Tyler like flies, and Anthony backed up his friend. Johnny did what he was best at, but he looked way more relaxed than when I'd seen him at the bar. You know... I've never gotten really drunk. I've never had more than one drink at a time, actually. Lifting the rim of the cup to my lips, my cheek twitched as I inhaled sharply and the alcohol curled my nostrils. I came here to be happy, not worry about things I can change so easy. Chapter 33 
Luca. Marisa was fucking plastered, and I sipped my non-alcohol-infused Coke as I watched her through tightened pupils. Sophie had come very prepared, and the firelight flickered between intense strokes of a colored strobe light. Loud rave music pumped through the speakers of the truck on full blast, and Clary swished and bounced and threw up her arms. She had to be really drunk to want to dance. She wasn't good at it by any means, but that was what liquid courage was for. Scanning the lines of her body as she shuffled from foot to foot, popping out her hips, I cradled my chin on my knees with a slight smile. True, it kinda sucked ass to be the only sober person here, but it wasn't too bad when I considered the fact that I could drink everyone under the table twice. Clarissa wasn't the only person on the dance floor, and Amaya was the closest person to her. When the music cut out, everything still like glass just before it shattered, and Sophie climbed onto the bed of the truck to clear her throat loudly. All eyes turned to her, and my heart strained until I realized she wasn't so drunk that she might just fall over. I brought more stuff! The declaration muted the atmosphere flatter than a pancake. And Sophie climbed off the truck to drag two large bags with her. I wasn't sure what she thought was going to happen with the piñata, but she seemed to have forgotten it was there. Pushing myself to my feet, I sighed in utter bliss as Clarissa twirled around with searching, bleary eyes. Her smile threatened to tear her red cheeks when she caught sight of me, and I wrapped my arm around her to lead her towards the fire. Blankets were spread out, presumably by Johnny, who was the only other sober person here. Although he was a bartender, he didn't actually drink. He said it was a constant test of his will, or something like that. Sitting Clarissa down, I draped my legs on either side of her, and she leaned heavily against my chest. Long metal skewers, still in their packaging, started getting passed around, and I rubbed my arms with my palms. Sweat dripped down my wrist, and I ducked my head to inhale deeply against the crook of her neck. So, you're in the Navy, right, Luca? Tilting towards the voice, I gazed over heads as Marco passed the skewers to Esther sitting between us. What was it like? I spent eight months on a huge-ass ship in the middle of the ocean, and then I spent two days in a port in a country whose language I didn't speak, eating shit I couldn't pronounce. Reaching for the skewers as I spoke, I ignored the sudden quiet, and Clarissa took a, a long metal rod to swish it like a sword. I was sent to the Mediterranean on my second deployment. That was nuts. Is it like it is in the movies? Sniffing as I thought on it, I slowly shook my head, and Amaya rocked to bump my shoulder heavily. Well, what was it like then? It was boring for the most part. Spend hundreds of days at sea with the same people doing the same things. The navies. The Navy. There's nothing to do unless it's on the water, and it's usually not. Pursing my lips as I fudged the truth, I fought a frown. It wasn't a good day on which I wanted to talk about what I'd done, and certainly much less to a bunch of drunk people liable to say anything. I wanted to join the Marines, but I couldn't because I'm a felon. I imagine it's... A lot like jail, though. All I did inside was lift weights and sleep. The boredom was what made me never want to go back. Apparently, Marco had no problem at all espousing his past, and I glanced over as he stuck a marshmallow on his skewer. Shit was so dumb in there. This one guy was always trying to start shit with me for some reason. 
One day, I told another inmate that if this kid, he was a kid, like 20 or so at the time, didn't leave me alone, I'd pay him to kick his ass. There was no way I wanted to go down for another five years, at least. This other guy and I were on all right terms, and he was already serving life, so he agreed. What happened? Marco's expression darkened to deepen the shadows flickering across his face, and the glow from the fire made him seem scarier. Passing Esther the marshmallows, he leaned over his stretched-out legs and sighed heavily. The kid got in my face, and my guy held up his end of the deal, smashed his face against the concrete, and killed him. No one messed with me again after that, and I finished up my sentence and went on my way, never went back. My closest call would have had to be at this bar in Singapore. I don't speak the language there, like, at all, and the culture shift led to this huge fight between some guys from my ship and some natives. I hadn't talked to anyone from my ship in a long time, and the memories came flooding back to me as my lip quirked up. I wasn't involved because, fuck that, I didn't need any blemishes. One of my shipmates got cracked really good with a bottle, though. Ended up needing to go on medical leave. You sound like you didn't like the Navy. Slurring slightly from what little vodka she'd been allowed to drink, Esther turned to me with questioning eyes. My mom loved the Navy. Sometimes when I was little... I worry that she loved it more than she loved me. I liked it, in hindsight. It was a good decision to go, but I didn't have a passion for it. My grandfather kept pushing at me to go, and it eventually got through my thick skull. Your mom was a career man, Esther. There was no better place for her than the Navy. She probably would have made you join up when you could. Nodding, Esther's lips thinned, and I reached over to squeeze her shoulders as her eyes glazed over. It was an amazing experience, getting to go all over the world for free. I think you'd like it. I was going to college to be a nautical engineer because I want to work on a ship. I just need to make it to seventeen. Affection swelled in my chest and I released her arm as she sighed a shuddering breath. I miss her. You know, Amaya and I are going to San Francisco early next year, Esther. You can come with us if you want. We can get you a real boat to work on. Speaking up from the other side of the fire, Sammy braced himself on his arms, but I only saw his hand stick out from behind the flames. Once your ankle heals up, we'll teach you how to ride. I'd like that, yeah. Helping Clarissa hold her marshmallow in the fire, I ducked my head into her neck to savor her smell. Keeping one eye on the end of the stick, I couldn't help but smile when she giggled drunkenly. The conversation fizzled out around us, but I enjoyed the silence just as much. Once Pop keels over, I don't know what's going to happen. Speaking up thoughtfully, Tyler propped his forearm on his knees next to me, and I arched a brow quizzically. He's old as dirt, but Sonny doesn't want to take over the business. I've already tried to talk him into it, but it got pretty heated. Sonny's into just as bad shit, though. Maybe worse, considering who he deals with. I mean, I get that the guy doesn't want to sit over a pill shaper all day, but where does he think the money comes from? Once his dad dies, he won't actually have the luxury to sit around like he does now, Tyler. He'll come around. Carson grimaced at his own declaration, and Clary rested her head heavily on my arm as I struggled not to frown. We can always start up back the way we had it. There's plenty of places to sell that aren't Carson City. I wouldn't mind getting in on that. Marco tapped his booted feet on the sand and Sophie snorted roughly from beside Tyler. There's no way in hell I'd get into this particular conversation, and he glared at his sister faintly. 
I'm not working my ass off in construction in the hottest state in the country for the rest of my life. Besides, not like Mom cares, as long as I don't get caught. You're a damn idiot, Marco. Sophie's scoff cut off by a sharp, loud crackle of wood inside the bonfire, and Sammy poked his head around the flames with a grin. Yeah, you wouldn't get caught on a bike. Cops don't try to chase you when you're going 120 in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. Glancing around at Clarice's face, I breathed a sigh of relief when I saw she was clocked out on my bicep. Dropping the marshmallow carelessly, I covered her ear to hold her to my chest and lay down. The conversation around me became droning white noise as I stared at the stars. Out here, even with the fire, they twinkled so brightly. There were so many of them. Stroking Clary's hair with my free hand, I let my mind wander to what I wanted in my future. She was there, next to me, always. But now, the landscape started to spread beyond just our bodies. Chapter 34 Clarissa From Luca Sorry, baby. I have to prepare for this case. A tiny chuff escaped me as I scanned Luca's text, but I couldn't bring myself to actually be angry with him, and just because he had a job and I didn't wasn't a point of contention. There were just some things people had to do in life. I'm just ornery because of my period. It'll pass. Besides, I'm too busy looking for something to do to have lunch with you anyway. Scrunching up my nose as I grumbled to myself, I tossed my phone into the passenger seat to throw myself against the wheel with a groan. Why? Why is finding something to do so difficult? You have like four degrees, right? Why don't you volunteer to teach at the alternative school? Lifting my head as Esther draped herself over the back of my seat, I arched a brow at the wistful look on her face. That's where I went after I dropped out when my mom died. I learned way more there than I think I ever would have in high school, even though I did end up going back when I was in D.C. I didn't even think of that. Speaking of, are you going to enroll in the local college, Esther? She shook her head, and I frowned as she sat back heavily to flop her head against the rest. Why not? I thought you wanted to be a ship engineer. I'm not the person I was when I get all those scholarships, though. I have a new identity, remember? Tugging the gear into drive, I pursed my lips, embarrassment closed my throat. Esther had lost everything, but she never acted hopeless and I always forgot her circumstance. I'll have to wait until I'm 17 to enlist, and then I'll sign on to the engineering department and get my education for free. Plus, I already know a lot of the stuff, so it'll be a breeze. My mom took me on her ships all my life, before I could even walk. I was on a ship. Sounds like she had some pretty lofty expectations for you. It's the opposite for me. My mom spoiled me rotten when I was the only child. Even though I was twice this girl's age, I felt like we had more than a few things in common, and Esther hummed softly in acknowledgement. Checking my mirrors before I pulled off the curb, my eyes narrowed on my reflection and how tanned I'd gotten. I'm still not sure what I want to do with my life. I do have a couple associate degrees and a bachelor's, but... I can do a lot more with it than just teach. To be honest, after my experience with the four-year-old classes at daycare, I'm really not sure I want to teach first grade. Maybe I'll like teaching alternative or adult education instead. Not to mention, aren't they locked into it all year? I mean, at least in D.C., it's, it's very voluntary-based. Flicking on my blinker, I bopped my head as the idea became more and more appealing as it circled in my head. The teachers in my adult ed were great. They go above and beyond, especially my English teacher. 
I had the same guy both the semesters I was there, and he gave me all these old books and manuals to read instead of what the rest of the class was doing. Then he'd quiz me on what terminology was in them. It was so cool. That sounds cool. I never got the chance to ask, but how's your ankle, Esther? The cast stays on for another four weeks, right? I had never broken a bone, and I couldn't even imagine how much it sucked not to be able to do certain things. In the reflection of my rearview mirror, Esther only shrugged, peering down at her foot from under tightly knit brows. It's not a big deal, I guess. I've broken it before, so it was already weak, and I fell down that hill. I, I wasn't surprised, and I think that helped with the pain. After Anthony gave me some pain meds, I didn't feel it anymore. One time with my mom, we were on a hike. I was like 12, maybe, and we were racing to this huge tree, and I fell and broke my clavicle. That one sucked a lot. Turning onto the street that eventually led me to Carson's house, I nodded as Esther started to ramble. I fell on a branch like this thick, went right through my arm. I was in the hospital for almost a week. When I got discharged, my mom only had two days left with me, so we just hung around the house and played some games and watched TV. That was a deployment before she came back and found out Jason was cheating on her. I nearly choked on my own spit at how casually Esther just said that last sentence before going deathly quiet. Tightening my grip on the wheel, I eased on the gas as we reached the first of two four-ways, and the silence was uh, deafening. He told her that if she tried to leave him, he'd kill her. When she spoke up again, her voice had lost all emotion, but bitterness and hatred, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up. She'd just gotten back from deployment, right? So it was an adjustment. No big deal. Her history of violent outbursts and PTSD weren't nearly as bad as Jason made it out to be. When I heard that Luca was going to be on the team because it happened in Vegas, I thought that Jason would get some sort of punishment. Is that why he went after you? Because you knew the real person? Nodding when I glanced back, Esther's lips thinned as her face went pale, and I held my breath in apprehension. I knew he'd get off light. My mom was active military. She was trained to kill people, right? So it wasn't a stretch for anyone's imagination. The worst lies are the most plausible ones, you know? The question that balanced on the tip of my tongue burned, and Esther caught my gaze in the mirror as I lingered at the four-way. You want to know why I didn't bring it up in court? He killed my mom, and she knew what to do. I had done it before countless times. What... What could he do to me? He doesn't know I know. My mom couldn't get justice unless I sacrificed myself, and then the justice would be hollow. I think he suspected that I knew, but Luca put me in hiding before he could stage a suicide or something. That's... that's horrific, Esther. Rolling forward, I gripped the wheel with white knuckles tightness but Esther didn't seem as moved about her story as me. I didn't know what to say. I never know what to say. I've never been through anything even mildly bad. I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing, though, Clary. I always thought that bonding over trauma is more horrific than the trauma itself. There's always an elephant in the room, you know? You know things that you shouldn't about someone, and it weighs on you. The constant fear that that person will say something and everyone will know, that's the horrifying thing, living like that. Only trusting people you've known the longest, shared the trauma with, fearing losing that person because he or she is the only one that truly understands you. Oh my God, this kid thinks about some serious stuff. My throat tightened just listening to Esther get lost in her own subconscious misery, and I inhaled a hard breath through flared nostrils. I think you're lucky, you know, Clarissa, that you never had to experience it. It's not a good life. Esther. I had no idea what to say. If I should say anything at all, and she shook her head 
as the crease between her brows shallowed. That's all I'm saying. Feeling like you're a black sheep because you're a stable person isn't going to get you anything. Be happy and other people will be happy too. If you're not happy, just pretend. Remind me never to offer to drive Esther to the doctors ever again. I think I might throw up. Not that I didn't like her and all, but wow. And she was only 16 years old. Chapter 35 Luca Wow, she said all that to you? Really? Out of the corner of my eye, Clary nodded furiously with distress painted all over her face. Her fingers threaded roughly through her hair with a jerk of her arm, and I reached over to hold her clammy hand. Are you okay? You look a little pale. Am I okay? Of course, I'm not okay, Luca. I'm twice her age and still trying to figure out what she discovered a long time ago. That's how okay I am. I hide my cringe at the bitterness in Clarissa's tone, and she shot me a withering glare. I thought I had everything figured out, but I realized I have nothing. Hey, 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 that's not true, baby. The bench we sat on in the dog park creaked as I shuffled to face her, and she frowned with wobbling lips. Clarissa, baby, there's nothing wrong with needing some time to figure things out. Esther's life was mapped out the second Marissa found out that she was pregnant, okay? Your parents weren't even supposed to be able to have kids. It's not fair to anyone to compare your situations. I'm not in high school anymore, okay, Luca? Don't give me the take-your-time speech. My frown deepened at her snap, and Clarissa sighed heavily and held her head in her hands to pinch the bridge of her nose. I I'm sorry, I just... It's humiliating not to have my life put together. Do you honestly believe Esther has her life put together, Clary? Glancing over me through red-rimmed eyes, Clary pursed her lips thinly, and I shook my head as I leaned back. Throwing my arms out over the back of the bench, I stared out over the dog park to easily catch sight of Cookie. She was just a dog, doing doggy things, with no worries, and I took a second in the silence to collect my thoughts. Esther's mother was murdered, Clary, and the guy that did it got away. First, she was living with my aunt, pretending to be her granddaughter when they didn't even know each other. She just got on a bus and appeared, and this stranger had to take care of her. Now, she's living with Carson and two screwed-up girls who she also doesn't know. She has a new identity. Everything she did in high school is gone. She won't go to college, and she will have to watch over her shoulder every single day for the rest of her life. Do you think that's put together for anyone, let alone a sixteen-year-old girl? I holding up my hand to stop her from saying I don't know, I cupped the back of Clarice's neck to squeeze, and my frown smoothed out. How about this? Do you want to teach, or is that just what you and your parents settled on? Her eyebrows twitched, and I knew that I was right as I nodded firmly. Some of the redness and duress seeped from her expression, and I rubbed the column of her neck with my thumb. When we were younger, you didn't want to be a teacher. You just felt like you had all this pressure on you because your parents expected you to go to college. There are other things you can do with those degrees, though, baby. When was the last time you picked up a book that wasn't a textbook? Not in a long time. Humming at the confession as Clary ducked her head, 
I released her neck to drape my palm against the concrete bench, and she sighed again. I don't know. I just know that I don't want to be this person that I am right now. I know, baby. Maybe moving back here wasn't the problem. Maybe the problem was moving to Maine in the first place, and you just need to take some time to untangle your brain. When I went off to join the Navy, I didn't know that I'd eventually decide to be a lawyer. Despite what people tell you, it's difficult to have passions and pursue them. I mean, I wouldn't even say that I have a passion for law. It's just something I like, and I'm good at it, which makes it easy. Clary had this problem even 18 years ago. She was under such pressure by her parents to make something of herself. Her mother was great and all, but she made Clarissa do things that she didn't like because of better prospects or some shit like that. Which really made no sense, considering Clary never struggled to excel in anything she did, she did do, no matter how much she hated it. Although, I guess that did complicate things. Jack of all trades, her options were limitless, which was a whole new set of problems. If I could make a career out of anything, anything at all, it'd be... Expectation flooded my veins and seeped from my pores as Clarissa trailed off thoughtfully. If her expression was anything to go by, she was a little better now and pride bubbled up in my chest. It'd be, I mean, if reading was a profession. Why can't it be, Clary? Become a book reviewer. Slender brows shot up at my proposal, and I nodded firmly as her eyes snapped to mine to widen. I have the money job, so why can't you have the dream job? We'll get you a Kindle, and you can read any book whose cover catches your interest. I have Amazon Prime, so they're all free. Clarissa didn't really respond, but I didn't expect her to as the quiet became less tense and the seconds ticked by. I appreciated how much she struggled. Clary was 33 years old, and she had only ever gone to school. She had one job that she didn't like, and her parents were pushing her to stay in that field. It was a shitty thing to go through, especially because Clary felt like she always needed to be presentable in every aspect of her life. Luca. Twisting at the call, I hoisted myself to my feet as Sammy came jogging over. Sweat drenched his entire shirt, and he grabbed the six-feet-tall, chain-link fence to heave a hot breath. What you doing? I was going to head to the bar in, like, an hour. You want to go for a ride? I need your legal expertise. Yeah? Why? What's up? Wiping the sweat from his face up into his hair, Sam's expression twisted ugly, and the pronounced scar down his jaw rippled shiny in the fading sun. What? What happened? No, no, it's, it's nothing bad. I just... You know how we never found Spot's bike? Clenching my jaw, I nodded curtly, and Sam scratched his neck and shoulder as he glanced around paranoid-like. When I went to Arthur's to get Esther's new identity, I saw it. Well, it sort of zipped by me, but I recognized that thing anywhere. I didn't want to say anything, but... I had Arthur keep an eye on it with the built-in GPS, and it crossed over into the States this morning. Does he know who was writing it? Alarm thickened my tone, and I leaned heavily against the fence to glare down at Sammy. Why didn't you say anything, Sammy? Fuck, it's been weeks since Esther showed up at my office. Luca! His growl shut me up and I sneered nastily when he glared back with just as much venom. I didn't tell anyone because the person writing it was Martin. 
my thoughts went instantly to my boss, and I choked on my own spit before Sam shook his head hard. Not your boss, Martin. Our old local dealer, Martin. After that whole thing with the FBI happened, Tyler and Martin had a deal, but we ended up solving it all by ourselves, and Tyler didn't hold up his end. I mean, Martin didn't do anything to warrant the terms of the deal, but he must have stuck it hard these past three years. I don't think it was any Mexican cartel that kidnapped Tyler and Spot. I think it was Martin. That would explain how he knew the skinheads in Carson City and why he gave that crazy bitch Tyler's bike and why we never found Spots and how they knew where to find Tyler and Spot on their run. I mean, that's much more plausible than what Tyler surmised, but then again, he's not exactly the best with people's motives. Glancing around, I braced my arm against the chain link to lean down, and for the first time, a short joke didn't threaten to burst from my mouth. Don't tell anyone. Don't even tell Carson. Not yet. I'll meet you outside the bar in an hour, and we'll go see what's up. You're fucking delusional if you think I won't tell Carson. Carson will kill Martin for what he did to Spot, and we don't know the whole story. Martin could just have bought the bike, not knowing whose it was. We don't know. Just relax, okay? You want my legal advice? Here it is. Sammy, get the whole story straight. Get proof. Otherwise, you're going to be fucked. Shit. 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 This was bad. Chapter 36 Clarissa You're so sexy when... Well, all the time, honestly. Giggling as Luca came butt up against me to drag his palms up over my hips, affection wormed deep into my heart. He kissed my shoulder lingeringly, his fingers creeping under my shirt to crawl up until he cupped my breasts firmly. I love you, Clary. I love you too, Luca. The smell of grilled cheese and tomato soup filled the kitchen, and I leaned into Luca's chest as he squeezed mine with a grumble. He didn't come back last night. What did Sammy want? I really would rather not talk about that if you don't mind. Kissing up my neck, he tweaked my nipples to distract me, and I arched into his needy palms with a gasp. Let's not talk about anything. This distraction won't work forever, Luca. Rolling my head, even as I protested, I ground my butt against the hardening bulge in his jeans, the jeans he'd been wearing yesterday. Luca smirked against the crook of my shoulder, and I bit down on my bottom lip when one large palm left my breast to trail down. Pinching and rolling my nipples with his other hand, he pulled whimpers and sputters from my throat as my chest tightened. Doesn't have to, I, just until I leave for work. Desire coiled in my abdomen at Luca and pushed down my pajama pants and the silk caressed my legs as it pooled at my feet. Away from the stove... Turning to the counter, I spread my legs as heat engulfed my body in a way only Luca could arouse, and he circled my sensitive bead. His arm tightened against my chest, locking us firmly together, and his muscles rippled taut through both our shirts. Pleasure radiated through me, and I closed my eyes as a soft moan tore from my throat. Harsh, hot breaths rolled down my neck, and I gripped the edge of the countertop as he laved open-mouthed kisses on my skin. Shit. Turn around, baby. Excitement skittered up and down my spine as I shuffled around Luca, kissed me hard on the mouth. I knew what he was doing. He needed time to find a way to explain things while hiding the brutal truth. He wanted to sugarcoat what he did the night before 
His tongue slithered into my mouth sensually, and I let the thoughts go because well, they didn't bother me. It's not like he'd ever cheat on me. Reaching between us to fumble with his jean fastenings, I panted with need, and my hands trembled as it threatened to overwhelm me. Rubbing my clit, Luca wrapped his free arm around my waist to haul my feet off the floor, leaving my pants behind. Moaning as my abdomen clenched tightly, I managed to undo the button of his jeans, and he worked his long fingers between my folds. Wait, I have my... My face flamed when Luca gingerly tugged my tampon out, and he pulled back to step on the foot of the trash can. N never mind, I guess. Capturing my lips fiercely, Luca gripped my butt to carry me away from the food, and I locked my ankles against the small of his back. The closest surface was the wall in the hallway that led to the bathroom and his bedroom, but we didn't make it that far. His jeans fell from the friction at his gait and the burning heat of his hard cock buried against my entrance. Oh, God, Luca. Groaning gutturally when he slapped my clit with the spongy head of his rod, I tensed when Luca pulled back his hips. His mouth left mine just for a second to poise himself against me, and I gripped either side of his neck and jaw in clammy palms. My heart raced, the blood drowning out the sound of his heavy breaths, and he braced his forearm above my head before thrusting hard. I clamped down on him as his grunt clogged my throat and my hands slid down to grip his shirt in a vice. Luca's girth stretched my inner walls, saturated with the pleasure of him, and my eyes rolled slightly. Pleasurable tingles shot up my torso to my collarbones, and he grappled my thighs as he set a hard, fast pace. Harder. Harder. Please, Luca, it's so, so good. Oh, God. Undulating wildly around Luca's throbbing cock, the friction burned as I came undone, and my nails dug into his back. Powerful muscles strained against my thighs, and my high-pitched keening muffled by his tongue claiming mine. The taste of him only sent me higher, his hips jarring mine with each snap, and the faint slap of skin on skin echoed around us. C Clary. The mix of our saliva pooled under our dancing tongues, and I whimpered pathetically as waves of pleasure slammed into me. Ducking and shuffling to thrust more upward, he pounded my inner spot to keep my release so intense. Too intense. Fuck yes, baby. Oh, tight. Right there. Right, right, right there, right, right there. My voice crackled harshly, and I tore my head back to grind my teeth and scrunch up my face against the pressure building behind my eyes. Luca didn't make love to me like he had all this time, no. He fucked me like a man possessed. The powerful waves only heightened, lapping at the back of my throat, and I reveled in his harsh treatment. Ah, oh, shit, Clary, so fuck. Tensing, Luca thrust more furiously and sharper as incredible pleasure assaulted my entire body. The ridge of the head of his cock caressed my walls, and he buried himself as deep inside me as he could. His strained grunts and gasps were music to my dazed pink mind, and he buried his face in the swell of my breasts. Flopping my head back, I struggled to breathe as he leaned against me, and Luca kissed and licked the sweat from my quivering skin. Our episode was quick. I doubted even our breakfast had burned yet. Dragging my palms over his taut shoulders, I coaxed his face to mine, and he kissed me with all the passion he could muster. The bolt of emotion that struck my chest 
made my eyes ache, and he cupped my cheek to rest of the butt of his palm against my pulse point. Want to take a shower together, Clary? Luca bit his bottom lip. His hooded eyes glistened with the images he thought up, but I shook my head. He pouted, cutely, but he didn't try to stop my legs from falling around his waist. I suppose that's for the best. I shouldn't be late. I probably shouldn't burn breakfast either. Even as he sighed forlornly, Luca smiled, and he took my hand to bring me just a few feet to the bathroom. What do you want to do for dinner tonight? I want to make Sophie's mac and cheese again, maybe, instead of pork chops. I'll make kielbasa. That sounds really good, actually. Smiling happily, I nodded and Luca pulled off his t-shirt and started the shower in one languid movement. His moderate number of tattoos danced on his skin, and I rubbed my cheek with the back of my palm as he spoke up over his shoulder. Listen, ab about last night. I will tell you, Clary, I just haven't figured out how. Okay. He paused, glancing over at me, and some of the glow of our moment faded as he pulled back the shower curtain. You don't have to tell me at all, Luca, if you don't want to, but if you think I should know if it's something that might cause some problems or raise some questions. Yeah, I was content with that for now, even though Luca and I both knew that once he left for work, I would have eight hours straight to think about it. It's a bit of a story, honestly. If he expected an answer, I didn't give him one, and Luca climbed into the shower to shut the curtain before I stepped towards the toilet. Chapter 37 Luca Pulling up next to Sammy, a cigarette between his scowling lips, I turned off my bike to sit back in the saddle. He glared at his boots, and I waited patiently for him to figure out what he wanted to say. Absently, he reached into his leather jacket to pull out a half-empty pack, and I took the smoke he offered. So, I did tell one person, I'm not gonna lie. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and Sammy flicked on his lighter to illuminate the barely restrained anger in his eyes. Cody should be here any minute. Cody? Isn't he in New York or something? Sammy shrugged as I took my first toxic breath, and I held it for a long moment as my mind whirred. What did you tell him? Exactly what I told you. He was in Texas, so he rode back. He's already in town. If Martin is the one that did that to Spot, what is our best course of action? We can't do to him what we did with Casey. Sammy spoke gruff and low, mindful of the noise coming from the bar, and his eyes flickered to the side door. You're the lawyer? What would you suggest? For what seemed like forever, I pondered that question, and Sammy shuffed from foot to foot impatiently. Martin, I'd never met that guy, but I knew that way back when he was Tyler's only local dealer, this place wasn't big on drugs, like Carson City for coke and Las Vegas for, well, everything. What little business Martin could potentially bring in was probably diddly shit by comparison. Inhaling a thick drag off my cigarette, I stared at the faint light reflection off the gas tank of my motorcycle dazedly. Martin thought he was a big shot. He made a couple grand a week, which wasn't terrible, I suppose. After Tyler cut him out, no one had heard from him. Even his regular crackheads had to find some way else to get their high. But the Mexican border was only six hours away, and there was every possibility that he went over looking for something bigger and better. If 
he had a grudge, it's entirely possible that Martin made new connections with whoever he was running with. Honestly, my concern right now is whether or not Martin didn't just get the bike somehow by coincidence. I... The rumble of a motorcycle's engine drew both our attention, and I frowned as Cody came up on my other side. He took off his helmet, and I couldn't help but be impressed at how good he looked. Interviewing death row inmates really worked wonders on him. Hey, man. It's been a while. I was supposed to interview a cannibal tomorrow. Cody didn't actually complain, but he was clearly disappointed even as he flipped through his longish black hair. His eyes glistened as he gazed at the bar, and I took a drag off my smoke before passing it to him. What do we know? We're on our way to find out. We have to do this discreetly, though, if Carson finds out. Carson had never personally killed a person. Even Elizabeth's creepy uncle had eventually been taken care of by Ruddy. Nodding and understanding, Cody took a few long puffs before passing my cigarette back to me. Where's Martin now, Sammy? According to the GPS on Spot's bike, he's at some grimy house on the south end. It's a known heroin den, so I'm guessing he's either selling or shacking up before moving on. He never disabled the GPS? Cody scoffed with a shake of his head, and smoke billowed from his nostrils as he pulled a face. Either he wants us to find him, or he's fucking dumb. Martin doesn't ride, Cody. He probably doesn't even know there's a GPS on the bike. If he does know that we can track him, then... What if this is a trap? Countering Cody's question with his own, Sammy looked to me, but I only shook my head. You don't think this may be a trap, Luca? Seriously? I think that's getting a little ahead of ourselves, for sure. Gotta remember, it's been three years... More than likely, Martin thought the heat had cooled down enough. Tyler took care of that crazy bitch that tried to light him on fire, and Carson built Spot a new bike, remember? People that don't ride don't realize that no two bikes are the same, and you never forget one once you've ridden it. The strangest sensation swept through me as I spoke because the Martin I pictured in my head was my boss, who was about as straight-laced as they came. We'll just grab him and find out the truth. What if he doesn't tell the truth? That's the whole fucking reason I'm here, Luca. Trailing off as I cast him a dead stare, Cody rolled his jaw and shadows placed over the sides of his face. Unless you're suggesting that we torture him. You're trained in psychology warfare, Cody, and Sammy's more than willing. Fuck right I am. Fuck that guy, even if he didn't hurt Spot, till he got her bike. Who knows who did? Licking my teeth at Sam's vicious words, I nodded even though Cody didn't spare him a glance. Thoughtfulness invaded his features, and I blew out a hot, noxious breath. In that case, I have to grab some stuff from my apartment. Just thinking of what was going to happen tonight made my stomach churn, but I hid my anxiety. I pictured Spot screaming and crying those blood-curdling screeches, holding her down while Anthony stitched her up. Luca! Luca, hey! Blinking hard as a hand waved in front of my face, I glanced up from my computer screen as Sonia rocked back on her heels, Concern scribbled across her features, and I reached to rub my hands up my cheeks and over my head with a groan. You all right? You've been staring through the computer for almost twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah. I didn't get much sleep last night. Uh, what's up, Sonia? She didn't look at all convinced at my excuse, but I stood up to round my desk as I checked my watch. Can we talk while we walk? Need to grab some lunch before I miss my break. 
I already ordered a roast beef sandwich and a salad for you when I walked past the second time and you hadn't moved an inch. Her hand rested on my bicep, and I tensed as Sonia frowned with thin, painted lips. Luca, are you worried about May coming back to work tomorrow? What? Why would I be worried about that? I made it pretty damn clear that I'm not playing around. Sonia's frown deepened, and I screwed my face as confusion stuck to my ribs like tar. What? Do you think I should have not and just suffered through it? She's going to make working here very tough, is all I'm saying, Luca. You had every right to defend yourself, but you can't defend all the rest of us. Alarm widened my eyes and pushed up my brows, and Sonia huffed hotly as she crossed her arms over her chest. I don't blame you at all for what you did, Luca, but she's going to take it out on everyone else because you proved that you aren't the one to mess with. You want me to apologize? She shook her head, her mahogany board straight hair swishing over slender shoulders. Dead seriousness dragged down my expression, and I clenched my hand into a fist to resist the urge to fucking hit myself. I will if it'll help. Why didn't I consider that before doing what I did? Of fucking course. May would be nasty to everyone else now, and guilt soured my tongue. It wouldn't help, but I appreciate it. If you showed any guilt, even if it's not about her, she'll hold it over you. I just want you to understand that even though things might get unbearable around here for us lowly interns and secretaries, no one begrudges you. At the very least, now... Martin has a better reason to fire her when he can promote you. Sonia's reassuring smile eased some of the queasiness that knotted my gut, and she reached to poke my shoulder. You owe me sixteen forty-four for your lunch. Hey, how come you don't let your girlfriend make you lunch? You'd save so much money, and she's a great cook. Just the smell of that mac and cheese she brought in last time was amazing. Clarice's idea of a bagged lunch is a thin sandwich and a Capri Sun. If I'm lucky. The dense atmosphere lifted at my awkward reply, and I could breathe easy again as Sonia giggled. Gesturing her out of my office, I shook my head even though it wasn't a joke. No, seriously, I'm not kidding. She's a firm believer that if it's going to be sitting in tinfoil for five hours... There's no point in making something grand. Well, the next time she makes mac and cheese, can you try to bring some in? I hummed in acknowledgement, and a headache started to pound against my eye sockets. Halfway through the day, and I had no idea what to tell Clarissa. If anything. May was going to be a complete bitch, and I needed to find a way to settle things once and for all with her. What a great day. Chapter 38 Luca He's lying. Before Cody even finished the declaration, a sickening crunch echoed through the decrepit room, and I clenched my jaw harder. Tell the truth, Martin. I'm foregoing some important experiences right now, and I'm not exactly in a forgiving mood. Martin snapped his head forward to spit blood, and I tapped my elbow as I shuffled heavier onto my left leg. True to Arthur's information, Martin had been hiding out here for a few days before going up to Canada, or that was his story right now. Everyone else in the house was too high to even realize we were all packed into this tiny, run-down bedroom. The closed, thin door, with its peeling paint and faint stench of rot, was enough to muffle Martin's cries just enough. I am telling the truth, you fucking psycho. I bought the bike on Craigslist. 
snarling like a caged animal. Spittle flew from Martin's mouth, and I frowned as I watched his face through narrowed pupils. Even I could tell he was lying. All the people that knew they'd done bad had this aura about them, and it was called desperation. Because Martin knew that Sammy or Cody, maybe even me, were liable to just off him, I don't think your methods are working here, man. Sammy's entire body heaved with the force of his fiery breaths, and his hair slicked back from the sweat, futilely trying to keep him from a heat stroke. Not that fist to face isn't a good technique, but clearly Martin needs some precision persuasion. Wait, 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 wait. Blathering fast, Martin shook his head as Cody walked over to his fold-out briefcase. Cody didn't exactly like torturing people, but Martin had fucked with the wrong girl. No, 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 okay, 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 okay. I'll tell you whatever you want to hear. I, I didn't buy the bike on Craigslist. See, that's not good enough, Martin. I want to hear the truth, so spit it out, or I'll take this. Brandishing a pair of hooked pliers, Cody frowned when Martin went deathly pale and start pulling out your toenails. Fine. Yes, 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 I did it. I hired some guys I knew to grab Tyler because he backed out of our deal. That girl wasn't supposed to be there. And when I met with Sandra, then I sold her the bike because she wanted to trade it for the drug stash. Urine dripped down the legs of the wooden chair Martin was tied to, and he started to cry full-on snotty gags. She got a new bike, so I f figured I could just keep the one I had. Blood drummed in my ears, and I held my breath as Cody leaned back on his heels to stare at Martin's withering form. Disgust clung to my organs, making me sick and Sammy started to pace like a tiger just waiting to pounce. He shook with fury, my friend. That spot had been ruined over a tiny grudge, like a deal Martin didn't even fulfill. So let me get this straight. You were pissed off that Tyler backed out of the deal you two made, even though it was over a stipulation that you never even fulfilled. Martin nodded jerkily, blubbering something about. No one was supposed to get hurt. But Cody wasn't moved in the slightest. So you hired some Mexicans from some no-name cartel that you only just started working with? Told them Tyler had a great thing going on and could make you all a lot of money? And you just expected them not to take extreme measures to get him to cooperate? Then... You gave a priceless motorcycle to a Nazi crackhead to trade for drugs, but she ended up destroying the bike after painting swastikas all over it because Tyler drives a custom six shift and she couldn't even drive a fucking tricycle? And then you just decided to keep Spot's bike because she had a new one and you figured she wouldn't want her old one back? And that's exactly what happened. Watching Clarissa closely... I wasn't sure whether or not to be glad she seemed to be really processing my story. So, that's where I was last night, with Sammy and Cody, in a crack house, interrogating a guy tied to a chair into confessing that he orchestrated the genital mutilation of one of our best friend's sister. I guess what spot is? <laughs> Opening her mouth only to close it, Clarissa's eyebrows furrowed, but her eyes gleamed with the inner workings of her mind. Anticipation seized my heart, and my lips thinned as I held my breath. Well, um, uh, at least, at least he caved easy. I don't know, Luca. Is he, is he, you know, dead? What? Uh, no, no, baby, of course not. He's very much alive. 
Larissa frowned at my unspoken words, and I held out my palms in what may or may not have been helplessness. You have to understand that it's not mine or Cody's or even Sammy's decision. It's Spot's. He hurt her, not any of us, right? That's not the point, Luca. That part, at least I understand. I mean, now that you know what happened to her and Tyler, and you have the guy in custody... Using her fingers for her quotation marks, Clary went back to petting Cookie's head resting in her lap. That ends a three-year-long odyssey. I, I don't think you should tell her... And before you ask, I will tell you why. Spot isn't the kind of person that can be responsible for that kind of thing. What do you mean? She looked at me like I was dumber than a bag of rocks, and my brows jacked up when the connection finally clicked in my head. Oh, oh, you mean telling her might do more damage because she's had three years to sit on it all and, okay, yeah, I get why her telling her might not be the best idea. Cody suggested waiting, too, because he wants to be here for it, but he also wanted to interview that cannibal in Texas. You should tell Carson and let him handle it. Cutting off my embarrassed rambling, Clary leaned back against the sofa to stretch out her legs on either side of Cookie. Propping her feet on the coffee table... She wiggled her toes even as discomfort washed her rounded face. You just said it, didn't you? This is not your decision. Carson is responsible for Spot. I get you not wanting to tell him before you knew for certain, but I think that's what's best for Spot. If you told her and she had to make a choice on the spot, she would be a wreck. I'm not going to say anything about anything until Cody comes back, though. I've seen Carson get mad to the point of insanity just once. It terrified the shit out of me. Goosebumps washed my arms and legs as memories flickered behind my eyelids when I blinked, and Clarissa shot me a curious glance. Uh, when all this first happened, Elizabeth was still 18 years old. She got the shit beaten out of her really bad, essentially, and had to go to a real hospital. It was too much for Anthony to fix at his clinic. Anyway, DCYF showed up and told her that if she didn't cooperate, they'd arrest her for prostitution and participating in the creation of child porn. Oh my god! Gasping at the horror of it, Clary covered her mouth as her eyes widened and I nodded firmly. Yeah, that's why she's so fucked up. But anyway, Carson went fucking mental. It was literally like a scene in a movie. Sammy had to get him into a chokehold, but Carson didn't go down easy. They had to sedate him with the big, nasty tranks. He's a big guy, and being jacked up on all that rage and adrenaline social worker and a nurse passed out from fright, and it was just a huge mess. I couldn't help but feel a little guilty at how much better I felt telling Clarissa about all of this. She just wanted a normal, happy life, and my experiences these past few years, even by association, were nuts. Anyway, we never knew who gave the Nazi chick Tyler's bike how they knew where they were, or why they chose to do to spot what they did. This answers all those questions and more. Martin is a sleazebag, and Cody confirmed that he wasn't lying about this all being about a couple of kilos and a half-price cocaine. What about Spot's bike? Are you going to give it back to her? Shaking my head, I unfolded my legs from under me, and Clary sighed heavily. Well, at least now you have answers. Yeah, I'm just glad I never really got involved in all the illegal stuff. 
It's more drama than I'm comfortable with. Reaching for my laptop on the coffee table, I scooted close to my girl as I booted the device up. The screen flickered, and I hung my arm around her shoulders to hold her to my side and kiss her temple. So, did you decide what you want to try doing? Did you think about my suggestion? I mean, it's worth a shot at least. I honestly, I can't remember the last time I picked up a book that didn't weigh a ton and cost three hundred dollars. Scrunching my nose at her heavy sigh, I rubbed the back of Clarice's neck absently and punched in my laptop pin with the other. Are we going to just ignore that part of this, your story where uh, you're a lawyer and you have a drug dealer tied up waiting to be? Uh, yes, he'll be fine. I promise. I knew what Clary didn't want to say, and I hugged her to my side as Cookie gazed longingly at me. Thank you for being so open-minded, although I'm not sure that's exactly a good thing, but you know what I mean. This is important to you, Luca, and I love you, so it's the absolute least I could do. I don't approve of you holding someone hostage and all that, but I also know the reason. It's a good reason, probably the only acceptable reason. Smiling fondly, I moused over to my web browser and Clary kissed my shoulder. Besides, you're a lawyer. You, of all people, know that the system fails people like Elizabeth and Spot and Esther. Just because you take it into your own hands doesn't make you a bad person. Chapter 39 Clarissa Knock, knock! Sonia's head whipped up, her patrician nose wiggling animatedly, and I grinned broadly as her brown eyes widened. A childlike happiness spread across her face, and she practically skipped to open the threshold between the waiting room and the office. I heard you begged Luca for some mac and cheese, so I made you your very own. Ah, oh, you're a saint, oh my God, Clarissa, and there's no one here because they're all at court. Yes! Giggling as she did a little jig, Sonia rolled her shoulders and snapped her fingers, and I balanced my hot pan in one hand to gesture her to lead the way. You have no idea how happy this makes me. It's been so friggin' horrible here the past few weeks since May came back. She came back five days ago, Sonia. Arching a well-manicured brow at me, Sonia flipped her long hair over her shoulder, and my smile dulled a little. Following her to the break room, I set the casserole dish on the counter, and she dug into the cupboards for a paper bowl. Is she really that bad? Okay, don't tell Lika I told you because he'll feel bad, but I was working late Friday night, and I heard May in the printer room. Nothing good ever came from don't tell so-and-so, and my lips thinned as Sonia glanced over at the door. Leaning in close to me, her eyes glimmered and fine hairs on my cheek stood up in anticipation. She was hooking up with one of her juniors, Chad, right there, but all I heard was her telling him the most awful things. I think he even started crying. How bad he was. He was small, all this terrible, terrible stuff. He didn't come into work this morning. Oh my God, that's terrible. My horrified gasp seemed loud in the quiet room, and my face heated in shame that May and I were the same gender. Is he okay? Like, no offense, but he also has a committed girlfriend. He got this job for security because he wanted to marry her. So, in my opinion... Shacking up with May isn't exactly the best karma. Not that it excuses what she did, of course, but... Scrunching up my nose, I only took my head as Sonia trailed off and 
she popped open a drawer to pull out a large spoon. Anyway, yeah, that's pretty much run of the mill since she came back. I don't get it. May must know she's in line for the chopping block, right? So why not make an effort to be pleasant at the very least? How did she even get hired in the first place? Martin seems perfectly reasonable to me. Sonia had worked here the longest, almost as long as Martin had started up. And she didn't answer as she scooped the mac and cheese into her bowl. For a moment, the conversation dropped while she licked her lips and groaned, her eyes widening to take in all the goodness. My lips quirked, and I made a point to thank Sophie for the recipe when I saw her next. Um, so, way back when, maybe seven years ago, Martin had a massive caseload and needed someone to share. Striding over to the small circular table, one of several, Sonia sat down to mix her mac and cheese with a reminiscent expression. At the time, this place wasn't nearly as booming as it is now, so he couldn't exactly be picky. When she first got hired... She was a junior, just like Luca, right? But when she made title and got a reputation, she turned into the biggest bitch ever. I didn't like her from day one, and I told Martin that she was going to be a headache, but he was a little desperate. Those days, he didn't even go home. So what changed? I mean, Luca told me there are other firms, but there's not really much crime here. When I was in high school here, the city wasn't nearly as lively and, I don't know, clean? I was so curious as to what people attributed this city's success to, and Sonia paused with her spoonful halfway to her mouth. Her eyes met mine firmly, and I frowned under furrowed brows when she lowered her hand some. There's not much crime here, because that biker gang Luca's a part of stomped it all out. My brows nearly flew off my face at that, and Sonia took her bite to groan in happiness. I let her have her moment, which she savored for an incredibly long time, and she swallowed roughly as my apprehension grew more intense. Don't get me wrong, I think... Leather-wearing, motorcycle-riding, modern-day Robin Hoods are awesome. But one day, everything stopped. All the druggies suddenly stopped hanging around downtown, and new buildings started to pop up. The homeless community experienced a huge boom, but there were suddenly places to go that would help them really help them. Not the government's definition. All the parks that got renovated by a private company, the whole shebang. Wow. Propping my elbow on the table as Sonia shoveled a big bite and nodded, I held my cheek on my fist as her story churned behind my eyes. And that's just, like, common knowledge? I mean, who cares about a hodunk town like this except the people that live here, Clary? I mean, the only explanation is that they move drugs and stuff. Anyone with half a brain would come to that conclusion. Like, I know that they all have day jobs, though, too. Not to mention, Luca's a damn good guy, you know? I mean, of course you know. You're dating him. And you're okay with that explanation? Nodding as enthusiastic, little hums breached her lips. Sonia leaned back in her chair to flip her hair over her shoulder. It doesn't bother you even a little bit? I moved here right after my 18th birthday, right? Like, uh, ten years ago now. Almost. I've seen all the changes Black Angels has made for this city, and they do it without expectation. At first, I was weary, yes. I, I think it's sort of a well-known unacknowledgement secret. Everyone is in on it, but no one talks about it. Most people ignore it. Which is best for all. I also think, especially after what happened with that little girl, that those guys will do anything for each other. I mean, sure, I know that Luca is the straightest of them, and that creates something of a rift, but 
If he calls, they all come, no questions. It must be nice to have that. My phone gave a shrill ping, cutting into our conversation, and I rifled through my purse with a muttered apology. From Carson. Is Luca with you? I can't find Reddy. He's never disappeared before. Just as I scanned the text, Luca's face flashed on my screen and I held up a finger. Sonia vigorously dug into her bowl and I hopped off the stool to answer the call. Hey, Luca. Do you have Cookie? I stopped by the apartment to take her out to do her business, but she's not here, and the door's busted in. Alarm tightened my throat, and my heart rate jacked up as I shook my head. N -n no I don't have her, but Luca, Carson just texted me too. He can't find Ruddy either. Luca groaned hoarsely, and I could picture him swiping his hand over his jaw when I blinked. I'll go look for them with him. I'm sure they're fine, Luca. There's no need to worry. I'm going to check the park, but I have to go back into court for two. Uh, text me if you find them, okay, baby? Humming in acknowledgement, I swiped the red button on the screen before turning back to Sonia. She'd clearly heard everything. Not that I was trying to be discreet, and her intelligent eyes flared with worry. I'll come back for the potholders later, okay? Nodding, Sonia couldn't reply through her mouthful, and I shouldered my purse on my way out of the break room. Shooting Carson a quick text about Cookie, I reached to run my hand through my hair roughly. Ruddy was a big dog, definitely big enough to ram down a door. He and Cookie liked each other. That was what everyone said. It could be anywhere. Punching the elevator button, I blew out a sigh of relief when the doors slid open instantly. I need to get gas, then. Chapter 40 Luca. Did you find her yet? Clarissa shook her head, and my hands prickled wildly as I turned to Carson. What happened? I was on the way to grab parts for the shop, and Ruddy fucking jumped out of my car, dude. Just ran off down an alley. We were close to your apartment, but by the time I got there, you were already there. Cars suck ass, my dude. He was pissed, my friend, but I supposed he had every right to be. Ruddy had never just run away before. Stuffing his hands into his pockets... His bulky form rippled and radiated tension. I haven't told Elizabeth yet. She's with Spot right now, and I just told her that things were taking longer than usual, and I wouldn't be home until late. We've already checked all the places both dogs know best, so where do you think Ruddy would go that's not those? Rocking on my heels, I frowned when Carson shrugged at Clary's question and she cupped her chin as she stared absently at the ground. Did you check with the rescue place you bought Cookie from, Luca? Yeah, I called, but they haven't seen her, and they keep an eye out, though. I told them to call me if they did and not to approach Ruddy. At least Clarice's mind wasn't scrambled, and I swiped my hands over my head and down my neck heavily. What if he hurt her? I mean, Ruddy's... Ruddy, man. He's killed humans before. Wait, you said Ruddy had a penchant for abused women, right? Nodding curtly, Carson scowled darkly, and Clary glanced at me wearily. What about abused men? Sonia told me earlier that Chad, the guy you work with, was... Raped Friday night. What? My voice cracked harshly, and all the hairs on my body stood up as goosebumps washed my skin. Wait, wait. Uh, what? Where does he live? Do you know? 
My gut churned as I nodded, and Clarissa gestured to my bike insistently. Let's go try there. Ruddy and Cookie would both know what he smelled like, right? And dogs are really, really intuitive, especially those two. Where were you exactly when Ruddy leaped out of the car, Carson? We were just passing by Scarlet Moon Circle, a cul-de-sac downtown with businesses on the bottom and apartments on the second floor and up. Chad lives a, a block or two from there. What if Chad took Cookie and Ruddy went after them? I mean, it's all well and good to think Ruddy would break in, but it's a little out there. Fishing my keys out of my pocket as I spoke, I nodded to Carson. He still seemed angry, but at least we had a working theory. Striding over to my bike, I shuffled foot to foot anxiously as Clary climbed onto the back. You can follow me. Yeah. Swinging his already over his bike, Carson ripped the engine before he was even properly saddled. My own motorcycle rumbled to life, and I walked back to roll towards the mouth of my apartment parking lot. Only Clary managed to remember to get her helmet on, and I made a mental note to talk to her about what Sonia had said. I had no doubt May was somehow involved. True to Sonia's fear, May had been an absolute terror since coming back to work. Grimacing as I pulled onto the street, I barely paid attention to where I was going or how fast. That nasty woman. She couldn't even look at me. Taking out her anger and humiliation on weaker people, like the coward she was. Martin had wanted to wait six months, and it had already been three. But I had a feeling we didn't have a choice anymore. Well, it was really me that didn't have a choice but to take May's job. I wasn't exactly for being a partner, but I was never against it so vehemently that I wouldn't under normal circumstances. It took Carson and I less than three minutes to get to where we needed to go. I didn't remember stopping at any lights or signs, but I couldn't be concerned about it. Pulling up on the sidewalk, I cut my bike's engine to kick down the stand, and Carson was already off his when I glanced back over my shoulder. Carson, wait! But he didn't listen to me, and I winced when he just leaned back and kicked his way through the glass door leading to a staircase. The shattering sound echoed down the street and out into the main drag, and Clary grabbed my arm as a shock gasp burst from her mouth. Chad lived on the fifth floor, and we made it to the top of the third before we heard the barking. Clarissa lagged behind as Carson and I took the steps three at a time, and he strong-armed the metal door open with a merciless grunt. Seeing him like this brought back memories from the hospital after Elizabeth had been beaten half to death, and I pursed my lips thin. I only recognized Cookie's bark because it wasn't Ruddy's, and my heart nearly stopped. She never barked, not once since I'd adopted her. Rushing past Carson down the hall, I had to backtrack before I figured out where it was coming from. This time, the door was unlocked, and Carson went first because I was a bit of a scared bitch when it came to Ruddy. Shit, 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 call 911, Luca. Chad's apartment was dark and cold and creepy, but I barely noticed the surroundings as Carson burst into the back bathroom. Vicious growls stopped almost as soon as they started and I skidded to grab the door frame with white knuckles. Chad was very obviously dead, and I sucked in a sharp breath when Carson shoved the dogs none too gently out of the bathroom. The tub was overflowing with cold water, and Chad was blue in the face. An empty pill bottle sat inside the sink, 
and my heart throbbed painfully as Carson dragged Chad's body out onto the tile. Both of us could see there was no point in trying to revive him, and Cookie slipped between my legs to nose Chad's lifeless hand. He'd probably been dead since Clarissa and Carson teamed up to find the dogs, and I clutched at my chest as the pain spread down my arms. Oh no, Luca! My head snapped in the direction of Clarissa's soft call, and I held out my hand when she rushed around the sofa. Stay back. Go back outside, Clary. She looked like she wanted to protest, and relief slumped my shoulders when she simply nodded and backed away. Leaning on the doorframe, I heaved a massive sigh, and I scratched my jaw and neck as I tried to figure out what to do next. We need to call the police, Carson. What are you going to tell them? He kidnapped your dog? To have company while he... Carson gagged, like saying the words made him physically ill, and I nodded firmly. Pushing himself up roughly, he grabbed Ruddy by the scruff and hauled the dog right off the floor. Stepping out of the way so I didn't get mowed down, I frowned as Carson left me alone with this dead body, but I didn't blame him. It probably hit some nerves. Carson had never seen someone that committed suicide. He could barely bring himself to look into Jason's casket so long ago. This is so fucking messed up. Dragging my palms down my face, I groaned harshly, and Cookie clung to my legs to hide her head behind my thighs. Fishing my phone out of my pocket, I dialed those three digits as disbelief surged up my throat. Emergency services, what is your emergency? Chad was the quiet guy, always staying clear of May. But that was hard when she was his senior. He'd just walk away without acknowledging her if she so much as hinted that she was going to say anything about work. And now. Uh, uh yeah, I need a coroner. My co-worker stole my dog and committed suicide. He's definitely dead and, and might have been for a few hours now. Clearing my throat roughly, I blinked hard and tore my eyes off Chad's lifeless body as disgust soured my tongue. Where is this, sir? Do you know when the dog was stolen? Is the dog alive? Shuffling to the living room, I sat heavily on the sofa, and my skin prickled as I held my forehead in my palm. Cookie wedged between my legs, whimpering and licking my pants as she shivered, and I flexed my toes in my shoes as I rattled off the address. Chapter 41 Clarissa Are you sure you want to do this now, Luca? Pulling up to the bar, I posed my question before Luca turned off his bike and leaned heavily against my chest. Worry nodded in my abdomen, and I glanced over at Sammy parking beside us. You don't have to be here for this. Sammy and Cody can handle it. We should go home. No. I need to do this. I just... I need everything to be over. I need this all to stop. My heart hurt for him as his voice cracked harshly through the speakers of my helmet, and I wrapped my arms around Luca's shoulders. This is exactly why I stayed away. I can't. I love these guys, but I can't handle all of this bullshit, Clary. Hey, hey, hey. What happened with Chad has nothing to do with your friends, Luca. That's not fair to blame them. I know it seems like a lot right now, but we're in this together, you and me, right? I'm just maybe being here to... Watch Carson discover Martin in the basement isn't the best idea right now. 
I knew that nothing I said could change Luca's mind, but that didn't stop me from trying. He wanted to see this through, he'd said, but I knew for a fact that he wanted some justice to be done. He wanted to know that people that messed up got what they were due. Most men that were raped never received retribution, and Luca knew it. You can stay out here if you don't want to watch, but I have to. Frowning deeply, I didn't offer a response, and Luca wasn't looking for one as he pulled away. Climbing off his bike, I pulled my helmet off with practiced movements and shook my hair out. He stalked off towards the mysteriously quiet bar without taking off his headgear, and my lip twitched the urge to call him back. Cookie whined, craning her neck to nose my arm, and I tore my eyes off Luca's tense back to unhook her from her harness. She bolted after him, her belly low against the gravel, and my arms slithered around my torso to hold in my sigh. Clary? Glancing over at Sammy rounding the back of Luca's bike, I rolled my lips between my teeth even while he squeezed my shoulder reassuringly. He's had a rough day, and he probably feels hopeless right now. He needs this. I know you don't like it. I don't like it, Sammy. My liking this isn't the issue. Chad was a good, sweet guy, and Luca needs... Somebody, anyone, to fill May's shoes. Okay, I know that. I just don't think we should be doing this on the same day that he killed himself, is all. Carson literally puked all over the sidewalk. This isn't a good idea. Speaking up harshly, I grimaced when Sam's eyes flashed dangerously. He knew that Carson wasn't the kind to get upset about just anything. I'm not saying it, don't do it, I'm saying don't do it right now. At least, wait until tomorrow. You know, you look so sweet and nice with your gold hair and little dresses, but you're just as much a, a cold-hearted woman. Do you really love Luca so much that you'd put up with us pretty much executing a guy? Samuel's declaration surprised me and he rocked back on his heels as he stuffed his hands into his jean pockets. I would never subject Amaya to this shit. It doesn't have anything to do with my loving him, Sammy. Luca doesn't do things willy-nilly. He never. Hasn't. Fifteen years ago, and not now. I trust him that whatever he decides, he thought it through and believes he's right. My tone went frigid as I spoke, and Sammy arched a brow cut in half by a scar quizzically. Maybe. Esther was right. Maybe. The only reason I can handle this is because I haven't gone through it. Maybe I can watch this because it was never me that was tied to a chair, and the fact of the matter is that nothing can ever change my mind about Luca. If he executes a guy... That guy had to do something incomprehensibly evil to deserve it. It's not denial. It's justification. Shit, girl. That's a nice speech. Clapping a hand on my shoulder, Sammy cracked a grim smile, and I blew out a hot breath through flared nostrils. Let's go, then. If my mom knew what I was doing... She'd probably ground me for a month. Gnawing on my bottom lip as Sam barked a laugh, I started towards the front entrance of the bar and tightened my arms around myself. I mean, she doesn't even know that Luca and I live together, or that we have a dog, or how easy it was for Luca to convince me not to want to be a teacher. Okay, no offense, but your mom is a fucking controlling cunt, okay? My mom hated her. Carson's mom hated her. 
They would get together and gossip about how outrageous it was that your mom didn't let you pursue what you wanted. Sammy flashed a smile when he leaned around me to open the door, and I gave a laugh of my own. Seriously, it's totally not surprising at all that you're going through a midlife crisis. Gee, thanks, Sammy. The heavy atmosphere lifted for just a second before we entered the bar, and I was instantly captivated. All of the tables had been shoved out of the way, and a man I didn't recognize was slumped over the chair, bound in the middle. Instantly, Sammy went tense, his body jolting like he wanted nothing more than to just bound face. But it was Spot that really got my attention. Everyone was here, including Elizabeth and Ruddy. Even Sophie was sitting at the bar, watching quietly as she sipped from a martini glass. But my gaze didn't stray for long. Spot was totally naked. Not a single scrap to cover any part of her. And my heart lodged in my throat. She was covered in self-harm scars, all up her arms and legs, her abdomen, breasts, and butt, and I tightened my grip on myself. Under the bright lights that were rarely turned on, I could tell some were old and some were so fresh they hadn't scabbed yet. Treading closer, very carefully, very slowly, I wasn't sure whether to be relieved or not that Spot wasn't shaking or even looking particularly distraught. She just stood at the right edge of the circle, glaring this dead stare at the man in the chair. Every so often, he'd glance up at her, shiver, and hang his head again. Hold my arm. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up when Luca materialized behind me, and I didn't hesitate to hug his arm. His free hand slid around my shoulders, and he held me tight to his chest until his heart beat against my ribs furiously. Leaning to whisper in my ear, his prickly stubble tickled my ear, but even that seemed almost menacing. Look away if it gets to be too much. Ruddy's pretty intense. My jaw nearly dropped onto the floor, but not even a second passed before a spot strode over to stand a few feet in front of the guy. Luca took a huge breath, and I did what he did just because I didn't know what would happen. Coming up behind the chair, Carson yanked his captive's head back, forcing him to look. Ruddy. My mouth dried and I watched in slow motion as Ruddy swaggered to position himself between Spot and the guy in the chair. The stillness was dizzying, but I didn't dare blink as the apprehension buzzing in the air reached its peak. Get it. I had never heard a dog snarl in person before, and I tensed but didn't look away as Ruddy lunged for the guy's crotch. His blood-curdling shriek echoed off the concrete floor and steel walls, and my heart almost stopped beating entirely. Ruddy put his entire muscular body into ripping chunks of the guy's thighs out, along with his <clears throat> parts. The thick, metallic smell of blood made the air dense and goosebumps washed my skin. Carson continued holding the guy's head even as he thrashed, but his legs were tied to the chair. Ruddy's snarls rose the hairs on the back of my neck. They were the stuff of nightmares, and I knew I'd have my fair share after this. Yet, I couldn't look away. Tearing of fabric seemed sickening in itself, and Ruddy flung his head side to side viciously, with an even more horrible growl. 
something flew to land with a wet thwop on the bare concrete. And there was the slightest pause when the guy struggled to take a breath. The scene played out like a horror movie, and Carson pushed the guy's head down until his chin hit his chest. Then he snapped the man's head back so hard it broke the top rung of the chair. Without the slightest hesitation, a black angel, unmerciful, but benevolent. Chapter 42 Clarissa Luca pulled a nearly full pack of cigarettes from his leather jacket's inner pocket, and I reached to snatch it with trembling hands. Even in high school, Luca and all his friends were casual smokers, and I was incapable of feeling any disgust over it as I plucked one out. He didn't say anything, and I blinked back the sting in my eyes as he graciously flicked on his lighter for me. I told you to look away. I'm sorry, baby. I didn't want his stupid fucking apology, and I shot him a withering glare as I took a shallow drag from my cigarette. But Luca winced, like the look physically hurt, but I only leaned heavier on the side of the building to slide down to crouch. He put his free hand flat on my crown, and I exhaled shakily as my knees wobbled dangerously. It wouldn't have helped what I heard, Luca. If anything, watching wasn't even the problem. It was... It was... It was... That damn fucking dog eating someone. Picking up his head from laying on the gravel-strewn ground, Sam blew out a lungful of smoke before offering a grim smile. Trust me, I know. I still have nightmares about the time Ruddy ate that chick that broke his leg. I like him and all, but I'd fucking shit myself if I saw him in a dark alley. It's totally understandable. Dude, not that again, man. Shuffling to sit next to me, Luca's own knees cracked loudly, and I sucked on the butt of my cigarette in an effort to calm down. Sammy snorted roughly, grumbling something I didn't catch, and I slung my arm over my knees to rest my forehead against my clammy skin. Are you okay? Are you okay? Combating Luca's question with my own, I glanced up from under achy lids as his lips thinned. That's what this was all about. Well, you got your justice. So how do you feel, Luca? Clary. His voice dipped as if he was going to tell me that I was the one that needed attention and my pupils tightened. I feel better, yes. You know, pausing to take a deeper drag, I rolled my shoulders as the shock of what I'd witnessed began to subside. Luca watched me closely, and I exhaled through my nose before continuing. Why don't you just grab May and deal with it yourself like you just did here? Cold-blooded bitch. Larry's got a point, though, Luca. Sammy grumbled, loud, and I scowled at him as he raised a hand dismissively. What? You do realize you just suggested killing someone. You do realize that she raped a man, right? What? What? Suddenly it's not your concern because it, he was just Luca's co-worker? You did all this because... That guy orchestrated a kidnapping that went awry. What would you do to someone who actually planned to do something so awful, huh? Well? Yeah, that's pretty much what I'm insinuating, yeah. It's a tragedy that the guy killed himself, and that bitch deserved to be punished. But it ain't by us, Clarissa. Fury invaded my lungs, 
and Luca wrapped his arm around me to hold me to his chest. My body trembled with the need to just smack Sam across his ugly face, but he didn't so much as twitch as he stared at the sky. Stop, Clary. We're not going to kill her or kidnap her or anything. Murmuring softly, Luca kissed my cheek with cold, chapped lips, and I bit back a groan. I have something else in mind that's a little more time-consuming. The police have just started their investigation, but it'll be ruled a suicide and closed in a couple of weeks. What happened to wanting this all to be over? Weeks? Bitterness laced my tone, and I clenched my jaw as I propped my forehead on my palm. Fisting my hair, I squeezed my eyes closed against the furious emotions that threatened to spill out from my lids. Where's Cookie? I need to be comforted by something that can't give me bad news. You've turned into such a badass since you interrogated me in the Walmart parking lot. This time, Sam lifted his head and his smirk was a little more genuine. You're practically itching to get this chick. She's always been like this. You just got too many blows to your big-ass head, Sammy. Kissing my cheek again, Luca cast me a fond smile, and my lips quirked even though I couldn't make a real smile right now. As long as there's a good enough reason, right? I remember, we rode over to Carson City and stole all that stuff. What? Clary did a bad thing? Seriously? Weak flames licked up my neck, and I took a drag from my cigarette only to find that it tasted horrible. Tossing a half-burned stick into the dirt, I exhaled heavily as conflict tore at my chest. What were we supposed to do now that the deed was done? Johnny was inside cleaning up with Carson, and there was nothing to do but sit around, waiting. Oh, you don't know about that? This was right when they put in the new Walmart and... Larissa wanted to go check it out. When we got there, we heard the managers talking about how the security company hadn't come in to fix the anti-theft devices. We stole mostly small stuff markers and notepads and jewelry and CDs and stuff. Easy stuff. We went through the self-checkout but only rang out a few things, bagged the rest, and ran. I never ever went back to that Walmart ever again. I was terrified that they'd arrest me. My mom asked me where I got all the stuff, but I said they had a drive at the library and she never questioned me. I still have unopened stuff in a box at my apartment from that. Huffing at the memories of that thrilling day, I leaned my head back against Luca's shoulder to take a deep, calming breath. Why did we even do something like that? We never did it again. To stick it to corporate greed is what I always thought. We never had a reason for that. We just sort of did it. We'd grab hundreds of dollars of stuff that day, but I never knew why. It was a split-second decision that we only made once we'd gotten there. Luca and I had hopped in my car and drove off giggling like imbecilic and stashed everything in his house before figuring out what to do with it. So, you didn't do it for any reason. How does that tie into her being a justice monger? Speaking slowly, Luca's jaw ticked against my temple, and I closed my eyes to savor the calm atmosphere. That's not a thing, and I never said Clarissa was. She just doesn't feel bad about something bad happening if there's an obvious reason for it. I.E., that dude didn't control his goonies, and they hurt Spot, so he's responsible. See, this is why you should have not been a spoiled little bitch, Sammy. If you had a job, you'd know that it's the team leader that always gets chewed out and blamed for the team fucking up. You want to fucking fight, dude? I'll fuck you up. I... 
Sammy sat up sharply, but his nasty snarl cut off when his eyes darted to the right. He tensed, his eyes brightening with apprehension, and Luca and I both looked over to find Ruddy and Cookie standing on the bay platform. His massive head hung low, and Cookie pranced down the concrete steps to cuddle up to our legs. And that was the end of that conversation, apparently. Anyway, when Sammy spoke up again, his voice was gruff and quiet, and he never took his eyes off Ruddy, even as the dog plopped down on the cool concrete. Petting Cookie, I held her face to meet her eyes, and she seemed okay, much more okay than she was before. After being found in Chad's apartment, she looked incredibly depressed and anxious, but now most of that was gone. I have to call Arthur and see what he can get for me. Amaya's working on her single right now, but I'm going to see if she wants to take a break. You're not going to ride with us? Sam shook his head swiftly at Luca's question, and he finally tore his eyes off Ruddy to frown. Why are you sitting here arguing with us, then? Because I'm bored. Plus, Arthur knew to call me if something came up, so the fact that he hasn't yet, and it's almost 11 p.m., means nothing's happening tonight. Rubbing Cookie's ears and jowls, I leaned over to kiss her nose, and she licked my face as she wiggled with joy between my legs. Luca only chuffed at Sam's dumb tone, and he tightened his arm around me as his friend flopped back onto the gravel. Tonight was satisfying, though. Chapter 43 Clarissa We pulled into the parking lot of Luca's apartment. Let's go get something to eat. He didn't turn his bike off, glancing over his shoulder as his voice filtered through the speaker embedded in my helmet he flipped up his visor to stare into mine. Let's go to Queenie's. I haven't had a hot dog in years. Backing out of his space, Luca flipped down his visor and revved the engine hard, and I tightened my grip on him. Against my back, Cookie pressed the crown of her head between my shoulder blades, and her goggles pressed into my leather. I don't know if I'm hungry or not. Me either. I just don't want to go home. I have work in the morning, and I know that I won't get any sleep anyway. Might as well do something rather than stare at the ceiling contemplating my life choices. Humming softly, I rubbed Luca's chest as it reverberated from his bike, and he swerved leisurely through the empty streets. Are you sure you're okay after tonight, Clary? Yes, I am. Seeing spot like that? Trailing off, my lips downturned even as I sighed harshly and I shook my head. I think I'm honestly with Sammy on this one. It's Ruddy's growling and snarling that was the worst part. It was worse the first time. It's always worse the first time. We had Elizabeth's creepy uncle guy, this FBI agent, and this guy, Casey, that teamed up with her all in the basement, and Ruddy legit ate her. The agent, I mean. Elizabeth found him in the trash as a puppy, and he was almost a year old, maybe, so he was pretty big. I think this time everyone was a little more prepared for it. Not that it's not harrowing to watch a dog rip a dude's dick off, but he's a good dog. He was a good dog with Chad, too. My chest tightened, and the image of Ruddy licking Carson's face as he threw up all over the sidewalk flashed behind my lids when I blinked. So, are you going to just go to work exhausted tomorrow? Yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. We'll just go to bed early tomorrow night. Nodding firmly, 
Luca took a turn wide, and we headed towards downtown at a proper 35 miles per hour. It was the first time I'd ever ridden with him that he was going under 40 miles per hour, and I pressed the forehead of my helmet against his back. I just want to spend some time with you and Cookie. We're not going to talk about anything Black Angels or May related, good? Good, yeah. Even though I agreed, I couldn't help but run over the past few hours in my head again. Luca had gotten out of work before we found Chad, and we dealt with the police for a few hours before heading to the bar. At some point, someone had the idea to get this issue with Spot over with, so Carson was hit with two hard blows at the same time. Now, it was barely midnight, and I was tired, but not tired like Luca. I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep tonight, but I really didn't want to do anything. Have you talked to your mom about her wanting to move here? The question eased some of the tension in my shoulders, and I licked my lips heavily as my mind turned to my mom. She wanted to move back to be closer to me, but I wasn't sure whether that was a good thing or not. Over the years, she'd gotten easier on me, but she was still very much a helicopter parent. My dad didn't much care where he lived, as long as he got to golf and enjoy his retirement. I haven't talked to her specifically about it, no. She talks about moving here, but I don't know if she'll actually do it. I just talked to my dad last night, and he said she hasn't really started having any concrete ideas. I mean, I love them, and they're my parents and all, but I've never been on my own. When I was going to school, I lived at home off campus, even when I was working at the daycare. I realized it'd be a bad idea to move out. Rolling my bottom lip between my teeth as Luca took a right at a flashing light, I tried not to feel bad about not wanting to be close to my mom. I have a feeling that if she did move back here, she'd constantly try to be all up in my business. Yeah, whenever I think about your mom, I always remember the talk she gave me after Jason died and we were sort of on the rocks. Luca's heart beat steady and strong against my palm, and I hummed softly as a slight frown dragged round around the corners of my mouth. Why she felt the need to explain to me that I should put your happiness before my mental well-being is beyond me. I mean, we both knew I didn't have the capacity at the time to make you happy, and trying would have been a mistake. It's not something you can exactly power through. Mothers just want what's best for their children. You know that better than most, Luca. Your mom wasn't an okay person, and she knew keeping you would hurt you. She loved you enough to give you up, and I know you know that it was for the best. I, I do know, baby. I know she tried and acknowledged when she failed. That's kind of the point, you know? Your mom didn't acknowledge that I failed. I think that was the day I lost all respect for her. You couldn't fix me. You shouldn't be expected to. Rubbing my palm against Luca's pectoral muscle, I didn't really have a response for that, and his sigh filtered through my headgear bitterly. If we stayed together and I didn't go to, into the Navy, we would have become toxic. Even us, at 16, we saw it. She didn't want to, and I'll never forgive her for that. I think your mom would be proud of who you became, Luca. My lips tingled with the urge to kiss him, and Luca sped up a little as Queenie's sign loomed in the distance. He tilted his head, and I could picture his small smile, even though I knew talking about his mother was painful for him. I didn't think that even his friends knew much about his mother. 
and I kept rubbing Luca's chest as we neared our destination. She was a good person by all accounts, but she tried so hard to provide a good, stable life for Luca that she barely ever spent time with him. When he was eleven, she collapsed at home from working so hard, and that was when, according to Luca's grandmother, that she realized she couldn't keep going. Luca kept seeing his mother until he went into the Navy, but their communication tapered off amicably. They acknowledged that they were better without each other in their lives. When Luca's grandmother died when we were twenty-one, was the last time they'd talked at the funeral. That was also the only time he sent me a letter, a fifteen-page front-and-back letter that I had never opened. So, uh, technically, it, it didn't count. I think I'm going to get a chili cheese dog. Maybe I'll get two. Luca's mumble broke my train of thought, and I sniffed an inhale just before his bike stilled between my calves. Carefully climbing off the back, I pulled off my helmet and sat it on the saddle before unhooking Cookie's harness and removing her goggles. What do you think? I think I'm gonna just get a burger. I don't really know if I'm hungry, and if I am, I'll just get something else. We weren't the only ones at Queenie's, and sluggish figures sat at benches under umbrellas. This was the place for post-drinking meals, which was why they stayed open until 2 a.m. Way back when, Luca and I always went to Kitty's Diner, but their breakfast food was the only thing that was good. Queenie's was a little stand, basically with no indoor seating, and the floodlights of the parking lot also illuminated the seating area outside. The pavilion had its own lights, but they were fairly dull by comparison. During the day, all the benches and chairs would be taken, but I slid onto a picnic table near the order window as Luca walked up to it. I'm just going to order a bunch of stuff and a couple of hamburgers for Cookie. Leaning his forearms on the windowsill, Luca spoke over his shoulder as he scanned the menu board, and I waved absently. My stomach grumbled in agreement, and I propped my elbow on the freshly stained table to hold my cheek in my palm. Now that I'm here, I'm really friggin' hungry. Chapter 44 Luca Popping open the staircase door, I reached to rub my face and neck roughly, and I shook my head in a futile attempt to get rid of the fuzziness behind my eyes. Sniffing harshly, I craned my neck and rolled my shoulders as I shuffled towards the door to my offices. My body ached from riding all night with Clary, but I didn't feel any pain or discomfort. I was just tired. Tired of drama. Physically tired. Tired in a way that can only be caused by watching a man get his balls eviscerated by a dog. God, I should have taken the day off. Grimacing at the notion, I licked the roof of my mouth as I shuffled to my office. The firm was deathly quiet, the silence only occasionally broken by soft typing or paper flipping. I wasn't sure what other people thought about Chad, but we'd all taken his suicide hard, apparently. Shirking off my jacket, I hung it on the hook absently as I glanced around my empty, quiet office. The only light came from a lamp on my desk, and I inhaled a deep, loud breath before taking my seat behind my desk. Turning on my computer, a strange sense of normalcy flowed through me. It was like any other day, just much, much slower. As if Almost I was immersed in water inside a glass box. A soft knock on my door drew my gaze, 
and I frowned as Martin leaned on the frame to cross his arms and ankles. His eyes glowed, pupils tight and face grim and dark, and I tore my gaze off him almost instantly as shame clawed up my throat. Propping my elbows on my desk, I held my head in my palms, and he shut the door behind him as the sting in my eyes became unbearable. Because this was my fault. May may have done the deed, driven Chad to suicide, but I was the one that pushed her to act out. We need to talk, Luca. A blubbering half-sob, half-choking, scornful laugh burst from my throat, and I flopped back in my chair as Martin sat down across from me. Swiping away the few brave tears that fell from my eyelashes, my fingernail cut into my cheekbone, but I barely felt it. Talk? And talk about what? This is my fault, and... Don't even try to tell me it's not. I could handle May being a fucking slut, but my dumb ass pushed her onto someone that couldn't. My knees bounced wildly under my desk, and I shivered a jerk of my shoulders as venom rolled off my tongue. Martin only watched me stonily, and I ran my hands up my face and over my head in agitation. I messed up. And he's dead. He's fucking dead, Martin. Do you think they weren't having an affair, Luca? Tensing, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up at how calm Martin was, and he arched a bushy brow quizzically. I take that as a no? Well, allow me to fill you in. The reason Chad avoided May was because... They were having sex long before you got hired. Chad's girlfriend found out and left him two weeks ago. What? Sonia told Clary that, cutting me off with a sharp raise of his hand, Martin's stony expression finally cracked, and he grimaced deeply. For a second, I had to actively think of what the fuck, what the actual shit was going on, and my jaw nearly fell into my lap. Chad was a masochist. That's why May was shit-talking him. Yes, you had nothing to do with this, Luca, and I plan on giving Sonia a very stern talking to about gossiping with non-employees, regardless of your relationship status. Shock rendered me numb but I couldn't help the sharp bark of laughter that burst from my throat. Chad killed himself because his girlfriend left him, not because you stood up to May. I know she's been a point of contention for you, but this is not your fault. I thought they were going to get married. Chad constantly talked about how great she was. A huge weight lifted off my chest, as my eyes boggled slightly, and I covered my mouth to hide the automatic smirk that stretched my lips. He did it to rile May up, didn't he? That's what it turned into, I suppose. When I first hired him, he really was intent on marrying this girl, but then he fell in love with May, I guess. Honestly, I don't know, and I don't particularly care. I just needed you to know that this is not your fault in any way. Clenching my jaw, I sucked in a shallow breath through my nose, and Martin stood up to stare down at me. By the way, I would appreciate it if you asked your girlfriend not to come into the offices anymore without you here. No offense, of course. No, no, of course. I apologize. Standing up swiftly on muscles coiled like springs, I held out my hand for Martin because I just didn't know what else to do. Thank you for clearing things up for me. 
You should know to do that without me to hold your hand, Luca. He didn't shake my hand before leaving, and I blew out a hot breath once my boss disappeared from my doorway. As fucked up as it was, I felt miles better about this whole incident. My opinion of Chad had hit rock bottom, but at least it wasn't my goddamn fault. Fuck. Dropping heavily into my chair, I stretched my body out to flop my head back, and relief shuddered my lids tight. Jesus Christ. By the way, snapping up at Martin's sudden call, I gripped the edge of my desk hard as he popped his head into my doorway. We have court in a in an hour for that guy that dumped dead dogs in the reservoir. Get on that first. Before I could respond, Martin was gone again, and I hovered up a huge, freeing breath through flared nostrils. Rubbing my face and eyes hard, I stood up to round my desk and head to the employee lounge. Just the smell of coffee was enough to wake me up a bit, and I took my designated mug out of the cupboard with hands that no longer shook. I didn't know she left him. They were together since college. If Chad's words were be to be believed, because at this point I was starting to doubt how well I knew him. He and his girl met in freshman year. They went through law school slash nursing school together, and they had been together for almost ten years. And I was positive that their love had staled or something, because why else would Chad cheat? He couldn't live without her at this point, but he was bored by her. I have to remember to text Clary after court. I have to figure out what to do next. The thought twisted my lips as I poured myself a cup of joe, and I set the pot back before opening the lean refrigerator in the corner. Or what not to do. May would get replaced, no matter how many times she stomped her foot. It was only a matter of time, and everyone knew it. This sudden change in situation not only alleviated what guilt I felt over Chad, but it also made building a case against May totally asinine. I just told Clarissa that to get her to calm down. I didn't actually have a plan. Pouring just a splash of creamer into my brew, I loaded up my mug with sugar and took a sip to sigh slightly. Good thing, too. She'll probably feel a fool for getting so messed up about it, though. Larissa was convinced by her talk with Sonia that Chad had been raped. And as awful as that was, it was worse to be wrong. Not a conversation I'm looking forward to, but it's gonna happen regardless. I'll take her out before delving into that. I couldn't help but smirk bitterly at my own idiocy and hypocrisy. I'd been so hell-bent on getting the whole story, the proof, from Martin before dealing with him, but I'd neglected to do that with myself. Taking another sip of my scalding coffee, I twisted to lean on the counter and check my watch. Only eight hours and twelve minutes left. I already need a nap, and I haven't been here twenty minutes. Chapter 45 Clarissa Eyeballing Luca suspiciously, I cocked my head when he cast me a bright smile from the passenger seat. My lips thinned, and my curiosity gnawed at my gut, growing more intense the longer he refused to answer my question. Flexing my hands on the wheel as I drove slowly towards that really nice vegetarian restaurant he'd taken me to, I took a shallow breath. Tell me why you're so damn happy. Blurting out the demand, as the air in my lungs pushed out my voice, I groaned loudly, and Luca actually had the audacity to laugh at me. Shooting him a glare, 
I opened my mouth, but he reached to grip my thigh and squeeze gingerly. My hurting May wasn't the reason Chad killed himself. My brows nearly flew off my face, and I choked on my own spit as I struggled to keep my eyes on the road. The traffic today was horrible for some reason, and I jerked my chin at him wordlessly. What you and Sonia thought was abuse was actually consensual. May was Chad's dom. What the hell? What does that mean? My screech echoed in the near standstill traffic waiting for a turn light, and I glared at Luca as my confusion mixed with surprise. He liked being talked to that way? Yes, I had no idea what, if anything, I could say to that, and Luca heaved a massive sigh. So I guess his girlfriend found out what May and Chad were doing, and she left him a few weeks ago. They'd been together for almost a decade, so it was really hard for him. The only thing I can think of was that he got bored with her, but he still loved her, I guess. If she was with Chad like that, why'd she go after you? My dumbfounded question had no answer as Luca shrugged, and I clenched my jaw against the urge to scowl. What's wrong with some people? I mean, not because of that, but why try so hard knowing it's not what you want? May didn't really think she could do that to you, right? I don't think so. I don't know, really. I'm going to ask her tomorrow when I go in. Rolling my bottom lip between my teeth to gnaw diligently, I tried to ease on the gas when the line started to move, but my car jerked forward regardless. Wincing noticeably, I held my breath as flames lipped up my neck, and Luca reached over to stroke my cheek and neck. Relax, baby. It's okay. It's not exactly on my list of things to expect about a work colleague. I feel like an idiot. Groaning loudly, I flopped over my wheel for a quick second before taking the turn just as the light turned red. Jacking the gas, my entire body thrummed with embarrassment as all the things I'd said the night before raced through my head. Oh, God, I can't believe I said that to Sam. I feel so bad. I know. That's why I'm taking you out to dinner. My face flamed at that firm declaration, and Luca chuckled as I swerved into the fork that took me in the direction I wanted to go. Seriously, Clary, no one could have suspected that. It's not your fault. Under any other circumstance, you could have very well been right. But I wasn't, Luca. Nerves forced my appetite to flee, and I sighed harshly as I sunk into the driver's seat. So, you are not responsible for what happened with Chad. That's good. That, that's great. That means I can sleep. Last night really wrecked me. I could feel Lucas' gaze boring into my cheek, and I pursed my lips thinly as I flicked on my blinker. Are you sure you're okay? I'm definitely going to need to stop at the store for some NyQuil, but... Yeah, I'm okay, Luca. You can stop asking me. The quiet became still and calm, and I glanced over to find him still staring, unblinking through wide pupils. What? I'm not lying. I'm okay. I promise. You really trust me that much that you can watch that and be okay just because I said the guy deserved it? Arching a brow quizzically, I frowned as I took the turn into the restaurant's packed parking lot. Luca's voice was soft but 
firm, and I didn't bother trying to park nicely, trapping a minivan against a dumpster. Cutting the engine, I twisted while Luca continued to stare and nodded. Yes, I'm okay. Just because you said he deserved it, because you wouldn't lie, and more than that, I know you wouldn't say he deserved it if he didn't. You've believed it, so I have no reason not to. Speaking as clearly and punctually as I could, the words rolled slowly off my tongue, and Luca sucked in a sharp breath through his teeth. He grabbed my hand and squeezed hard, and my lips quirked into a tender smile as affection flooded my system. Okay, I'll take that. Leaning over to kiss me with all the passion of our first, Luca cupped my cheek with his free hand to stroke just under my eye and along my nose. I love you so much, Clary. I love you too, Luca. Sharing a smile, we just held hands, our faces so close that his features blurred and distorted the longer I looked. The moment was over too soon, and I sighed dreamily as Luca pulled back to unbuckle his seatbelt. Um, so and now that the drama's all over, maybe you can take some days off next week or the week after? I'll ask for sure. Squeezing my hand one last time, Luca released his death grip on my fingers, and a happy grin stretched my cheeks. Popping open the doors, we left my car awkwardly parked, and he reached to rub the back of his neck. Uh, maybe we should get takeaway and just go back home. Nodding as I gazed at my crap parking job, I puffed out my lips as Luca rounded my car to wrap his arm around my waist. Heading towards the entrance of the place, I turned my mind to what kind of salad I could get that would taste great with roast beef. Ah, oh, roast beef. I need to grab some of that, too, on the way home. Luca kept feeding the sandwich meats to Cookie rather than spend much money on dry dog food, which he'd explained wasn't very healthy. Rolling my lips between my teeth, I bobbed my head side to side before opening my mouth. I'm not going to lie, I did take a little nap today. It was maybe an hour. I just fell asleep reading and woke up when Cookie needed to go out. Opening the door for me, Luca shot me a mischievous smirk, and I glanced around the packed restaurant. He'd called to make sure they'd still be open, but we didn't order on the phone. Every chair was taken. The tables were wiped down and reset almost as soon as they were emptied. Workers whisked away every which way, but Luca and I made our way to the takeout counter by the far wall, out of the way of the dining area. I had court first thing, but I was nodding out after lunch. As if to punctuate his words, Luca inhaled sharply before hiding his yawn behind his hand, and I scrunched up my nose. Definitely, takeaway sounds like the best option. Humming in agreement, I stared up at the menu as indecision tore at my chest. Nothing really jumped out at me, but I hadn't eaten anything all day. My stomach grumbled and twisted in need, and I gnawed on my bottom lip absently. Anxiety curled my blood when the line got shorter and shorter, and Luca and I had almost no time to pick what to eat. These people were far too good at their jobs. Uh, shit, uh, the wraps, maybe? I kept quiet, letting Luca grumble to himself as the tiredness of the past twenty-four hours really started to catch up with me. My mind wandered to the conversation in my car, and I rocked back on the heels of my flats to sigh. Oh, veggie taco sounds real good. Ah, but the pasta sounds good, too. Wait, let's do pasta and garlic bread. 
Or should we get garlic knots? Let's just get both. And some mozzarella balls. Oh, actually, a couple of them. Suddenly, we were in front of the waitress taking the to-go orders, and she glanced between us before tapping on the computer screen. Do you want extra sauce? Nodding, I licked my lips heavily, and she tapped a few more times before her eyes met mine. I'll make it a double. Wine? I think we might just stop at the liquor store on the way home. Shooting me a questioning look, Luca inhaled deeply and his arm slithered from around my waist as he fished in his pockets for his wallet. I don't normally tip for a takeaway, but you're really good. Thank you. Chapter 46 Clarissa My cell phone buzzed insistently, yanking me out of my drowsy state, and my body shot up from the sudden shot of adrenaline. Flinging my legs over the side of my bed, I rushed to the window as an excited squeak lodged in my throat. Very carefully opening my window, my hands trembled with nerves, and I peeked out as Luca set a ladder against the siding. It took him just a few seconds to be face to face with me, and my cheeks heated at the look in Luca's eyes. Stepping back, my legs ached and my heart beat erratically as butterflies fluttered in my belly. Hey, Clary. Whispering a bare sound, Luca eased out of his shoes, but all the rest of his clothes stayed on. Rolling my lips between my teeth, I struggled to stifle a giggle, and he wrapped his long, gangly arms around me. You're so beautiful. Luca? I inhaled as deeply as I could, taking his smell down into the depths of my being, and I slung my arms around his waist to hug tight. How did it go? Gramps did most of the talking. The recruiter just told him that we needed to wait until I turned seventeen, pretty much what I expected. Shuffling lightly to my bed, Luca climbed on as quietly as he could, and I snuggled up against him. Girlish glee bubbled up in my chest, and he rolled onto his side to face me as he worked his lean arm under my cheek. His eyes glistened, scanning mine while he reached his free hand to stroke my shoulder, and goosebumps washed my skin. Gramps and I got into another argument. My mom called me. Did you talk to her, or did no one pick up? Luca's grimace was all the answer I needed, and I pressed my palms against his chest as the taut sinew rippled faintly. Luca, you can't just ignore Grams forever. She knows her daughter better than you know your mom. Maybe she's right. I'm not ignoring her because I want to, Clary. I just... I know she's right, but... but I can't help it. His whisper roughened into a crackly rasp, and my heart leaped into my throat. Sliding my palms up to cup his jaw, I drew his forehead to mine, and he blew out a hot breath that smelled like toothpaste. My mom tries, just because it's easier now than it was five years ago, and doesn't mean I don't feel just as stupid. I tried to ignore it. I really did, Clary. I'm sorry. Mine was all I could think to say, and Luca inhaled a deep breath through his nose that sucked the heat from my cheek. I just wish I could help you. You are helping, baby. He kissed my nose, just a peck, but the happiness that burst in my chest like sparklers was incredible. And what about your mom? Did you ask her yet? Um, not exactly. I asked her if it was okay if I went to the library after school on Friday to study for my test next week. Who's the one not listening now, huh? Embarrassment flushed my face, and Luca chuckled quietly as he twirled a lock of my hair around his finger. Carson's brother is 
bringing us, you know. I really want you to be there. It's not Christmas without snow. My eyelids popped open, consciousness dragging me abruptly out of my memories as the ceiling replaced them. Blinking hard, I inhaled deeply through my nose, even as different memories started to form in my mind's eye. That was my first and only Christmas with Luca during our junior year of high school. Just a couple of weeks later, Jason committed suicide and Luca joined the Navy before we got out of the summer. Oh, shit, baby, I forgot to cover you up. Curling up tighter, I groaned as I rolled onto my side and soft cotton tickled up my outer thigh. Sorry, I'll get new curtains at some point, I promise. What time is it? Time for you to go back to sleep. Kissing my cheek, Luca covered my head with the sheet, and I didn't have the strength to do more than hum. The sound of him trying to be quiet as he finished getting dressed was overly loud, and the tink of his dog tags brought back my dream to the forefront of my mind. Christmas was over six months away, so why did I dream about it? As if the universe was trying to answer that question, my phone started to buzz, and the ringtone chirped insistently. Groaning loudly at the telltale sound of my mom calling me, at what was probably around 5.30 a.m., I flung my arm out to grope blindly on the nightstand. Hello? Clearly groggy, my voice scratched against my dry mouth and I rolled onto my back to stretch my legs long. The line crackled and the bed dipped as Luca sat next to me to put on his shoes. Clary? I just saw the cutest little house for sale right in the same neighborhood that we used to live in. Pulling the phone sharply from my ear, I tensed at the excited chatter that filtered through the speaker, and my lips twisted in a grimace. Mom, it's 5 a.m. No offense, but you woke me up just to tell me about your house search? Maybe I was a little harsh, but I couldn't find it in me to care as Luca rubbed up and down my leg soothingly. Pushing myself up to sit with a short sigh, I ran my free hand through his hair but didn't open my eyes. I had a rough night, okay? You know how hard it is for me when I get my period to wake up in the mornings? Well, you're awake now, so... Scrunching up my face, I forced my eyelids apart, and a shudder raced down my spine at my mom's flippant dismissal of my complaining. Anyway, I was looking and uh, guess what? The house right across the, the street is for sale too. How great would that be? I, I know you're not working, but maybe you could talk to Luca about moving in together. The house is five bedrooms and two and a half baths and it's got a big front and backyard. Uh, to be honest, it's a little pricey, but I'm sure he's got good credit to take out a mortgage. Dropping my phone into my lap, I rubbed my face with both hands and my mom talked so loudly that even the people upstairs could probably hear her. Locking bleary eyes with Luca, my lips thinned at the amusement in his strong features. But I could tell he was dreading the insinuating situation. And the most important thing is to be close so I can see the grandkids. You said Luca's a lawyer, right? But I'm sure he'd be open to a less stressful... I'm right here, Mrs. Lockhart, and I would appreciate it if you didn't call us at 5 a.m. to try to rearrange our relationship to your liking. Pressing my palms into my eye sockets, as Luca grabbed my phone to speak up rather coldly, I sniffed hard to clear my nose of sleep. Please make sure that the next time you call, it's at least 9 a.m. here in Nevada and he hung up on her. Turning my ringer off and setting my phone back on the nightstand with a fluid stretch, shuffling to lay my head in his lap, my knees touched the small of his back. 
and fabric of his workout shorts was smooth against my cheek. Stroking my head, he played with my hair for a moment, but the morning had noticeably soured. Even my tired, foggy mind could sense that. I think I may just take Cookie for a run this morning. I could hear the frown in Luca's tone, and I sniffed again as sleep clung to the my numb face where he touched. We're not even married. Do we even need to get married? What's wrong with her? We will get married. My mom's just getting ahead of herself. I just let her talk, usually. Yawning as Luca's palm glided down the contours of my body, I managed to crack my eyes open again and to glance up at him. Five bedrooms is too much, anyway. Yeah, I was thinking three, four, max. Plus, why would she assume I'd need a mortgage if I'm a lawyer? Why would she assume we'd live right next to her unbearably controlling self? Rolling onto my back, I stretched my arms over my head and my legs taut, and he kneaded my bare belly with a frown on his face. I know she's your mom and all, but it's just talk. If she wants to get uppity about it, that's her problem. I don't really listen to anything she says when she gets like that. Not to mention, it's barely been two months since the reunion. I know it feels like the past fifteen years didn't even happen, but they did. Reaching up to stroke Luca's jaw as it ticked with annoyance, I cracked a small smile and he inhaled to clear his throat. Just ignore her. It's nothing to get worked up about. I'm just saying, if we got a house, I wouldn't need a goddamn mortgage. Giving me one last grumpy grumble, Luca nudged my side gingerly and I rolled off him to watch him stand and arch his back. We should talk about it when I get home from work. Uh, birth control and stuff, I mean. Sure. Leaning to place a lingering kiss on my lips, Luca cupped the back of my head as his tongue sneaked between my teeth. Despite my bad breath, he kissed me with a fury and I moaned softly in bliss. Do you want to take a shower together when you get back? No, no, baby. You lay back down. I'll put one of those baking shows you'd like on the tablet for you. Luca was such a damn good man, and I smiled gratefully as he left me to head to the living room. There was no doubt we'd get married. There was no doubt we'd have kids. There was no doubt we'd find a house with a white picket fence. But it isn't going to happen right now. Chapter 47 Luca May didn't notice me for the longest time, typing away on her computer with her usual monotonous expression, and I leaned on the doorframe to scan her. If she was troubled by Chad's death, it didn't show anywhere on her face or in her posture. The longer she typed one letter at a time with her uninjured pointer finger, the more annoyed she got, though. That, at least, was almost palpable, even though her eyes were kind of dull. Which was only strange in the sense that it was exactly what I expected of her. Excuse me? Rapping lightly, I frowned under tightly knit brows when May didn't so much as tense as she shot me a dismissive glance. I've been meaning to ask. Why me? Go ask an intern. The bitterness in her tone cut through the air, and she lost her composure before a fire filled her eyes and a snarl curled her lip. I can't believe you have the audacity to ask me that after... You hit me? I just want you to know why your ego can't handle rejection, even though you must have known I was never going to have sex with you. 
My pointed look made May red in the face under her light coating of makeup, and I leaned on the doorway to cross my arms over my chest. So? Why me? I'm not explaining myself to you, of all people, Luca. Arching a brow as May stood up, my frown deepened when she waved her wrapped wrist. Apparently she hadn't worn a cast at all, preferring the brace that made the injury look better than it was. You think I'm stupid, huh? Do you really think I don't know that you're going to replace me? What? Did you think I was desperate or something? Yes, that's exactly what I thought. May did not like my candid answer, and her face screwed in unimaginable rage and offense. Clenching my jaw, I forced myself not to display any emotion at all as she trembled with the urge to slap me again. So, you were trying to get me fired or something because I'm going to replace you? How did you figure that was going to work? That you'd push me over the edge, just like you did, but you didn't know the new cameras were actually working so you could twist the story? I wasn't really asking her so much as speaking my thoughts, and May seemed surprised that I'd figured it out so easily. But the honest truth was that it was the only explanation. I knew May suspected, at least that I was going to take her place as partner. I just never expected her to try something so obviously stupid and unworkable. I mean, she didn't really think this would work, did she? If you were trying to get me fired, there were easier and more effective ways to do so, mainly because you ended up worse than you started. You were on the chopping block long before I was hired, May, and I feel bad for you. You know? In some twisted way, I feel bad for you. You're just a bitter, lonely, middle-aged woman that's not good at your job. And you try to make up for it by getting with younger guys, which I realize that hooking up with dudes in their 20s isn't exactly a problem in itself, so there's that, I guess. Trailing off as the air became hotter from the anger seeping from May's pores, I straightened to shrug with surprising lightness. So, yeah, I think you are desperate and pathetic. Leaving the entryway to head for my own office, I winced when May slammed the door so hard that the walls rattled. Interns in the small cube farm opposite May and Martin's office lifted their heads, but they'd all learned by now not to get too nosy. Closing my office door much more gently, I leaned heavily against it to heave a massive sigh. That went better than expected. Running my hands up my face and over my head, I shook my arms and rolled my shoulders before striding to my desk. Spreading my palms on the wood, I flexed my fingers and I wiggled the mouse to be blinded by my computer screen for a hot second. I'd said all I wanted to say to May, more than I ever wanted to say. How could a grown woman act so foolishly? Shaking my head to clear my thoughts, I pursed my lips thinly as my mind backtracked to this morning. Which, to be honest, wasn't much less pleasant than what I'd just gone through. At least, Clarice's mom won't just suddenly show up. We're not sixteen anymore, and I'm not a little bitch that'll put up with her shenanigans. Eighteen years ago, Clary's mom would chaperone our dates, drive us if she knew we had plans, and try to interject on our relationship. She'd suggest places to go and then make us go there, even though 
Neither of us liked walking around the mall to window shop. When she learned that my grandfather was pushing me to join a branch of the military, she flipped her shit about Clarissa being a lonely military wife. I would never have married Clarissa until I could be a proper husband, and I certainly wasn't confident about that when I was 17 years old. We were kids. There were things we wanted to do that required a commitment-free lifestyle. Clarissa and I had a silent understanding that we didn't need to be married to be together. The only real incentive was for taxes, and she dreamed of having a church wedding. Plus, it's kind of shitty to have a wedding and have no friends to invite. Clarissa didn't have any friends of her own, and there was only so friendly one could get with my circle. That was an issue she felt keenly. I knew, but I also knew there wasn't much I could do about it. Not to mention, her mom will be a nightmare. But that was all a thought for another day. Right now, I was at work and needed to focus on work. Luca, did you finish typing up my closing argument for tomorrow? Tearing my eyes off the screen, I nodded firmly as Martin strolled into my office. What did you want to ask me about, by the way? Uh, yeah, I was going to request some time off for whatever consecutive days you can approve early next month. I know it's not exactly employee etiquette when I just passed my probationary period four months ago, but... Trailing off, I held my breath as Martin leaned back across his knees. I think it'd be best if I take some days to level out after everything that's happened with Esther and May. I'll check the schedule, but I can't make any promises, Luca. Nodding, I clasped my hands together as my boss tossed me a casual, inquisitive look. How's that kid doing, anyway? Esther? She's going strong just like her mom, Marissa. Marissa was a lot like that. Take it for what it is and all that. Accept and move forward. Marissa wanted to try for the seals. Appreciation flickered in Martin's eyes, and I nodded again. I, I think she'll be fine, given some time. It's hard to adjust to moving under normal circumstances, I'm honestly just glad that her stepfather isn't coming after her. He's a marshal, so he could if he wanted to. Do you know why he didn't before? After he was found not guilty for murdering Marisa, that is. Staying quiet at that question, I wondered exactly how much to tell Martin, but he heard enough of the story to frame together himself. We knew he was going to get off, so I had Arthur make Esther a new ID so it'd be ready. Within the hour of the trial closing, I shipped her to D.C. and told her that under no uncertain circumstances is she to do anything or hang out with anyone. For a teenager, that was almost as bad as her mother being murdered, but she went under for about a year. Then she got her GED and went into the local college prep, I kept tabs on her these past three years. Esther can follow orders excellently. You mentioned that name on the roof. Should I even be curious? Shrugging absently, I let Martin sit on his own question before he shook his head. Whatever. I'll check the schedule and see if another junior wants the halftime pay. Thanks. I appreciate it. Leaving me with that, Martin sauntered out to head towards the receptionist's desk, and I rocked back in my chair to hold my head in laced fingers. Satisfaction tore through me, and I tapped my foot as a smirk tilted my lips. Maybe the day will get even better, and May will just leave and not come back. This has been Devil's Love, an MC Romance, 
Black Angels MC Book 4 Written by R.A. Black Narrated by Dwight Kuhlman for Hot Ghost Productions